Oh, is it? Is it? No, it's perfect. Okay, great. Um, I I don't know whether um, Mario told you, but I'm I'm saying a few words at the beginning. That's okay with sure. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 All all perfect. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Farrokh, the link works. Uh, so please put the YouTube. Uh, if you want to oh, double check okay. it, but it works for me. And yeah, then let, please let just me check. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, I'm gonna check that now. Is it? No, it's perfect. Okay, great. Okay, let me first check. Um, the same link, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all perfect. Yeah, go for it. Part of the link works. Uh, so yeah. please put the YouTube. Uh, if you want to go, oh, okay, let it work for me. And yeah, let me let me check. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, there is a. I think I think there is a. Uh, is it me? Yeah, yeah, just close YouTube. It's uh, repeating with a delay okay, of twenty right. seconds. Yes. Okay. Oh, hi, Paolo. Paolo. Hello. Good, good morning. Paolo. Good afternoon. Good whatever. Yep, and to you as well. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, just on time. Um, so I think we can get started. So yeah, big welcome to everyone. Already 32 people having joined. And yeah, welcome to ICRA 2021 workshop on impact of COVID-19 on medical robotics and wearables research. And I think it's a very timely topic. Um, and probably quite a few of us have thought, had thought it's all over. But when we look at the figures, <clears throat> for example, in South America, India, even a new variant being um, seen now in, in Nepal. So there is still, you know, the, the problem is still ongoing. And I think it's it's really a, a good thing to, to look into that and to see um, what robotics can do, um, you know, to, you know to, to handle that, that kind of situation. Um, I would like to, to thank in particular Madi and Farouk for, um, you know, pushing this, this workshop forward. Looks very exciting to me. And they have done really a fantastic job to put it all together. Um, and uh, together with Paolo and uh, yeah, myself, we are the more senior um, organizers. So we are just sitting in the background and saying, nodding. So yeah, um, looking really forward to it. Thanks uh, to everyone for joining. I think there will be more people coming while we go um, ahead. Um, for me, it's now, 20 to 2, but I suppose uh, many people are joining from different places around the world. So big welcome again. And I pass on now to Farouk to um, do the opening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kaspar. Uh, so uh, for the introduction, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. Uh, so welcome and thank you for joining us for the workshop impact of COVID-19 on medical robotics and wearable research, learning from the past and strategizing for the future. And this workshop is, is part of ICRA 2021. So I would like to start by uh, introducing the organizers of the workshop, Mahdi Tabakoli from University of Alberta, Canada, myself, Farouk Hotaysar from New York, New York University, United States, uh, Kaspar Alpofer from Queen Mary University, London, UK, and Paolo Fiorini from uh, University of Verona, uh, Cavignol II in Italy. So before we get started, I would like to go over a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Um, so the workshop is being recorded and broadcasted on, live on YouTube. So please check the chat box. In chat box, you put the link to the workshop, link to the broadcast, and a link for uh, poster ranking, which I'm gonna talk about very quickly. So the full workshop information, including the speaker's name and the details about the talk can be found on the workshop webpage. Again, please check the chat box for the links I've just mentioned. So we encourage interactive communication at any time during the talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to put your question in the chat box. And at the end of each talk, we go over the question and we, uh, we will ask your question and we can uh, have the conversation. At the end, we are gonna have also a round table discussion. So on behalf of the organizer, I would like to sincerely thank all the uh, in invited speakers, which which, help, uh, which made it possible for us to have this unique and timely uh, event and uh, a very successful experience. 
So thank you all for supporting the workshop and for accepting our invitation. Uh, so the workshop is composed of 14 invited talks, uh, a roundtable discussion at the end, and two poster sessions. And uh, here you can see the name of the speakers and the title of their talks. And again, uh, the complete information is on the website of the workshop. So check the link. So we have a poster competition. Uh, we have received several pay, uh, posters. And then uh, here you can see the five finalists and uh, the, the, uh, the, the two page uh, paper related to this poster link can be found on the web page of the workshop. And also here you can see the name of the poster and the uh, speakers. So uh, the workshop, uh, we are pleased to announce that the workshop has a sponsor, which is the Journal of Advanced Intelligence Systems by Wiley, and uh, which provide the, uh, the, the, uh, the award for the first place and second place holder uh, of the posters. Uh, the award for the first place is $250 voucher, and then the second place is $150 voucher by Journal of Advanced Intelligence Systems and Wiley. So let's get it started. Uh, COVID-19 has resulted in a major interruption to a wide range of the spectrum of care, including elective surgeries and post-stroke rehabilitation. In the last 15 months of the most serious public health crisis of the century, the COVID-19 pandemic, researchers in the area of intelligent robotics and smart wearable have worked to show the great potential of utilizing modern technology to mitigate the virus spread, to conduct early diagnosis, to minimize the risk of infection between citizens, between patients and doctors, between patients, and aid and to aid and equip and assist our healthcare system. So here's our mission statement. Uh, in this workshop, we collect expert opinions from leaders who have been actively contributing to the fight against COVID-19. Uh, with the goal of raising awareness on, on how future research in intelligent medical robotics and smart wearables can empower healthcare system during the up upcoming waves of this pandemic and unfortunate possible future pandemics. We sincerely hope that this workshop creates awareness among engineers, scientists, and medical professionals uh, concerning on how the world can better prepare for the next pandemic, reduce, uh, reducing the ne negative impact on healthcare system, on healthcare workers, and on our patients. So with that, I would like to start a workshop. And in order to minimize the switching back and forth between different speakers, I continue by quickly talking about some of the work that we have done as part of my research lab. And then after that, we start with the first person, the first invited speaker. So at NYU, I lead the lab called Medical Robotics and Intelligent Interactive Technologies and Merit Lab. Merit Lab founded in August 2019, just before the pandemic. We were very excited about all the international collaboration we have with UK, US, and Canada uh, to, to explore and investigate how we can uh, fuse human intelligence with machine intelligence and how we can fuse human biomechanics with machine mechanics in the area of neurorobotics, prosthetics, and robotic rehabilitation. We look into different modes of uh, interfacing, including uh, beyond position and force, and we, we look into EMG, EEG, and eye motion to interface and integrate human human and machines. Everything has been going well, everything was going well, and then the pandemic happened, and, and New York was the epicenter of the pandemic. So we channelized our research efforts, and we were honored, and we were so uh, uh, pleased to, uh, to be awarded by, by a couple of NSF funding, which made it possible for us to conduct and channelize our research to help with the fight against COVID-19. So first, I would like to talk about some of the work that we did in the intersection of uh, wearable research for helping with, the, with COVID-19. So here you can see the initial uh, the concept of the system that we had. The concept of this project was to generate a smart wearable COVID-19 biotracker for remote assessment and monitoring of symptoms and predict the infection, uh, the, the, the initiation of infection using AI and deep learning models. We have industrial collaborator and we specifically try to make this device inexpensive and scalable to be used by a large population. And we are very close to commercialization now. Here you can see the very early prototype of the device using which we are able to measure a wide range of, uh, a wide range of uh, body signals and vital signals. And also we are able to measure the interpersonal interaction between different users. Again, some of the prototype that you can see here and the bottom you can see we, uh, the, the spectrogram of the audio that we collect uh, to evaluate and process the quality of breathing, the cough, and then the quality of cough and severity of cough. So all the information are collected, including the SpO2, the heart rate, the temperature, the 
a step can mobility and ability of the patients in addition to the breathing quality and the cough and then uh, uh, saved on a small SD card and, and uploaded uh, on a cloud server, which, is, which makes it possible for the clinician to remotely get access to the data and process the data. And at the bottom, you can see the latest prototype of the system, which has a, a headpiece, a neck piece, and a, and a belt mount uh, data logger and uploader. Uh, using uh, flexible electronics now, we are trying to miniaturize the system in collaboration with our industrial partner for the commercialization. Going back to research, we propose the concept of symptoms, a system for symptom decoding, which is in individual use of wearable system and also systems for spread tracing, which be, where we use the, 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 the data that we collect from individual in a cluster population. And we try to model not using the interpersonal interaction between people who have the possibility of infection and then use that to better model the spread of the virus and the infection in the society. Some of the preliminary results can be seen in the paper we published in Frontiers in Robotics and AI. So we continue this research and we try to actually explore different new modalities of interfacing. We specifically look into a modality called mechanomography and we propose a new modality called MMG plus one, which allows us to actually decode the, the, the deeper motor unit recruitments of the muscles. Why we look at mechanomyography, not electromyography, is because electromyography is susceptible to noise, especially when it's used in in-home situations. So we wanted to have a, a more robust and reliable modes of operation. And then that's why we go for this mechanomyography. Of course, the same technology can be used, and actually we used it for a different type of research, which is to connect, uh, to help um, amputees to control uh, prosthetic uh, devices. The early uh, result of this work was published in uh, RGB Transaction and Neural System Rehabilitation Engineering. So we conduct a lot of AI research to decode the neural drive collected by our MMG and possibly also EMG uh, modalities. And we specifically focus on how we can generalize and how we can um, uh, explain the behavior of deep learning models because explainability is an important factor when you want to use deep learning models in healthcare. We don't want to use them as a black box. We want to actually look into which segment of information is being paid more is being more paid attention using the deep learning models. So some of the results are published actually in I uh, I robotics and automation letters and presented in ICRA this year and also recently accepted in Nature Scientific Report. So in addition to that, we developed collaboration in, with Canada, Professor Mohammadi, to use different modalities of uh, AI, such as CapsNet, to look into different uh, aspects of uh, um, uh, diagnosis. For example, looking to the CT scans or uh, uh, X-rays of the lung and to understand and to actually pinpoint the signature of infection as early as possible. So going back to rehabilitation research, we conduct a lot of research in this area, focusing on the topic of telemedicine, because we are interested to bring robots and to bring rehabilitation robots to the homes of patients. And we see that as, as our mission and vision. And we believe that would be possible thanks to the, the invention of 5G, 6G and beyond, which allows us to, to actually meet the quality of service, um, which is needed for tactile internet. Uh, that is the umbrella under which we can have robotic system under, in, in homes of patients. So the quality of service is ultra low latency, uh, below one millisecond, ultra high reliability, 10 to the power of minus nine error rate and very high data rate. And it wasn't possible to use that using conventional internet. Now it's possible thanks to 5G, 6G and beyond. Many industrial sectors, for example, Ericsson is very interested in the topic of tactile internet. And now the people's, many people believe that can be the next revolution of internet and mobile internet. So motivated by this backbone communication technology, we are now uh, looking into how we can have robotic system in homes of patients and operate that in homes of the pa patients. The first step is to actually make the robotic system to be compatible with in-home environments. So here's a robotic system that we started working on it when I was in Canada in collaboration with Professor Patel. And then uh, we finally published this work in 2020 in Archery Transactional Medical Robots and Bionics. It's a very compact robotic system that can be placed in a backpack and it can be used for both upper limb and lower limb, thanks to adaptable and adjustable mechanical transmission, which can be, which can be, which can be tuned uh, automatically to be used for both upper limb or lower limb. And the system has a specific mechanical safety feature, which physically and mechanically limits the amount of force which can apply to patient's hand or the patient's limb, lower, lower limb, which is very critical important when it comes to in-home robotic systems. 
So the next is our main idea, telerobotic rehabilitation, how we can connect human in patients in home to the therapists in clinics, and then how we connect the robotic system and the measurements that we can have at the robotic side as an in-home station to the uh, robotic system in clinics for, for the therapist so that the therapist can feel the patient's motion, feel the patient reaction, observe the modalities of uh, biosignals such as EMG and possibly EEG, and then react to that by providing forces to the robotic system, which can be replicated using the in-home robotic system for the patient. We have started this idea in 2017 and published a couple of papers, one of which was published in RTP Transactional Robotics, one of them was in IGRR, and one of them was published in RTP Transactional Control System Technology. So the next step is to actually have virtual reality for in-home tasks. And here is a virtual reality environment that we develop, which allows us to not only track the hand motion, but also track the eye motion using the HTC headset, which is very important because now we can look into hand-eye coordination, which is a critical factor when it comes to a stroke. So in this video, you can see when the color of the object is red is the moment that the user has eye contact with the object. And when the color is blue is when the user is not looking at the object. So moving forward, uh, now we want to have robotic system in home and we have the robotic architecture. A very important factor is how we can make these robotic systems safe and reliable and agile. And that's critically important, especially when you want to use robotic system under minimum to no supervision. So safety is a critical factor. So if you want to provide, if you want to use uh, basic lim limitation on the force velocity and acceleration, you damp out the performance of the robotic system, which would which in result, uh, reduce the performance of this robotic rehabilitation system. So we use a specific feature of human biomechanics, which is extra passivity of human biomechanics, and we call it passivity signature of human biomechanics, which we are able to track in real time and extrapolate in real time to analyze how much energy, how much mechanical energy can be absorbed by patient biomechanics. And we use that mechanical energy and we use that signature of human biomechanics to actually control the robotic system more effectively. And uh, more accurately and guaranteeing the safety and reliability of physical human robot interaction and maximizing the agility of the system because we know how much energy can be absorbed by the patient biomechanics, which is a patient specific feature. So the robotic system can adapt to the biomechanical features of the patient. The latest result of this work is published in IEEE Robotics and Automation Letter and presented in this ICRA 2021. And the technique we developed, we call it a windowed energy variable structure, passive signature control for physical human tether robot interaction and rehabilitation. We also conducted the same work for the lower limb rehabilitation, and we specifically focus on the energetic uh, passivity signature of human hip, and we published that work in RAL. So in this work, we look into how human hip actually uh, absorb the physical mechanical energy and how that can be quantified and, and uh, identified by the extra passivity. So our vision is telerobotic rehabilitation, when we can, can connect patients and therapists through tele, uh, telerobotic medias. And we believe that can help, uh, help a lot with in under situations such as pandemic, because during pandemics, patients still get, get stroke, right? And there is a concern of moving those patients to clinics because the same patients are in the age, um, on the age that has the highest risk of infection. So we try to provide the rehabilitation. We, we try to democratize access to the rehabilitation medium if, uh, uh, by minimizing the need for patient move, moving to the hospitals, which is very important. We published our vision in collaboration with Professor Tavakoli on this paper, and we call the paper, how can intelligent robotic robots and smart mechatronic modules facilitate remote assessment, assistance, and rehabilitation for isolated adults with neuromusculoskeletal condition. And in this work, we actually look into different modalities of robotics, such as teleoperated robotics, exoskeletons, and, ro and social robotics, and how those modalities of robotic system interact with modalities of uh, healthcare, including rehabilitation, assistance, and assessment. If you're interested in more details, uh, please check the paper and ask question if you want. So in addition to conducting research, we also promote research in the intersection of COVID-19, AI, and robotics. Here is a special issue that we, uh, we edited um, collaboratively with Professor Tarek Kohli and other um, editors, um, uh, Dr. Simon Di Maio and Professor Ana Luisa Trejos. And uh, we were able to collect about 31 articles and publish 31 articles. And so far, the articles published in, the, in this special issue have been downloaded for near to uh, 6,500 uh, 6, 
uh, which is which is a big number and big impact. I also collaborated with uh, Professor Mohamedi in, uh, in Canada, and we were able to actually have this grant challenge for undergrad and graduate students to, uh, to do research uh, in the intersection of robotics, AI, and COVID-19. And of course, this workshop, and uh, which I'm pleased to be part of, and I would like to thank again all the co-organizers and, and invited the speakers, which made it possible for us to have this event. So thank you all, and thank you to listening to my talk and this opening. And I would like to also acknowledge all the sources of funding and my collaborators, which helped me and uh, to, to conduct the research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, fantastic uh, talk um, and very good timing. Um, so I would like to invite uh, participants today to put their questions in the chat um, because we don't have time for questions um, at the moment. And um, um, let's move on and uh, um, let's invite our next speaker, Neville Hogan, to present his work. And he will be talking about a fast track to the future. The pandemic foreshadows the needs of future care. Um, Thank you. you okay. Yeah, I you okay. Do. You okay to share your screen, Neville? Actually, let me go back. Just a moment. Redo that. Uh, can yes, that, that's okay. Very good. Um, well, I have to I, uh, let me start by saying that. I don't have much to add beyond what Farouk has presented. I'm very impressed with the range of work there. Really, all I'm going to say is the same thing, except with less detail. But I think the important thing is to is to see some of the uh, some of the numbers. Uh, this is uh, uh, some data that was published pre-pandemic, but it shows you the enormous change that we've been seeing in the uh, demographics of the U.S. population from 1960 projected out to 2060. And look at the, the huge increase in the number of people who are at the older ages. Now, that's unfortunate because that's a vulnerable population. So this demographic change, the increase in the number of people who are, who are elderly, it's due to better healthcare and medicine, it's due to better diet and wellness and many, uh, many possible other uh, considerations. But the thing is that even with that, we've seen clearly that the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected older citizens and they're by far the most vulnerable population. Unfortunately, they're also, I think, a doubly vulnerable population because you've, as Farouk mentioned, you can get a stroke even during a pandemic. It is and still remains the leading cause of neurological disability in the United States and worldwide, as far as I know. It's a growing challenge because of these aging demographics. And uh, another important thing is that if you survive a stroke, or should I say when you survive a stroke, uh, you have, there is no pharmacology available to promote recovery. There are, there, there, there are some that will help survive the stroke, but nothing that's available that will help you to, to promote uh, recovery. And that situation has been that way for at least 20 years, as far as I know. There's been no progress on that front. Uh, that means that the usual care provided to stroke survivors requires some sort of close physical contact. But that's bad news in a pandemic because that puts the, both the patient and the therapist at, at risk. Again, I'm probably stating the obvious and Farouk has covered it already, but the idea here is that, well, if that's the case, then robotics and related technologies may help. And the possible benefits that they provide are lots of repetitions. The machines can be patient responsive. That is, they can monitor what the uh, patient is doing in real time and change what the, what, how the robot helps. They can provide objective measurement. Exactly how to do that is still a topic of research, but it's clearly possible. So let, I'm gonna show a, a very old video just to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Again, I apologize, it's all... A stroke occurs when the flow of blood to the brain is interrupted, often by a blood clot. And every year, about 600,000 Americans suffer a stroke. 
about 430,000 survive. Our focus is on a robot which is helping survivors get control of their bodies again. Here's ABC's John McKenzie. Once you've survived a stroke, the next challenge is to recover from the paralysis, to regain control of a leg, an arm, a hand. And she tried to move with me. Like many patients, 65-year-old Donald Milbury was given 10 months of rehabilitation with a therapist. Let me see you make a fist. And like many patients, it was not enough. I had very little uh, mobility in my left arm. Researchers at Massachusetts Institute of Technology thought a newly developed robotic arm could help. It adds hope to those people who think that they've done all that they can. The technology is sophisticated. The concept, remarkably simple. Retraining the brain to control the muscles. When the target changes color, you, the patient, are supposed to move the little yellow dot to coincide with the red one. And if I don't get to that dot, the robot's going to pull me there. That's right. And if you do something in the wrong direction, or it pulls me back, it sort of nudges you back in the direction you should be going. So it's the same movement over and over again. It's so repetitive that a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a therapist over a course of one hour would never yield 700 movements of a person's arm. Go one more time around, Doc. Initial studies show that adding the robot to a rehabilitation program can double the mobility in a patient's arm. I have a lot more use of it now. I can open bottle caps and uh, carry things in my hand that I couldn't carry before. As Karen Levine discovered, using the robot even eight years after a stroke can still help. I can actually raise my arm up and stretch my arm out, and I was never able to do that before. So, uh, a couple of things to point out. Um, You'll notice that in this, in this video, Peter Jennings estimates the annual incidence of stroke in the US at 600,000, that's in 2002. In 2010, the estimated annual incidence was 800,000. I don't have the numbers yet for, the, for, for 2020, but clearly the demographic change is real. It's not just a, a um, statistical fluke. Second thing is that uh, this approach has been strongly endorsed by the American Heart Association in 2010 and again in 2015. I haven't seen their 2020 result yet. But the key thing to see is that uh, this is at least promising. It's proven effective. Uh, benefits have been maintained for at least three years. It's been recommended by the American Heart Association. It was also recommended by the United States Veterans Administration and it provided greater benefit than usual care that's in the VA system and at lower cost, surprisingly, again, within the VA system. That latter result is primarily because the VA medical system covers all medical costs. And the main uh, observation is that subjects in this study who received the robotic care made less use of the additional services provided by the, the US Veterans Administration. But uh, that's, that's, that's sort of old news and it's at most promising, but getting from a promising result to a product is non-trivial is the current generation of this technology. And I should disclose that I hold equity in bionic laboratories that manufactures this. That, however, what I wanna point out is that it's, it's not at all clear to me that this is a, a uh, that this has become a commercial success. There are by now numerous alternative robots out there that can be provide, that can be used to provide therapy. But I'm not sure we're seeing something as uh, with the impact of say an Apple iPhone. So this is a difficult this is a difficult uh, technology to uh, bring to uh, bring to public use. That was that became very clear when we looked at the uh, the uh, lower extremity. This is, uh, the, this is the LEAPS study. That's the locomotor experience applied post-stroke. It was to evaluate body weight supported treadmill training. And it was an ex a very well designed, extensive uh, period of training. It, the patients had 36 sessions of 90 minutes of uh, over 12 to 16 week period. It involved uh, body weight support, patient on a treadmill, two and uh, occasionally more therapists uh, providing assistance with the leg movement, immediately followed by overground uh, experience, as you can see in the image in the um, bottom right corner. 
and uh, a well-powered study over 400 participants evaluated one year post-stroke. However, you have to look carefully at the control group and the control group for, the, for this study were given a home-based exercise uh, in intervention and it was designed to make the patients or the subjects uh, feel like they were involved in meaningful therapy, provide an equal number of, se of sessions, same time spent in therapy, evoke a cardiovascular response similar to body weight supported tra training. But the key item is the one highlighted in red on the bottom. It was, it was expected to have little or no effect on the primary outcome measure, which was gait speed. And the, there was no locomotion involved in the control group. That's important because the study had both good news and bad news. The good news was that more than half of all, of all participants improved their functional walking ability when you're post-stroke, so that's good. But the bad news is that there was no difference between study groups. The body weight supported treadmill training was not better than an intervention deliberately designed to have no effect on gait speed. So this was a, this prompted a lot of um, soul searching and breast beating as in, you know, well, we should go back to the starting gate and, see what's going on. Well, I, I think you have to ask yourself, well, you know, what's wrong, what's needed? And I think that there are two things that, we need, that, that are needed. And the first of them, and I think is, is most important, but it's not gonna happen very soon, is that it's, we need better science. We need a quantitative understanding of unimpaired motor control. And believe it or not, after more than a hundred years of study, exactly how human motor control of locomotion is performed is still debated. For example, there's a, a difference of opinion as to the prominence of central pattern generators that are uh, uh, found more or less distributed along the spinal cord. Uh, in animals, in, in quadrupeds, clear evidence of that. In humans, there is some evidence that a sp spinal cord pattern generator can be evoked, but it's very difficult to do so that suggests that perhaps human locomotion, which is you know, bipedal and, and uh, covers a, a wide range of terrains, maybe it's, maybe it's not that simple. And basically, we still don't un understand unimpaired motor control. That being the case, we also don't understand the recovery of uh, the motor control of locomotion after neurological injury like a stroke. And for example, there's some uh, evidence that basic synergies, patterns of coordinated muscle activation are fundamentally different in post-stroke uh, adults than in unimpaired adults. What's the, the, the uh, consequence of that? Still, we're still working on it. The second uh, area of, uh, that where, where progress is needed is in technology. So there, there's a plethora of devices that have been uh, developed both for upper extremity and lower extremity robot, uh, therapy. And in the, low, in, in the lower ex extremity case, one of the, there's a natural tendency to use available technology, which tends to be massive, tends to be motion control, that is be, because of the, of the nature of electromechanical actuators, they tend to come with high ratio gear trains that makes them very difficult to back drive. And that makes them difficult to, and that, that makes the machines big. They can, you can uh, envision them in a clinic, but, operating in more ecological contexts, unclear. So I think what we need to do is have technology that's proven and usable both outside the clinic and as Farouk mentioned, in the home. That's the obvious place to go if, if you can do it. But you have to realize that not all robots are alike and particularly look at the, the bottom row. And I don't mean to pick on or criticize anyone, any one group, but some of these machines are large and heavy and not very mobile. I think we have to start thinking carefully about what can we do with, uh, with uh, more limited technology. And of course, the, the, uh, one of the ways to go is to uh, look at wearable technology. And a key thing that, to add here is minimizing the encumbrance provided by the machine is absolutely essential. There's a, by now a sorry history of how uh, promising looking wearable exoskeletal devices turned out not to be quite as promising because they get in the way. This is particularly important when you look at using devices to provide uh, treatment and assistance. Now, I, will, I should clarify that I'm thinking here primarily of therapeutic technologies, 
that's distinct from assistive technologies. So for example, a person with spinal cord injury who doesn't have any ability to control the lower limbs, that's a different design problem. They're, they're part of the same continuum, but it's not quite the same thing. But if you are looking to provide therapy to promote recovery, you need to have something that will not interfere with natural musculoskeletal uh, dynamics. The trouble is that motion control technology tends to be high inertia technology, tends to be massive. If, if you're generating big enough forces, that tends to lead to a heavy machine, high inertia, gets in the way, doesn't, uh, doesn't promote recovery. The other thing that's a problem is that these things can actually impede the expression of natural neural control. One of the things that's, that, uh, that's important is uh, in the robotic therapy, I, I think we all have seen the idea of assist as needed, and that, that, that is that you don't, you don't help the patient more than the patient needs help. That's of course very important. But I think another thing that's not quite so widely acknowledged is the technology needs to be permissive. So if the patient can do something relevant, you gotta get out of the way and let the patient do that relevant thing. So for that, you need a, a, a technology that's fundamentally low mechanical impedance or back drivable is probably the, the, the better word. That's not easy to do with a large scale motion control technology. It may be more pl plausible using uh, wearables. And I'm just uh, these are just a selection of exoskeletal lower extremity uh, wearable technologies that I'm aware of. It's, these are <laughs> pictures I don't mean this to be a, a comprehensive set, but a number of uh, groups all around, all, all around the world have been developing uh, wearable technologies. Will they work? Well, that's what, uh, that's what uh, I think needs, needs to be assessed. We've been doing some work with uh, a, a hip exoskeletal, uh, exoskeletal device and exploring a couple of alternatives. For example, we've tried seeing what happens if you use the device to change the effect of stiffness around the hips. Uh, remarkably, we found that there was no therapeutic, no hint of a therapeutic benefit whatsoever. I should caution, I should comment that that was on unimpaired subjects, but basically we saw no after effect of the, uh, applying this intervention. No after effect. It's not clear to me that we have anything from which you might even hope to gain a therapeutic benefit. Uh, an alternative that we did try that looks to be uh, at least promising is to use the device to, uh, to apply periodic uh, torque pulses, brief periodic tor torque pulses, such that we could entrain uh, the gait behavior. And again, with unimpaired subjects, we did find that we could get entrainment. And interestingly enough, we got better entrainment over ground than on a treadmill, which again is a promising, at least it's, it suggests that therapy in ecological contexts like over ground or, or, or in the home may actually turn out to be better therapy, but that's uh, speculation at this point. Um, I think the question then is, okay, so what, what's, what is the pandemic taught us? Well, is virtual neuro rehabilitation feasible? I mean, Farouk made a great case for it. However, I'd like to point out, and I'm not, this is not a criticism of Farouk, but some of the virtual therapy uh, is non-contact. And for some, uh, for some purposes, that may be appropriate. But if you have patients with uh, motor, motor deficits following stroke, physical contact, contact appears to be essential. You can actually do physical cooperation via the internet. I mean, and in fact, even with relatively long internet lags, you can get stable, passive interaction between two uh, remotely located uh, machines. We did a, a demonstration of this with our planar device, one in Cambridge and Massachusetts, one in, uh, in the DC area. That was some years ago, the internet wasn't quite as fast then, but the main point is you can get stable interaction and here, one of the things that's uh, helpful is that it um, turns out that stroke patients don't move that fast. If they did, they wouldn't be uh, our patients. And so that means you can get away with moderate battery. You know, it has to have some performance, but we're not talking about a bandwidth sufficient to keep track of the Red Sox pitchers or something like that. It's, it, it, it actually is an easier technology problem than it may appear, but it can be done. But the key thing you have to be able to do is to manage the, uh, the, the robot impedance where it interacts with a patient and where it interacts with presumably a therapist on the other end. Otherwise you have problems with stability. The potential benefits of this is that 
Of course, if you had a portable robot, you could en enable a remote clinic. Uh, you can get the patient and robot to interact physically, even when the therapist is not, is, uh, not uh, present. You could have the therapist act as a supervisor or provide fit physical guidance or both. Uh, if we can ever come to agreement on the right measure, we could provide automatic objective measurement of, of progress. So this looks good. You could even go so far as to say, well, I don't know if you, uh, rem if any of you uh, have heard of the mobile, uh, the mobile library approach to providing um, uh, library services to underserved uh, communities like rural or inner city. You could, in principle, take the same approach and provide it, uh, say, in the back of a van, thera therapeutic devices for people who can't afford to uh, place them in their own in, in the home or who don't have the uh, sort of. This is a bit. This is a, a bit of speculation, but I think that it can be done. And then I think that we have to say, look, this pandemic isn't over yet. I, I understand that, but we have to think in terms of the fact that there is going to be another one. Uh, maybe it'll be 100 years from now, but maybe not. How would we respond differently? And I think the key thing is that the virtual neurorehabilitation is not only can it provide hospital discharge, uh, it can enable early hospital discharge and continue therapy, but it may be a platform to uh, train family care caregivers to be therapy assistants, and that may yield longer uh, treatment and hence may yield better outcomes. And to steal a comment that is from a very old TV program called The Six Million Dollar Man. We have the technology. We could do this if we can uh, finance it and distribute it. And let me, I think I'm out of time. Let me stop there and acknowledge support for my work. Fantastic. Yep. Thank you very much, Neville. Um, fantastic uh, overview. And um, I suppose questions will come. Uh, my, my, my question in my mind is how can we maybe use the technology you were talking about for COVID patients, those who are possibly weakened by the illness and need to rehabilitate. But um, maybe these questions can be discussed later. I would like now to um, invite the next speaker, Paolo Fiorini. Um, and yeah, if you could share your screen, Paolo. Looking forward to hearing uh, about your work on moving from autonomy to tele autonomy, how current research on autonomous medical robots should be adapted to counteract the epidemics. Thank you, Kaspar. Very long talk. Let's hope that the very long title. Let's hope that the, the, the talk is uh, uh, 20 minutes, then you have to stop. <laughs> yes, it's, it's uh, informative uh, uh, enough. So let's try to share my screen. Uh, I wish I could find it. Where is it? On the bottom, usually. No, no, it's, uh, it's just that I have, okay, there it is. I have too many things that are open, so there we are. All right, so basically yep. <laughs> I, will, uh, I will address a a topic that uh, certainly never remembers uh, is, is, uh, is, is an old topic in the early days of, of robotics and, and teleoperation. The, uh, there was a discussion where to use teleoperation, telerobotics, where do we put uh, autonomy in what we are doing? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always happening in history. We go back to old concepts because they, uh, first, they were never addressed completely. And second, because they are still very useful. So, you know, one of the points that came up on this, uh, this uh, pandemic is the need that there is a separation between, uh, between uh, the, the, the people, uh, the caregiver and the patients. And uh, of course, you know, there is, uh, there is a possibility of infection, but also for laboratory work, it doesn't, it's not necessary that, uh, uh, that we are dealing with, with pandemic, every infectious agent is, is, uh, uh, needs this treatment. And then we have the contamination where we where a possibility have to have these robots, but again, robots, this type, for instance, here uh, envisioned in the picture, doesn't really clean everything. You should go under the surfaces and so forth. But in particular, you know, for testing, where, where you want to use the, the, uh, the test with patient, you need to have some uh, care and, and control. So, you know, we need to have a, a, a better way to do this uh, uh, interaction, remote interaction between, between people. And of course, uh, the, uh, 
uh, main main uh, paradigm is the one of teleoperation where we have this time delay and also was was addressed in the previous talk and uh, uh, we have a lot of, of problems in this in this setup uh, although you know some situation allowed to have a, a very useful very strong interaction it's not always uh, not not always the case so you see what, what are the main challenges of teleoperation you know you, you really sometimes don't have the full vision of the environment. Uh, there is time delay between uh, the issuing of the commands and the feedback of return. And that uh, gives you a problem of, of uh, overshooting with your commands or delaying too much. So on one side, it could be dangerous. The other one could be uh, boring for, the, for carrying out the, the experiment. And if you want to make the system stable, the trade-off is between stability and transparency. So basically, if you want to have sharp or perception of sharp contacts, uh, then you need to have uh, little dumping. And so this little dumping on the system uh, is, is a precursor or creates the possibility of instability, especially when you have some uh, hard uh, uh, contact between the, the robot and the instruments. Uh, you know, we can there are a number of algorithms, and we'll we'll discuss them later to overcome this. But you know, still, it's a, it's a basic uh, trade-off problem that cannot really be solved uh, immediately. Then, of course, the solution is let's use an autonomous robot to carry out all these actions. So we don't need to have the interaction, but of course there is no free ride and autonomy has a whole bunch of problems. Uh, first of all, we don't really know the environment, especially when we have to do with, with the humans, uh, you know, every, every person is different. So we need to do a lot of planning. The planning is not perfect because of, of lack of complete perception and we need to replan. And then the reaction of changes may be slow and uh, sometimes the robot is not able to replan because it's, like, uh, it's lacking the, the appropriate information. And when it needs, uh, it needs uh, help, then it has to go back to the uh, remote operator. And so we are back to the problems of uh, time delay. And especially when we are dealing with uh, human robot uh, interaction, communication is difficult. How does the robot communicate to the human? So perhaps we go back to this uh, old uh, paradigm. Uh, years ago, it was called telerobotics. Now I call it teleautonomy, but it's basically the same thing. So how we can integrate the some simple uh, autonomy function with the teleoperation. Uh, and this goes back to a very, very early probably never, nobody ever heard about it. There was a, an early researcher uh, in his PhD thesis, he did very, very nice work on this concept. His name was Janis Funda, and he was working at the uh, uh, UPenn uh, Robotics Laboratory. And uh, unfortunately, he disappeared, uh, but his, his contributions were still, still are very relevant. So, you know, this classification that was presented years ago about the levels of autonomy is also very useful for, for addressing what kind of autonomy we really need. Of course, uh, uh, to be realistic, we don't really want to go uh, too much up to the scale of autonomy. In reality, we only need uh, this uh, level two of autonomy. So basically, we need uh, just the capability of doing some uh, basic, simple task in autonomy. So this is something that is within our reach. Although I, I, I describe it as, as a discrete interaction, uh, so basically there is a start and a stop of, of the autonomous uh, task by the robot. In reality, there has to be the interaction has to be a little bit more complex because we may want to send planes, we may want to correct planes and so forth. But basically, the, the, there is this uh, traded paradigm or traded control between the operator that uh, uh, is controlling part of the task or mostly gives uh, the okay to the autonomous robot to carry out this task, and then the autonomous robot doing something, and then the control goes back to the human operator. So this is something that is feasible, though we are not, we haven't implemented yet. But let me show you what are the basic uh, elements that we will be going into building this, this system. So basically, 
uh, well, this research is funded by this project, so I need to give uh, to thank to the funding agencies that are supporting me in this in this research. And uh, the context is uh, robotic surgery. So here is our setup. We have a Da Vinci research kit, and we we are addressing this concept of autonomy in the context of uh, um, training tasks for robotic surgery, with the idea that we want to have uh, to the robot to perform the same training tasks that a human surgeon will be able to carry out or is, is required to carry out. And uh, then we can compare performance between the human surgeon and the robotic uh, surgeon. So the first task that we have been developing is this uh, peg and ring task where the robot has to recognize where the rings are, recognize the color, put them on the appropriate peg, the peg of the same color, and carry out this uh, task complete, in complete autonomy. Uh, we can uh, represent this task in two ways. We have a top-down approach and we have a bottom-up approach where top-down we use uh, current knowledge, uh, interviews with, uh, with uh, a surgeon, textbooks, and so forth. And bottom-up, we learn from the execution of, of uh, uh, tasks. And in this specific case of, of teleautonomy, of course, we cannot have learning because you know every, every task is uh, different uh, and you know this is, there will be no possibility of, of uh, very long training uh, training sequences. So basically, we focus on this top-down uh, description. So basically, we try to engineer this this task based on the knowledge of the task itself. And uh, the other point is that we want to make this. Uh, artificial intelligence execution. Now, artificial intelligence is everywhere, but you know this is perhaps one of the few appropriate cases where, where you have it, where we represent the, the intelligence of the, of the machine through logic rules. Um, this is uh, a little bit far away from the common fashion of, of uh, neural networks, but we emphasize the fact that the planes that are generated in this case and the interaction that can be between the, uh, the robot and the human is understandable, is explainable, because it's based on logic rules. And we found this uh, approach on the answer set programming to make these this programs, uh, these logic programs that are uh, easy to understand and account for the static, static part of the environment and the variable part of the environment. So the variable parts are called fluent in this uh, uh, concept of logic programming and represent the position of the different elements, uh, the, the, uh, whether the ring is on a peg, is on, is on the ground, or what are the, the variables that describe the, uh, the situation of the, uh, of, the, of the task environment. And by understanding and giving a, a concept or giving a semantic understanding of the variables, we have this, the situation awareness of the environment. Uh, how do we move? Well, uh, we use a hybrid automaton, and uh, the, I, the uh, discrete part of the hybrid automaton is, are the modes of the system, so basically reaching out, picking up the, the peg, and so forth. And the continuous part is called something that is called uh, uh, dynamic motion planning, a dynamic motion primitive, sorry, and is a, a basically a solution of a dynamic uh, of a differential equation that allows to uh, create a trajectory of the of the system in this way. So, and this is repeatable; can uh, keep the same shape if we move it and so forth. This is the setup that we had. We need to we had to develop a new form of uh, calibration of the system. And uh, we, we put this together in the uh, uh, architecture of the system we presented in IROS last year. And this year, we had uh, some uh, uh, other presentation related to the simulation part of this, of this part of this uh, setup. And uh, by combining all these elements, we were able to uh, completely solve uh, this uh, uh, training task completely autonomous. Here, I show some example. This, as you see, the description of the, of the plan is really human legible. The robot recognizes where there are, what is the, the current situation, creates a plan, uh, reacts to a different uh, unexpected situation. You will see in a moment that a, a, a ring is dropped or a ring is not in the right position. Uh, it can, can exchange the rings between, between uh, um, uh, instruments. So basically, the task is carried out and reacting to uh, unexpected situations. So the basis of some autonomy, okay, here, for instance, you see 
an unexpected event, the situation awareness module recognizes that there is a new ring on the table, and then the robot executes this, this new task. And uh, how do we insert this uh, framework in the teleoperation system? So here we are addressing the issue of force feedback. Uh, force feedback is a, is a very strange uh, uh, situation. Uh, it's basically the field of surgeons in robotics is divided in two parts. Uh, those who use the, the Da Vinci system are in a, are against force feedback because they think that they are confusing, gives confusing information. And those who never had a, 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 to use the Da Vinci are in favor because it helps training. And uh, you know, a paper last uh, actually yesterday was presented on this on this subject. So we are trying to to uh, basically solve the issue whether force feedback in a soft deformable environment can bring help to the surgeon. In a, a rigid environment, we know that uh, force feedback is essential because you have no way to measure, to, to, to perceive the, the interaction between the instrument or, or the robot and the hard environment because there are no deflection. But in an anatomical environment, the organs deflect. So basically you have a different, uh, an alternative perception path, basically visual, that if it is trained well enough, can give you a sense of uh, the, the force interaction. And this is what the regular surgeon do. So here we are using this uh, tank uh, uh, infrastructure and <coughs> tank uh, uh, passivity method with, with the uh, energy tanks with a local optimi optimizer to optimize the flow of energy so that it's uh, uh, more efficient and they're more stable. And we were able to, we, we are starting to do some experiment on this, on this field. Oof. Uh, there it is. Uh, showing the first on using a, a industrial robot, uh, a cooker that uh, is teleoperated in, uh, in a, a laboratory environment, but again, dealing with, with uh, soft environments, basically uh, measuring the interaction with, with this uh, phantom. And uh, instead here, we are using a version of the PEG and, and, and the whole task, uh, which is a standard task uh, that, that uh, again, going back uh, almost 40 years ago, we, we did uh, at uh, JPL with a different setup. But in this case, the, uh, the environment is stiff. And you, know, you see the, the, the robot is a little bit shaky. We're just at the beginning of the tuning of the parameters. Uh, and, uh, but again, we are able to control the interaction and, and having uh, a, a safe interaction between two hard environment, which are one is the, uh, the peg uh, held by the, by the robot and the other is the robotic uh, set the setup. So basically the combination of these two uh, could could provide a, 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 a nice way to enforce this uh, uh, physical separation between uh, care uh, givers and patient, uh, both in terms of the uh, home rehabilitation, both in terms of uh, uh, home assistance, home telemedicine, and it could be a general paradigm for a number of, of uh, operations. Of course, there are a number of challenges, uh, in here at least a few, uh, but in particularly is uh, is the interaction. So how would do how would the robot interact with a person without having a human support nearby? In robotic surgery, you're not allowed to have a, a surgical robot without a bedside patient. Um, in other environments uh, like uh, teleechography, you may want to have a, a nurse nearby to be able to help the remote radiologist to carry out the, the examination. But again, this interaction or, or mixed interaction is a very interesting and uh, problem. And it falls into this concept of explainable AI, which is uh, very fashionable uh, today. So basically, these are some some uh, uh, suggestions that I would like to give on, on direction, future direction, to try to be prepared for, for next uh, pandemics. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Paolo. Thanks for your fantastic talk. Um, some good questions being raised there. 
um, how much autonomy do we actually need? I mean, that would be one point I would like to discuss further, but also to hear your views on um, the complexity of tasks. You have shown some tasks that could be aut um, automated, but um, how would that then you know, be realized in the real world, like inside a patient, for example? But I suppose we, we move on. So thanks again for that. Okay. Um, so I, 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 yeah, Miss, oh, sorry, you were sharing the, your screen with the relevant slides there. Um, I, th I think we'll keep the questions to the end. Um, okay, maybe, that's fine. Yeah, maybe if, if anyone, or do we have a question there actually? Well, there is a question to, yeah, uh, Neville. Um, but I think we take those later. Is that right, Madi? You could just confirm that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because we have a round table. If you want, we can just keep on a schedule. Okay. So, Very good. so let's let's have these questions coming in. Thanks a lot. Um, but we move on with the presentations. So next presentation uh, would be by uh, Kawai Kork. And um, unfortunately, he is not here today. Um, and so we will play his video, uh, the video that he provided us with instead. And his presentation will be, um, is entitled Tailor Operated Robotic Tools via Endoscope Working Channel. For endoscopy. Uh, this is actually a new topic for me to jump out from my comfort zone in research because over the last six years, my team mainly focused on MRI guided robotics we endeavor to compact a uh, robot system involving compact design robot mechanism uh, that can be operated inside the scanner board. And the robot could involve MI safe actuator with them. Uh, here's Ka Wei, Associate Professor at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, it's my pleasure to be invited by the organizer here and happy to share my investigation in the topics of robotics instrument for endoscopy. Uh, this is actually a new topic for me to jump out from my comfort zone in research because over the last six years, my team mainly focused on MRI guided robotics. We en endeavor to compact a uh, robot system involving compact design robot mechanism uh, that can be operated inside the scanner board. And the robot could involve MRI safe actuator with the containing metals. Uh, the robot also will, will have a tracking capabilities and we, we have to apply the wireless checking circuit marker for the real-time instrument, lo instrument localization. And then finally, we also conduct the fast MRI image processing. So the example procedure will be applied to, uh, to the steel tactics liver surgery, uh, cardiac electrophysiology, or liver tumor elevation. It's a, just a brief background of my research interest. And however, during the first wave of pandemic in Hong Kong, uh, we were approached by ENT surgeons. They want us to modify the oxygen mask for their clinical routine in transoral or translational endoscopy. The major reason is that the supply of the protective clothing wasn't sufficient. That's why they want to cover the mask on the patient even during the endoscopy. Uh, just a very improvised modification integrated with the two single valves from, from the N95 mask uh, with two ports for inserting the instrument or endoscope into the mouth or nose. Furthermore, we, we also help in their study of the uh, aerosol effect due to the coughing and sneezing, uh, implicating that the importance of having such a mask during the endoscopy. So another one is related to soft robotics. I have assigned a project for undergraduate students to decide a so-called balloon robot taking reference for earlier, uh, earlier work, which was published in Science Robotics, uh, this, that is soft and capable to slick inside the nasal cavity uh, so as to reduce the pain while collecting the fluid sample for COVID-19 test. And unfortunately, those work directly related to COVID were quite improvised and short term. And however, in the past one and a half year, I have pay much attention on robotics endoscopy. And I have to confess the following presentation content would not have a direct relationship with uh, COVID, but just like to share my survey regarding the unmet clinical or technical challenges as a robotic, 
uh, as a surgical roboticist, you will feel uh, interested. So if you look at the surgery along the evolutionary scale from invasive to minimally invasive, the most conventional may be considered as a primitive way, which is uh, open surgery. Uh, large external incision are made to assess and treat organs. And as surgeons look into look into the look to create a small incision to minimize bleedings, shorten the recovery time, and reduce the post-operative pain, but also uh, maintaining the certain levels of efficacy. Uh, laparoscopic surgery was inferred, and in taking another another step towards the minimal invasiveness, so-called incision nest surgery was developed, which is flexible endoscopic surgery. So one of the common therapeutics endoscopy is to treat the early stage cancer of the GI tract. In this process, a flexible endoscope with a camera at the tips is inserted through the lateral orifice, for example, mouth. Simple manual instruments, forceps, snare, or diaphragmic life will be transferred through the working channel of endoscope. Endoscopic Submucosal dissection (ESD) is a common procedure for remo uh, removing tumors in the GI tract. And keeping in mind that all the procedure has to be done at the end of the flexible scope, that could be one meter long. The dexterity of the instrument heavily relies on how well the surgeons can maneuver the endoscope. Therefore, even making a simple cutting on on mucosa, which is challenging, it could take two three hours to complete it. So let alone ESD on GI tract, there could be 3.5 million cases globally. Uh, also, there are many mucosal dissection required to carry out in different organs. For example, transurethral endoscopy inside bladder, 690,000 cases. Although the number is much less than GI, the recurrency rate is very high indeed, more than 50%. So moreover, the endoscopic prostate resection is also very popular in US, 240,000 cases in US per year. In terms of the ESD procedure distribution, East Asia is ranked number one, possibly due to the origination of ESD procedure, which is from Japan, where it has many skilled professionals and training center to cultivate the expert endoscopist and China also occupies a significant portion of the market. And anyway, the general trend is to reset the early stage of cancer's polyps even during the endoscopic screening. So therefore, to the technical development, there have been many attempts to motorize the endoscope using robot control. The concept is simple. Uh, the endoscope itself is actually very decent tendon driven mechanism. Instead of routing the tendons to the manual and handles, but to the robot actuators, we already could we already could teleoperate the bending of the endoscope. So apart from the conventional tendon driven mechanism, uh, fluid driven soft robot is also another alternative. So this is the prototype developed by Casper teams in support by the EU funded project called Stefor. Uh, it also recalls my high payload soft robot prototypes. It could lift up things as heavy as a can of Coca-Cola, uh, um, operate under six bars of fluid pressure, very high. Uh, in our vehicle ties, it's only uh, two feet bars normally. So the working principle is that when we pump in this high pressure fluid inside the soft robot body, it could give our similar banding effect as a conventional endoscope. But how about when this robot got burst, would there be any impulsive mm -hmm. impact causing the soft tissue injury? Um, I don't, I'm not quite sure. In recent years, we can also see many commercial robotics endoscopes available for clinical use. And though takes conoloscope, very soft, floppy, disposable for single use, Another one called aeroscope, integrated with balloons to stabilize the local motion inside the colon. Both of them can be controlled by very fancy joystick. However, they are not very popular 
um, generally speaking, the practical values of robotizing the scope itself may be very limited. So one of the reasons, I guess, is about the practice of endoscopists. They are already well trained in maneuvering the conventional endoscope. Uh, the corresponding robotics application can't actually be the leash to shorten further their learning curve or improve further the surgical outcome. And taking NOCS as an example, natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery, which is a Skylab's approach, uh, surgeons, surgeons seldom complain about the difficulties in navigating the scope to the surgical site, even traveling, even traveling along a long pathway, for example, from the anus to the gallbladder. But the problem is usually about how the instrument deployed from the endoscope, whether the instrument can be maneuvered accurately to perform the proper tissue manipulation and how it can be accomplished by a single endoscope. And when we look at the endos endoscopic instrument, many different types, but all of them are rigid. The degree of freedom to motor motorize it actually just pushing or pulling in and out from the endoscope only. If surgeons need tractions to lift the tumor and review the cutting plan, the simple trick is to plug in another instrument channel to push the instrument downwards above the pivot so as to obtain the triangulation settings. Therefore, it can grab the tissue from a wider angle, stretching it upwards for ease of sessions. So therefore, to my belief, the game changer should be the robotics instrument that can pass through the standard endoscope rather than just robotizing the scope itself. And technically, it, this is very challenging. Under the concept of tandem driven mechanisms, using a string puppet, Mary Ellet as an analogy, if you want to increase the degree of freedom to control the puppet, driving it, walking, dancing, a more number of tandem will be required. But we don't have the luxury of space that a string puppet had. More wires packet, more frictions, more challenges. Bear in mind that although in some endoscope settings, they provide two working channels, but the standard working channels diameters ranges from 2.8 millimeters to 3.7 millimeters for GI endoscope. Uh, therefore, we believe that being able to provide such a dexterous control over a long and flexible distance is the game changer for endoscopic surgery. Uh, currently, not many examples I can quote as a game changers, but there are some good attempts. This one is flash robotic system. FDA cleared. Again, the robotics actuation was on the scope, not the instrument. The endoscope can be locked in place and controlled by a 3D motion input device. It allows the surgeons to manually manipulate both instruments with more degree of freedom, but separate from the scope. Uh, the instrument is still very thick in four millimeter diameters. Uh, as you can see, due to that comes the separate instrument channels. The scope cannot, cannot be navigated deep to the bodies uh, or, or, or lumens. The entire system is proprietary without any utilization of existing endoscope or instruments. So surgeons have to adapt to the new system and surgical workflow. Another one still in r and D progress called Endomaster, much closer to what we expect. The instruments are the robotic ones comprising of the articulate joint, each of them coupling with a pair of tendons. Uh, they endeavor to deploy the robotics instrument inside out from the in endoscope. However, the instrument diameter is still thick, more than four millimeters. The endoscope has to be customized to accommodate and transfer the instruments. The business model could be difficult as only specific customized uh, endoscope can be compatible with the endomaster. 
uh, looking at this setup, you will see the pilot surgeons has to remotely control the instrument at the console, posing much separation from the patients. Another endoscopist has to navigate or stabilize the endoscope on the patient as well. So the final one I, I like to introduce, which is Virtuoso, is a spin-off company startup by Professor Webster at Vanderbilt. Uh, it employed a very well-known concentric tubes approach in search of tendon driven mechanism. The concentric, concentric tubes instrument can be very, very compact and thin, less than three millimeters. Uh, several tube rings sliding in one tube. Versatile manipulation can take place by rolling and pushing the particular tube rings. Uh, therefore, it would have to channel through the scope with rather rigid and strict configurations. So in this videos, uh, we can appreciate the dexterity of this concentric tubes instruments, very smooth by manual manipulation under the good triangulation settings. The motor box and the, and the scope are supported by the passive robotic arm, facilitating the hands-on surgeon's movement. The standing console also provides a very easy access to the scope close proximity to the patients. The system is small, occupying a small footprint in the operating theaters. So perhaps if this is a summary, I would like to show you the commercial landscape in surgical robotic system here. Um, basically, I can resolve the design spectrum into two dimensions. The vertical from bottom to top is the rigidity to flexibilities uh, the horizontal from right to the left is about the scale or diameter of the instrument being channeled inside the patient bodies. And starting at the more conventional surgical robot, for example, for laparoscopy, they are rigid and in range of five to eight millimeters diameters. We have the classical one, Da Vinci, and stepping down in diameter, we have the mimic system, which although have a flexible antifetus, but the transmission body itself is still rigid. Virtuoso similarly has to, has to be transferred through the more or less rigid channels. While considering the flexible options, uh, the current state of the art endomaster mat robotics are at four millimeters in, in instrument diameters, which are not yet uh, compatible with the existing endoscope uh, channel sizes. Uh, I mean the standard one. They need customized scope. So therefore, the real untapped potential in this area lies in the flexible and thin categories. So this has to be opening the door for channeling through the existing standard flexible scopes. And finally, here just introduce my attempt to make a startup company, which is called Agilus. And sorry that we are still in a very early state, but I hope next year, Ikra, I, I can share more about our technical solution to tapping this area. Uh, that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks to Kawai, even though he's not here. Um, yep, interesting uh, overview. So um, I suppose we have three minutes, but uh, I suppose it's the best to just uh, continue. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Then um, if uh, Axel is ready, Axel Krieger would be our next presenter. And um, he will be talking about from testing booths to ICU robots, coronavation at the Johns Hopkins University. Yep, I can see your screen. Fantastic. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. And presentation mode, fantastic. It's all yours. Thanks a lot. Great. 
thank you so much uh, for the kind of introduction and for the opportunity to present our core innovation efforts at Johns Hopkins. Um, a quick outline of my talk. I wanted to start with reviewing our efforts uh, to help mitigate the COVID pandemic, and uh, particularly discuss uh, three projects in medical robotics that I was involved in, uh, namely, namely uh, low-cost testing booth, an autonomous robotic lung ultrasound system, and a telerobotic system for ventilator control. Um, so in March uh, of 2020, uh, the Malone Center for Engineering and Healthcare and the Lab Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics at Hopkins uh, organized a series of meetings with faculty and clinicians from Johns Hopkins Engineering School, School of Medicine, School of Nursing, uh, the Hopkins Hospital, and the U University of Maryland Medical Center uh, to search for potential engineering solutions to problems that frontline healthcare workers face in infectious patient care. Uh, we quickly found out that the scarcest resource uh, were uh, number one, trained healthcare workers, uh, number two, personal protective equipment, uh, PPE, uh, and then the uh, uh, ventilators. Um, we followed up these uh, need assessments with focused brainstorming sessions, and our lab engaged in uh, three particularly COVID projects. Um, let me start by telling you about our work on COVID testing uh, first. Uh, of course, large-scale testing is an important measure to contain the spread of COVID, uh, but presents considerable risk for the healthcare providers administering the roughly uh, 1 million daily tests in the US alone. Uh, in the US, uh, really drive-through testing has developed into the standard of care for testing. Um, what we learned from our providers from the uh, Johns Hopkins School of Nursing and experts at the Baltimore City Health Department is that while drive-through testing is very effective in the suburbs, it really leaves out a large and important part of the population. If you think about inner city Baltimore, for example, patients might not have the insurance or availability uh, of cars. Um, in addition, uh, the direct contact between providers and patients during drive-through testing puts the medical personnel at risk and consumes a lot of PPE. Uh, so to protect the providers and to save on PPE, uh, we built a low-cost uh, positive uh, pressure booth where the provider sits inside the booth and the patients uh, would walk up and sit for the administering of the nasal swab through gloved uh, port, uh, portal access. Uh, the booths were built uh, using aluminum framing, acrylic, and high-density polyethylene panels. Uh, the booths were mounted on a pallet and can be transported by a single person using a dolly. Uh, the electrical design features uh, first on a high-end uh, intercom system to allow for uh, clear two-way communication so you can walk the patient uh, through the testing procedure you know, when the uh, swap is coming. Uh, then a very important uh, for safety uh, pressure sensor. So we measure the pressure inside and outside the booth, uh, compute uh, the pressure differential, and only if it exceeds with a safety factor, the CDC recommended a pressure differential, uh, would we then uh, display a green light. So indication for the providers that it's safe to use the booth. Um, then a dimmable lighting, uh, dimmable lighting system, LED lighting system, so it can be used in all uh, at times. Um, for safety also, of course, uh, we uh, uh, wanted to protect the providers uh, from aerosol contamination. So we installed a HEPA filter inside the booth. Um, air is forced through the HEPA filter with an external HVAC system uh, that features both a fan and when needed extra cooling that was in particularly important in the summer months. Uh, we did a series of lab safety tests, uh, starting uh, with just uh, seeing when we can reach uh, the uh, right amount of pressure. Uh, once the door is closed, uh, the booth reaches close to three millimeter HG of pressure, which is about uh, 10 times the recommended minimum pressure according to CDC guidance. Uh, we use a partic particle counter um, to measure how long it takes to eliminate uh, smoke particles inside the booth. And it took about 200 seconds uh, when the cooling was engaged and 500 seconds uh, with just the fan. So the left graphs are for just the fan and the right graphs are fans and cooling. So after about 200 seconds here, all the particles are eliminated. 
Uh, once uh, all these lab safety tests were completed and our clinical partners were satisfied with the safety tests, uh, we performed a series of prototype tests at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we first swapped uh, a series of eight patients uh, with two providers. Uh, that took about four and a half minutes, uh, with the majority of the time being spent on cleaning the gloves and chair. Uh, it might have been because I'm a pretty sm uh, slow cleaner and I did the <laughs> um, cleaning during those uh, testing procedures. Um, we also tested the, the booth after uh, that series of tests inside. There was no trace of coronavirus uh, inside the booth. So that uh, felt uh, made us feel comfortable to do further clinical deployment. Uh, we overall built uh, five of these booths um, and deployed them in downtown Baltimore at different healthcare facilities, uh, even a homeless shelter. Uh, our providers uh, really enjoyed, enjoyed working in the booth all year. Uh, they uh, received heavy use. Uh, and uh, the booths are now licensed to a small company, Tate, uh, who's manufacturing and selling the booths. Uh, so it's definitely uh, one of the fastest translation from idea to commercial product in, in my career. Um, with that, uh, let me now introduce uh, the second project uh, on autonomous ultrasound uh, of the lungs. Um, ultrasound has quickly emerged as an important tool for diagnosing and staging of COVID uh, because it's faster also cheaper, more portable compared to um, the gold standard, which is probably CT. Um, however, um, ultrasound uh, requires close contact of experienced sonographers with the patient. So a robotic system performing lung ultrasound autonomously could really reduce the risk for providers and also provide uh, very consistent results independent on, uh, of the experience of the sonographer. Our robotic system control, consists of uh, three components. Uh, we start with acquiring a 3D surface scan of the patient with an overhead RGBD camera. Um, we then uh, predict uh, the landmarks of the rib cage using deep learning and estimate uh, the eight uh, points scan location to fully cover the lungs. Um, we then estimate the pro pose and uh, to reach each scan location uh, to transform the pose into the robot frame and command the robot to reach each uh, ultrasound target, uh, get close to the vicinity of the target, but a little bit distant from the patient still. Um, and then we take advantage of the force feedback to correct the target location, uh, to feel our way to a location that is between the ribs. So really it's an ultrasound window into the lungs and uh, not obstructed uh, before acquiring the lung ultrasound image. Um, the landmark uh, prediction uh, is based on a, a 3D deep convolutional network uh, trained on 550 patients uh, developed uh, by Siemens uh, to directly estimate uh, 60 landmarks uh, from a skin surface of a patient's uh, torso. Uh, the mean occluding error on testing set of about 20 patients was about 15 millimeters uh, with a 95th percentile of 28 millimeters. So that estimation error uh, in combination with registration and kinematic errors is a bit too large to accurately reach uh, the small target locations between the ribs. Um, therefore, we really need the force feedback to feel our way to the target locations uh, by repeatedly uh, tapping and pressing the ultrasound probe along a line into the patient with a constant uh, 20 Newton force. When the displacement of the contact is large, uh, that is a clear sign that the robot found a location between the ribs. Uh, we were able to successfully reach target locations in simulated models, um, and uh, then also uh, did tests on a full-sized uh, torso ultrasound phantom that was modeled after a CT patient. Uh, so 87% of the scans uh, were completely unobstructed with strong image quality and using both the landmark prediction and the force feedback versus only 58% when using no force feedback. Our future work entails uh, fully incorporating image feedback uh, to further improve the scan quality. Um, with that, let me get uh, to our final COVID project, uh, our teleoperated robot uh, for ventilator control. Um, when the COVID pandemic hit, uh, highly infectious patients flooded the emergency departments and intensive care units of hospitals. Um, to prevent the infection from spreading between patients and to the hospital staff, COVID patients were placed in isolation rooms, many requiring mechanical ventilation. 
for patients on a ventilator, the settings of the ventilator need to be adjusted often eight to 12 times a day, each requiring the respiratory therapist to don personal protective equipment into the room to control the ventilator and then exit the room to doff the PPE. Um, every single uh, setting change requires a set of new PPE and exposes the hospital staff to infection. So while staff is already stretched thin uh, due to the increased uh, number of patients, having the need to frequently change PPE adds an additional strain to staffing as workers will spend an unusually large amount of time uh, donning and doffing PPE. Um, so during our evaluations uh, in the Johns Hopkins biocontainment unit, it uh, typically took about uh, four minutes for a respiratory therapist to completely don and doff their PPE for a single adjustment to the ventilator in the isolation room. Uh, so PPE includes the first layer of the nitrile gloves, a powered air purifier, the respiratory hood, isolation gown, and then the second layer of gloves. Um, once the PPE is donned, uh, there uh, therapist enters the isolation room and makes required changes on the respiratory in a few seconds, then exits the room and takes off the PPE again. Um, so we identified early on uh, that adding a remote control capability to existing ventilators could have a very positive impact in staffing and PPE usage. Uh, currently available state-of-the-art ventilators unfortunately are not designed for remote operation and may take several years before new generation of uh, remotely controllable ventilators become really commonplace. So our team set out to design and build a teleoperated robotic device that would enable healthcare staff to make adjustments from outside of patient's room without the need uh, to don and off PPE. Uh, the device features a touchscreen controller uh, that connects the robot wirelessly. It shows the live image of the ventilator screens and enables healthcare workers to control a robotic stylus on the ventilator device by just tapping on the remote controller screen. Uh, the robotic device has a simple Cartesian design for easy mounting and control. Um, it is capable of moving a remotely actuated stylus to any position on the screen uh, while a camera is continuously observing the process. An onboard computer transmits the live images to the remote controller and also performs the visual surveying for accurate robot control. Uh, we work with the most common ICU ventilator, ventilator type at Hopkins, uh, that's the Maquette Server U, uh, that features just a single large capacitive touchscreen for controlling our settings. So that uh, Cartesian robot is clamped to the touchscreen, and then the stylus can operate the touchscreen at any place. Uh, to install the system, the robotic device first needs to be uh, clamped onto the ventilator screen. Uh, then the operator performs uh, two automated calibration steps. Uh, first, finding the ventilator screen in the camera view, um, and then calibrating the robot to the screen by moving it to a set of locations and tracking the position of the stylus uh, with a little LED uh, uh, built in uh, using machine vision. Uh, once setup is done, uh, the remote controller screen will show a devolved uh, live image of the screen where the operator can interact with the stylus just by tapping a location on the image uh, on the remote controller that it will send the robot to this corresponding position. Uh, then the operator can actuate a single press using the stylus or press and hold for a longer period of time, for example, to change the oxygenation from 50 to 60, for example. Uh, for the design, uh, we used a custom-built Cartesian robot controlled by a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino in a cheap uh, Linux touchscreen uh, laptop as a remote controller. Uh, we used ROS, the robot operating system, uh, as the middleware for communication. Um, and the parts of the system, including the robot and the remote controller, cost only uh, approximately 750 US dollars. Um, please uh, watch our full uh, video during the poster presentation that's coming up next uh, on the total robotic operation of ICU ventilators. Um, before um, ending uh, this presentation, I wanted to quickly mention some other important COVID work at Hopkins, um, starting with the famous uh, COVID tracker dashboard um, and other data science and healthcare system efforts uh, that are listed in this publication, Surgical Innovation. Um, if you'd like to read more on our work, uh, here are all the publications coming out and that came out uh, onto these efforts. Um, and with that, really like to thank uh, all my students, collaborators, and uh, the funding sources. Um, that 
uh, I can uh, open. Thank you for your attention and open up for any uh, questions. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. And uh, very yeah, related to the particular issue we are interested in, the, you know, the, the COVID crisis and how to uh, combat that. So thanks for giving us this excellent overview. Um, so I don't know, I'll, I'll look at my other, my co-organizers. Um, shall we now do some questions or shall we move forward and keep questions for later? Casper, um, we have time. So yeah. If you would like, uh, for sure, if there is any question. Otherwise, we will just have a long, longer poster break. Yep. Um, I mean, I would be happy to take some questions now. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, maybe open their microphone. And I can start with a question from my side um, to, to, to Axel, who is here. Give, uh, give the last talk. So first of all, yeah, again, uh, I, I, I really like that. Um, these initiatives at Johns Hopkins will be very impressive. Um, and I, I like in particular this remote controller. So, um, I, mean, I mean, crazy in a way that you put a, a robot on top of a touch screen to make it a remote controllable system. So was, was that the easiest approach? Couldn't anyone come and kind of reprogram the, you know, the touch screen in a way that you could use it remotely? Yeah, fantastic question. We definitely looked for other opportunities, but these are really closed off systems that are, you know, yeah. uh, FDA approved, uh, you know, it's very hard to, um, you know, get them uh, to in such a short amount of time to be, you know, completely redesigned and, and approved for, for clinical use. So we just thought adding that as an add on component um, is uh, just the, the fastest way forward. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. Long-term solution is really to fully integrate uh, remote control directly into the systems, but it's just not a feature that any of those have, you know? So <laughs> it's, you know, some of the new systems, Medtronic has now one that is uh, remote controllable okay. uh, that's coming out. So I, I absolutely believe the next generation will have that feature, but there are 160,000, um, you know, systems that are in the US alone <laughs> uh, that are not compatible with that. So I think there's really yeah. a, a need uh, to upgrade uh, those those older systems. Yeah, there's a need there, but I think a great solution found there. So I, I, I like it really. And maybe again, I just add another question. You spoke about FDA approval. Um, aren't you losing that the moment you start modifying the systems, even if it's just an add-on? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that requires uh, an additional uh, kind of uh, approval of the remote uh, system. You would need to do, you know, safety testing, analysis, uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, initial patient tests with an IDE uh, to, to deploy it in patients. Uh, so that's, that's where we are uh, currently. We, you know, build a really nice prototype, but we were not able to use it uh, clinically uh, oh, because okay. of the, you know, mm -hmm. approval process. And also, um, you know, our prototype is uh, not yet uh, easily sterilizable and cleanable. So that's something yeah. that, you know, we are looking for, you know, funding to, to build a, a, um, easily cleanable uh, clinical prototype that we can then get approval for um, use in patients. What sterilization might not be needed because you could just put drapes over it and say, don't touch it, you know? Um, yes, uh, uh, but you know, uh, if you then um, after use with one patient, bring it to a different isolation room for a second patient, uh, in that step, you need to, you know, mm -hmm. even if it's straight, you need to fully clean it and, 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 and uh, you know, really, um, it, you know, uh, make it safe for anybody to touch it and, and uh, the next patient. Okay, yeah, no, thank you. Um, we have a few more minutes if anyone wants to come up with another question. I have a question. Yep. Yeah, so uh, my question is related to uh, the lung ultrasound system uh, that has been developed. So is it uh, specific to, is, uh, will it remain specific to the lung ultrasound or is it generalizable to other ultrasounds as well? For example, abdominal ultrasound where a lot of organs will be involved. Yeah, fantastic, uh, fantastic question. Um, yeah, I think that the general framework and the architecture is very well suitable for other anatomy. 
Uh, we've been looking into, for example, liver imaging, which is all, also, uh, you know, uh, at least partially covered uh, by the ribs, where really the force feedback and kind of finding those uh, ultrasound windows is very important. Um, you know, what's still missing uh, from our uh, architecture is the uh, kind of real-time integration of the ultrasound imaging for image feedback into the robot. Uh, you know, we are just doing a sweep and, and, and scanning. We're not using the image data yet. Uh, so that will be absolutely critical if we use it for other organs. So you can, you know, uh, segment the organs and then, you know, uh, scan uh, the, the uh, uh, other organs um, systematically. Okay, yep, thanks for that. Um, I see there is a question for Paolo in there. Um, shall I read it quickly out? Yeah, and, uh, and um, so that's for, yeah, for Paolo Fiorini. Um, now my, my screen is jumping up and down. I cannot stop it. So here we are. My question is regarding the methods to achieve autonomy in medical systems. Physicians in general have a lot of prior experience to do these complicated tasks. What is the best way forward to have the same skill set in robot arms? Looking forward to your views on this. That comes from deep. Well, certainly, is a, is a difficult problem, and and the answer answer is is difficult as well. Uh, so the, the way we are approaching the problem is to try to. Uh, er, transform the, the, the knowledge, uh, the available knowledge into uh, structures for or programs for, for, the, for the robot. So basically the, the, the way that you have seen it, this um, uh, logic programs, this ASP implementation of a task uh, are basically uh, uh, derived from the, the current, uh, current knowledge. Uh, we are uh, doing a, a parallel approach where we get uh, text from uh, a surgical manual and from the text, we get the procedure. So of course, uh, this again is a, a preliminary approach because uh, the, the manuals usually don't have uh, all the necessary information. You know, if you cut a, a tissue, uh, nowhere is written that the tissue will, will uh, bleed or the person will bleed. So we are connecting these uh, um, logic programs to a number of ontologies to try to get all the background information. So knowledge representation is a very, very difficult issue, but uh, we are approaching it in this way. Uh, the other way, as I mentioned earlier, is to make use of the data. So basically extract the procedure, the, the reform of the procedures from the data collected during the same procedure. But again, that is uh, perhaps a better approach to get the, the, the flow of actions during, the, uh, during the, the, the procedure, but really it doesn't allow you to get all the logic condition and all the connections that the text uh, representation or description of the, of the intervention could give you. So, you know, there are two different approaches, but the top-down model uh, basing, uh, uh, relying on, on available information, textual information is probably the safer, uh, safer solution for the time being. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So um, I think we are now in good time to move forward to the um, posters. So maybe, Madi, you can give a short explanation on how that works. Yes, thank you very much, Kaspar. Uh, so Farrok is going to chair the poster session right now, which is also our break. Uh, Farrok, you can, please. We don't hear you, Farrok. Do you hear me now, testing? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so sorry for that. Uh, so. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was an amazing uh, series of talks. So now we want to start our uh, break. And during the break, uh, I'm going to play the video for the posters. And I'm going to show you how you can rank uh, the poster, uh, all the audiences and everyone here in this workshop. So, uh, so I'm going to share my screen right now. And, and I'm going to go full screen here. So uh, do you see my screen? Yep, positive. Okay, so yep. in the chat box, I, I put a link uh, for ranking the posters. Uh, so when you click on that link, that's a Google form, and uh, you're gonna see uh, the at the end of that link, you're gonna see these like rankings, and you need to choose your suggestion for the first winner and second winner. 
and you can find the video for each poster. So what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna go for the uh, to play all the video of all the posters. So and uh, that's the first poster. Uh, Faro, have you shared the sound of your computer? Because we don't. The, be hear. the beginning of this poster doesn't have the sound. It starts at. Sorry. But if it doesn't come, I'll. Did you hear it now? No. No. no? Okay. Sorry. Maybe I didn't share the audio. Okay. My mistake. So just give me a second. Okay, the audio started right here. Back in March, the Hopkins Laboratory for Computational Sensing and Robotics reached out to us and we've been working with Dr. Krager and his team to come up with this robot that attaches to the ventilator screen and allows us to control the settings on the ventilator from outside the room. This is something that's that's totally new and unique, uh, but has a real chance to, to, to make a big difference in healthcare. So a mechanical ventilator breathes for the patient and we can set the exact amount of oxygen we need to, to support their lungs um, beyond the capacity that they can do for themselves when they're very sick. To normally control a ventilator, we have to go in the room with the patient right there. On a normal shift, it wouldn't be uncommon to, to go in 6, 8, 10, 12 times in a 12-hour in a shift or even more depending on how many settings changes need to be made. So let's say uh, we need to make a quick change on the oxygen percentage for this patient. So instead of going through the whole process of donning and dolphin or PPE, we can do that change right on here. I can tap on the screen to have the robot bring the stylus right to where I need it on the screen and then uh, tap to have it make, uh, make the change for me all without having to go in the room. We have a little robot finger uh, that is moved uh, in uh, left and right, up and down and in and out on the screen. So anywhere I can touch on the screen, the robot would go and I can tap uh, on that position and the finger goes in and uh, actuates uh, the uh, ventilator. Having the ability to control this ventilator from outside the room is really valuable. Number one, we can save a lot of PPE. Uh, two, it reduces the risk of, of exposure to us for having to go in the room. And then three is the chance of this being really a force multiplier for our respiratory therapists. Our staff, the respiratory therapists, are a finite supply. So if we can spend less time making these minor settings changes, uh, it could make huge dividends for us. Okay, so uh, I assume that you could hear the audio of the poster also. And if not, just let me know, please. So I'm gonna go to the next poster now, poster number two. We envision robot-assisted medical exams in which auscultation is performed. This is a challenging task since during auscultation, human doctors need to identify anatomical landmarks and cope with bones and body fat, which might affect sound quality. As a first step toward automatic robot auscultation, we developed an automated system that gauges sound quality and picks auscultation locations to achieve high enough quality to identify symptoms of disease. Here is an overview of our method. 
in the offline phase between law and hard sound quality estimators from a custom data set of stethoscope recordings. In the online phase, we first perform visual registration and create a prior sound quality map. Then we search for high quality sounds using basin optimization, where a residual Gaussian process model maps the sound quality across the basin surface. The use of the prior sound quality map guides the search of basin optimization and reduces the number of observations needed. Notice that we define a search region for each relevant registered location shown as the green circles. Basin optimization searches for the optimal sound qualities in each of these regions, and the posterior quality map is shown here with green dots at the observed locations. We use a trainer robot to perform auscultation experiments, which is a bimanual mobile manipulator with swappable end factors, and we installed a digital stethoscope. We compare our method against two baselines. In the first baseline, an operator who was trained both for auscultation and teleoperation performs auscultation using VR controllers. In the second baseline, the robot only auscultates at the registered locations after visual registration. Here we compare the results of preliminary experiments. In our method, we are using upper confidence bond at the acquisition function. The termination criteria is the threshold for the difference between the acquisition function value and the current observed maximum. The table lists the time spent on visual registration, time spent on auscultating heart and lawn, the total number of auscultation actions, and the average best found qualities in each region. We note that the qualities here are not estimator estimations, but labeled manually. The robot performs auscultation much faster than human teleoperator, and using basin optimization, we are able to obtain better sound qualities than the baselines. In the results shown here, based on optimization spends a lot of time auscultating the lawn, and since the time of this workshop poster, we have improved this problem by using a parametric prior quality map and a fixed budget as the termination criteria. Our current work involves building the quality estimator training dataset um, with labels from medical professionals and is performing experiments on human subjects with various body types. We are currently preparing a manuscript to IAL. Okay, perfect. That was the second poster. So now we're going to go to the third poster. The COVID-19 pandemic caused fundamental changes in the healthcare system in terms of policies and guidelines. So provide... Okay, sorry to uh, interrupt here. Casper, can you confirm that you hear my audio and, and, and the video is everything is shared well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, okay. I can hear everything okay. so far. Well. Perfect. Having an adequate surgeon patient physical distance is needed. As a result, many elective cardiovascular interventions were rescheduled to manage the resources towards the care of COVID-19 patients. However, most of the cardiovascular intervention could not be postponed, and up to 35% of the COVID-19 patients develop cardiovascular complications. The technology that could decrease the burden on the healthcare system is teleoperated robot-assisted cardiovascular intervention system. The RCI system are teleoperated, and require less number of personnel to operate. Also, RCI is fast and reduces the risk of virus transmission by putting the distance between the health worker and the patient. On the left, you can see the RCI system architecture. And uh, this RCI system typically are compo composed of three main modules, surgeon, patient, and data management module. The advantages are decreasing the radiation, possibility of remote intervention, and increasing the precision. However, the major limitation is on intuitive surgeon interface and lack of force feedback. One of the advance, advancement in the to overcome these challenges is sensorless haptic cue estimations and an available source of information during the RCI procedure is the live image fluoroscopy image. And the author have developed a accurate and a fast sensorless force estimation method for conventional and tendon-driven catheter. The major contribution of this study are that their proposed methods are independent from a 
priori CT or MRI scan. The ex vivo validation study confirmed of the accuracy of this method up to 92%. Another one is intuitive interface and haptic rendering. One of the barriers before haptic provision of for our CI system is that the, uh, the surgeon interface is not intuitive due to the use of control now. Uh, so a novel surgeon interface design was proposed and validated to facilitate the haptic cue mapping from any factory space to the surgeon space. Uh, also various novel uh, optical fiber-based sensor and sensing principle have been developed and since the sensor have soft structure and low profile they facilitate the integration with RCI catheter and also other have uh, proposed and validated the artificial intelligence based feature for introducing semi-anatomy RCI system for example they propose a learning-based control framework for trajectory tracking and the force control for a cerebral catheter with level 2 uh, uh, autonomy. Another one is the last one, hybrid actuation, one of the technical shortcomings that have limited the usability of the commercial RCI system is their constant and predetermined menu variability. To address this limitation, the author are developing hybrid actuation system that allow the soft robot to continuously morph between the rigid and the soft uh, extreme states. Okay, that was the third poster. So we go to the fourth poster now. Hello everyone, my name is Azin and I am a PhD student at the University of California, Merced. Today I want to present a short paper regarding tuning of drone PD controller parameters for medical supplies delivery. As you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic and also similar outbreaks in the future, drones can be set up to reduce human interaction for medical supplies delivery. Drones have a controller to maintain stability and to reach their goal. The most well-known drone controllers are PID controller and also PD controllers. However, the controller parameters need to be tuned and optimized. In this paper, we introduce the use of two evolutionary algorithms, biogeography based optimization and particle swarm optimization for multi-objective optimization to tune the parameters of the PD controller of the drone. So first, we use the Euler Lagrange model to drive the equations of the drone. You can refer to the full paper to find all the equations regarding the model of the drone. Second, we introduce the aggregated objective function, which has been defined based on the four most important criteria in the PD controller. The objective function is set to minimize the difference between the desired and actual value of the state of the drone, phi, theta, psi, and z, which in return reduces settling time, overshoot, rise time, and steady state error. Third, we use two evolutionary algorithms to tune the parameters of PD controller of a drone. PSO is an evolutionary algorithm and the most significant characteristics of fast convergence behavior and its... I can, I can hear the voice, but there's no, uh, it's not moving. I'm playing the video, which is which is from the YouTube. Inherent. That they upload the it, most so. well nineteen for your Merced. Yeah, I think Today I want to present a short paper. So it's only audio, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, okay. this is the link we we received. So. Which, well, then sorry for interrupting. Maybe you just go back to where you were. Yeah, sorry. yeah I think it was here. Which in return reduces settling time, overshoot, rise time, and steady state error. Third, we use two evolutionary algorithms to tune the parameters of PD controller of a drone. PSO 
is an evolutionary algorithm and the most significant characteristics of PSO are fast convergence behavior and its inherent adaptability. BBO is a heuristic algorithm and its performance has proven to be competitive with other optimization algorithms. So we use these two evolutionary algorithms. And finally, we evaluate the performance of multi-objective BBO and PSO on the drone um, with simulation in MATLAB and uh, they showed improved results compared to conventional PD controller which tunes the gains manually. In some cases, PSO works better than BBO and in some cases, BBO works better than PSO. You can find all the equations and results in the full paper. Thank you. Okay, so the authors of uh, poster four, I would suggest if they can check their video on YouTube and update the YouTube. Uh, we already sent the link to all the uh, attendees in the chat box. So if you can update that, uh, um, then people can actually watch the video if you want to have an updated video. So we go to the next poster, poster five and the last poster. Hi everyone, my name is Jane Kelleher and I'm a master's student in Professor Sohan Wong's group at the University of Chicago. I'm excited to share with you our group's work on soft, stretchable pressure sensors for soft robotics and implantable neural prosthetics. Through COVID-19, it's become evident that we're in need of improved technology to improve contactless medicine. Our work addresses one, the need for contactless teleprocedures, which can be facilitated by medical soft robots, and two, the need to reduce the demand for residential care amongst patients with chronic conditions which can be facilitated in part by neural prosthetics to restore lost sensation, function, and mobility. Both of these solutions require interfaces for touch sensation. And to that end, we present two soft, stretchable pressure sensors, a strain and sensitive capacitive sensor for soft robotics and a biocompatible resistive sensor for implantable neural prosthetics. A remaining challenge in the field of epidermal pressure sensors is, is decoupling sensing performance from substrate strain, especially with intrinsically stretchable materials. Our capacitive sensor has high sensitivity, high robustness, and stable sensing in different strain states. As shown in 1A, it features electrical double layer capacitance using an ionic dielectric, a pyramid microstructure, and stiff microelectrodes and spacers. The capacitance is dominated by the EDL capacitance between the top electrode and ionic dielectric. Pressure compresses the microstructure to increase this contact area and provide a capacitance readout. Contact area that is unchanged by strain enables strain and sensitivity. As shown in figure 1B on the bottom right, this is achieved by stiff microelectrodes below the pyramids to reduce deformation and spacers to reduce compression during strain. As evidenced in figure 2A on the top left, our sensor design has a sensitivity of 2.2 per kilopascal. We can see in figure 2B that the signal is virtually unchanged under strain. Responses at 0 versus 50% strain varied by only 2%, which we can interpret as 98% strain and sensitivity. Finally, we demonstrated strain and sensitive sensing for remote medical examination. We mounted the sensor on a pneumatically actuated soft robotic hand. As shown in 2C, this assembly could accurately detect applied pressure during flexion of the finger, allowing sustained application of the necessary pressure. We then applied the microstructure design in the context of implantable neural prosthetics, or INPs. INPs to restore touch sensation after nerve injury would require a subcutaneous, chronically implanted touch pressure sensor with a simple output. To meet this need, we're working on a mechanically and chemically biocompatible contact-resistive pressure sensor for subcutaneous implantation. It employs the same pyramidal microstructure, and as depicted in figure 3B, it features soft, stretchable, and biocompatible sugar alcohol doped P.PSS PSS electrodes on a PDMS substrate. Additionally, we're replacing typical implant encapsulation materials, which tend to have high moduli or are prone to moisture diffusion, with a novel super hydrophobic fluoroelastomer coating to evade protein and cell adhesion, while maintaining the desirable mechanical stretchability. In conclusion, we're very excited about the impact our work with pressure sensing can have in medicine. Thank you for listening to our presentation, and please feel free to see our brief paper or reach out with any questions. Okay, I think that was the last uh, the last poster. Uh, so uh, I just want to mention that the link for the voting for the posters is not uh, posted on the web page of the uh, uh, workshop. So please check the chat box. I'm going to uh, repost the link in the chat box. And uh, also the, the papers, the link for the papers for each poster is also posted on the web page of the workshop. So if you want more information, please check the web page of the workshop for the link to the papers. 
and then check the chat box for a link for uh, for for voting for the posters. So thank you so much. And with that, we I can, think yeah, we can vote now. Yeah, if we want to. Yeah, we can. We can all vote now. Yeah. Thank you. So, so that was the end of our poster session one. Thank you very much, Farouk. Paulo, uh, from here, please take over. Yes. Uh, yes. So now we go to the second uh, session, and I see Marcia is already online and ready to go. So, Marcia, if you want to share your screen and start with your presentation. All right. How's that looking? <laughs> Very good, thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I want to thank all the organizers for the invitation to speak today. It's been really interesting. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to this topic and discuss my experience managing a research lab through pandemic restrictions. Chances are this isn't our last pandemic, unfortunately, and I hope our experiences and lessons learned can help others navigate the challenges uh, of these circumstances. So while my talk is gonna be focused on the accommodations that we made during pandemic restrictions, my research is complementary to many of the talks that you have heard today. A major focus of research in my group has been in the area of exoskeletal robotics for rehabilitation following neurological injuries such as stroke or spinal cord injury. And on this slide, there's a number of uh, systems that we've developed for such applications. Our contributions have ranged from the design of novel hardware systems to control design to methods for detecting movement intent. I also work in the area of haptics for training and providing sensory feedback and human robot interaction. Um, we use this for surgical skill training and even to restore sensory feedback to amputees. So obviously there's a role to play for assistive and rehabilitation robots in the delivery of healthcare during a pandemic, which uh, has been a focus of a lot of the talks today. Um, but uh, I want to focus instead on how a research lab that is experimental and application focused, including a significant amount of human subjects based research, managed to remain productive during the past 15 months and the lessons that we take forward. But before I start, I want to lay out some caveats. So first, my experience is unique to being in the US, in Texas, and at Rice University, which are not always things that are aligned in their uh, approach to a pandemic. Um, also, I am extremely privileged to have a partner whose job was not impacted by COVID, and to have two self-sufficient teenage boys who handled virtual school independently in the spring of 2020 and who returned to in-person school in September of 2021. No, I'm sorry, September 2020. Um, we also have healthy parents who live independently and were not adversely affected by COVID. And so um, my focus today is going to be on COVID-19's impact on research productivity and student well-being, not on health with respect to COVID. I also wanna say that health and safety are my highest priority and any threat to those two things overrides all other advice and guidance that I'm gonna to share today. And overall, I've learned in the past 15 months that it's most important to be understanding, uh, flexible and to adapt. So I'm gonna start with what I'll call the downhill slide that occurred for us in my lab between March and July of 2020. In my various roles at Rice, I'm privileged or privy to some insider information. And so as news of COVID transmission and risk was coming out, I was hearing before most faculty at Rice what steps the university was likely to take to address the situation. This gave me some time to sort of process what was going on before I had to come up with a plan for my group. On March 9th, which was a Monday, we all received an email that classes were gonna be canceled for one week. That was a week before spring break and that we were gonna cut back on occupancy, but still meet in person. Although I knew that we were likely not going to return to in-person activity for the rest of spring 2020. How that was gonna unfold was unclear. Uh, that week, I told my research group that longer term deadlines have not changed. Thesis deadlines, paper deadlines, conference presentations all remain. And if they needed help learning how to access Rice resources remotely to let me know. 
Friday, March 13th, maybe somewhat ominous, was my last day to work in person on campus. We even had an impromptu graduation for our seniors who were uh, to graduate that May. Now I started getting again some more information and insight and so on Saturday, March 14th, I told my group to prepare for 100% remote work, take home hardware, send me pictures. This is getting serious, but stay safe. On March 17th, that was a Tuesday, I walked around a park with my family with my headphones on listening to a Zoom call, a research town hall led by, led by our Vice Provost for Research. And based on the information that I got in that meeting, I was I told my group that they needed to prepare for, at worst, two to four months of remote work. I noted that this was cautious and less time may be sufficient, but I wanted us to be prepared to, to work remotely for two to four months. So in April, we started to work from home in earnest. Students took hardware home. They sent me pictures and inventory lists of what they were taking from the lab. We moved all meetings to Zoom. And we spent kind of April and May figuring out a new normal. By mid-May, it was apparent that this was not going to be a short-term thing. And we needed to figure out how to work effectively in a remote and dispersed manner. So I started out by asking what students needed. I was trying to also gauge their comfort level. So I sent them just a survey. I was aware that the university might start allowing some restricted in-person work by early June of 2020. So I asked my students how comfortable they were with that and what metrics would guide their comfort with returning to in-person work. I was also trying to get a sense of the distribution of risk that my own students had. I mean, they, uh, some have health issues of, them, of their own and also the risk tolerance of my group so that we could be sensitive uh, to a whole spectrum of comfort levels that people had. I was interested to know if people felt they were being effective at home and if they needed access to the lab for certain kinds of work, hardware access, software access, things like that. And I also polled them about the interactions they were seeking. The main requests that I got back were about accountability and a lack of social interaction with everyone being remote. So in response to that, we sort of changed things up and added a bit more structure. We started holding two times a month Mahi online game nights with uh, uh, Steam and, and uh, Jackbox party games and things like that. We set up a Zoom room. This was a recurring meeting, a Zoom meeting that people could just pop into to help support those kind of chance encounters that would normally occur in the lab, but might not, not be possible when everybody is working uh, individually at home. And we also started what we call Monday check-ins. So we use Slack extensively in my group for communication. So we have a new channel called check-ins and every Monday I start a thread. Uh, and include a Zoom link. Each lab member, including myself, writes what they did last week, what they plan to do in the coming week, and then something they did for fun, which you know wasn't always fun, uh, or self-care in the past week. Then during the Zoom, we go one by one and just talk through the posts. Sometimes this was as many as 18 people, and we do this in 30 minutes. This is a quick update. It gives a chance for cross-lab interactions around similar activities. So people who are developing code or people who are trying to plan IRB submissions uh, with special COVID protocols. This also gave us accountability. We now have it in writing what you said you were going to do last week, and this helped to motivate people who were working remotely. At the same time, it was also good for them to see that even for me, some weeks were more productive than others, and I may have two weeks in a row where I have the same things on my to-do list that just didn't get done because of other things that happened. And this actually, we're gonna keep this permanently and we're gonna keep it on Zoom permanently, uh, even when we return to normal after um, our COVID restrictions are lifted. Oop. So one thing that really amazed me was how well my students adapted. Some of them went very remote, going home to home home uh, from Houston. I had students that were in Philadelphia, Denver and Seattle. Um, they prototyped hardware at home using shoe boxes and we shipped things to their home and even did pilot experiments on family members um, to, uh, to help us understand the experiments that we were interested in, uh, in performing when we could get back to the lab. Other students developed full dynamic simulations of hardware that couldn't be moved home, uh, including really wonderful visualizations of our uh, exoskeleton 
and uh, uh, trying to give us a framework where um, students could still develop control algorithms that they would ultimately implement on the hardware down the road. So by June of 2020, we had some guidance from the university finally about what our constraints were. There would be no human subjects research. We would come to campus only for essential work. We were in effect 100% remote. And I wanted to help students establish goals and objectives for that fully remote work. So as an experimentalist, I collected more data. Uh, students were asked to tell me where they were working from, home, Houston, somewhere else, how frequently they were coming to the lab, they were also asked to share their research priorities for summer 2020, and I wanted to get them thinking about how they were adapting uh, their research plans, given the restrictions that we had um, with limited access to campus and, and no human subject experiments. In the fall of 2020, things started looking up. Um, those coming to campus were regularly tested for COVID with um, PCR tests weekly. Uh, we had clear guidance on lab occupancy limits and knew our constraints, and we were allowed to resume human subjects research as long as our participants were within the rice population that was being regularly tested for COVID. Um, I had to do a lab safety check with environmental health and safety to discuss things like social distancing and shielding uh, and masking requirements that we would use. We were limited, as I said, to uh, experiments only on rice populations, so faculty, staff, and students could be our participants. And we had to implement additional COVID safety protocols for all of our human subject experiments, including screening, contact tracing, density limits, and shielding. But we did this. Uh, this continued for all of fall of 2020, and we ran, successfully ran several human subject studies, some with um, dozens and dozens of participants, we collected and analyzed data and submitted papers to conferences and journals. Students who had gone fully remote uh, returned to Houston uh, at different times between September and January of 2021. But unfortunately, with skyrocketing cases in December and January, campus again shut down and our dreams of in-person interactions in spring of 21 were dashed. Um, the shutdown did help curb cases. And so by early March of 2021, shortly after we recovered from our deep freeze in Houston, if you remember hearing that about that in the news, we were finally back to the work conditions and practices that we had in the fall of 2020. And uh, we were even able to gather the whole group together uh, for an end of semester celebration. So now we are facing new challenges as our university begins to lift restrictions. Um, Rice is a relatively small campus. We're about 11,000 total population if you count all students, faculty, and staff. 80% or more of our campus community is fully vaccinated. Testing and mask wearing on campus is now only required for non-vaccinated -vac individuals. So I can have in-person unmasked meetings with other um, vaccinated colleagues and students. And our COVID occupancy restrictions are likely to be lifted soon, meaning that we can return to in-person lab meetings and full lab occupation. But still not everybody feels comfortable returning to normal, so I'm struggling with how do I best manage their hesitation and this normal that we've gotten used to with working from home and restrictions and masks and testing to now sort of re-emerging uh, and getting back to work. So I just wanna go through a few things. What did we learn? Um, my students provided their thoughts on what things contributed to their ability to be productive during the pandemic restrictions. Stable internet was an absolute must. They had good access to software and several paywall-based journal subscriptions through our university and uh, uh, interlibrary loan systems that helped them get access to uh, publications and literature. They were able to take and ship hardware directly to home and that facilitated them working remotely. And several of them uh, had their own 3D printers or access to rapid prototyping and computation tools to keep things moving forward. They also noted several unique opportunities that the situation offered. Lockdown, uh, one of my students said lockdown was a great time to realign my research priorities. Um, several students wrote some great lit reviews. I'm sure others of you have used that same strategy. Um, the pandemic made one of my students treat computational work as a type of rapid prototyping, which was an, a, a process they had not considered before. And uh, another tip, you can make really nice photo booths with some old sheets, a table, and a nice phone stand when you're trying to write papers remotely. 
Some of the challenges were that the lack of spontaneous idea sharing in the lab was really detrimental to progress. It was difficult to keep morale up without people kind of regularly around and harder to explain theoretical concepts over Zoom. The lack of colleagues to physically touch devices when you are a roboticist and a haptics person uh, was absolutely uh, challenging. And um, it was uh, a lot easy to really brainstorm a lot of ideas without actually having to act on them. Um, it was also challenging to be an active participant at conferences, as we are all are realizing. But it did have our, help our students slow down and think about implementing things correctly instead of rushing to finish up experiments. Uh, it was easy for them to strike up new collaborations over Zoom, and it was a great time to deep dive into new field and learn more about their research. So um, I hope that uh, this perspective um, uh, gives you some some different insights into how my group has managed during pandemic restrictions and i look forward to the discussion thank you very much marcia very very interesting uh, discussion i guess everybody of us went through some some of the same process trying to to balance and, uh, and now it's time to to summarize and see what uh, you know for instance in my case i've seen uh, the people that were uh, I don't say less friendly, but it's easy, less easier to communicate. Uh, people get uh, less less uh, less adept to to socialize, or you know. Mm -hmm. So perhaps uh, this, this this effect will disappear in a short time, but uh, it's quite noticeable uh, right now. So, is there anybody to have question for Marcia? Maybe I can come in. Sure. Please, another yeah. question. Um, yeah, fantastic talk. Indeed, a bit different from the other talks, but nevertheless very interesting. Um, I, I also like the idea of um, you know allowing students to take things home and, and work there. And um, I tried that here as well. It was very difficult to organize because of health and safety issues. So how did you overcome these problems if if they existed at your place too? Um. I didn't ask permission. Um, I, uh, I tend to be an ask forgiveness, not permission person. Um, also, I, I knew the nature of the hardware that students were taking was actually um, relatively low risk. We were, uh, most of the students who took hardware home were working with servo motors, vibrotactors. It was more the haptics research that was done effectively at home. And those who had larger hardware like the, the Mahi XO2, our exoskeleton for rehab, my student, Nathan, he um, stayed in Houston. So every now and then he would come to the lab, but he developed that whole simulation environment so that he could do his control development um, in simulation and then just come back and test that in the lab. Um, but yeah, I, I, we just did it. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the way to do it. I mean, I, 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 all my students had to submit a risk assessment, even if it was just using a microcontroller and, you know, connecting things up and running very little little robots that yeah. bought off the shelf. Good to hear. Yeah. In my <laughs> labor, we had several uh, the presence yeah. restrictions. I had to keep tap of uh, uh, everybody, the presence of everybody, the time, uh, not that many people uh, over time, everybody masked. Uh, but we still managed to have some basic level, you know, like three or four people at a time in the mm -hmm. laboratory. So there was something that was still going on. Any other question? If not, we don't want to get Elena to, to be annoyed and to be nervous because we are making her wait too much. So please, Elena, go ahead. Uh, the screen is yours. Not the floor is yours, but the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Paolo. I'm sharing the screen. So can you see the presentation? OK, thanks. So thank you, Paolo, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizer for inviting me to this workshop. And uh, yes, thanks also for the previous presentation, which I found really, really interesting. I'm here to speak about the research that we have done in the last year during the, the pandemic related to how to further distancing the surgeon from the operating table and uh, towards what was asked by our clinical partners to have a sort of a virtual hospital. 
And uh, yes, yeah, so this is also connected what, uh, with uh, what Paolo was saying before about the need of uh, distance, of let's say, uh, putting distance between people during the, the, the pandemic. So this is a brief description of the lab, uh, which we uh, opened and uh, right before the pandemic. So we had the big opening of the lab uh, the week before the, the lockdown. So maybe we were also causing some uh, spread of the virus because we had the last uh, catering event in, in Polytechnico and then shutdown. So the, last, the shutdown actually uh, in Milano, in our university lasted two months. Then uh, in this uh, winter time and the autumn time and winter time, we were able to access the lab with restrictions, but uh, for, fortunately the, the lab is an open space. So the, the space was, uh, was a lot and then we could accommodate all the, the PhD students there. So the lab is the Leonardo Robotics Laboratory is gathering all the uh, research related to robotics of my department, which is a big department in a big technical university. So robots deals with uh, industrial uh, tasks and also drones and human robot interaction. For the medical part, we have uh, two. Uh, rooms for the surgical part, uh, one related to basic prototyping and uh, the other one in which we accommodate the Da Vinci research kit. During the COVID time, uh, one of my colleagues dealing with the industrial application, he was uh, collaborating with the ABB and, the, and one hospital in Milano and they were able to work on the automatization of COVID tests. And so to sample, to uh, actually try to classify the, the swab, uh, whether there was uh, uh, COVID or not. And um, they, they um, went on, on the, the news and uh, they, they claimed that they could automatize the procedure so that uh, to reach up to uh, for 450 uh, samples per hour. Then uh, when we went back uh, in, in the autumn uh, during after the summer, we had some meetings with the hospital uh, in Milano and uh, we analyzed together with them uh, the situation that they, they coped. So apart from the hospitals which, we, which were dedicated to COVID treatment, the other ones uh, uh, in Milano, in the Lombardy region, which is the northern region in, in Italy, we uh, usually we gather patients from all around Italy because um, uh, there are highly specialized centers, especially for oncological treatment. So during the after the pandemic, they complained that they lost a lot of uh, possible customers, as they call them. So patients who were not able to to travel because of the pandemic. So their the idea was to. Uh, try to uh, localize, to have a sort of hub and spoke structure of, of, uh, of the hospital so that the treatment could uh, be done locally. And so the hospital of the future was thought about them to be a sort of a virtual hospital with the local treatments for remote patients. This is also a nice report which was published by McKinsey about the analysis of what can be uh, moved out from the hospital, from the physical hospital. So apart from major surgery treatment, you can see here that minor procedure and also imaging are services which can be moved out of the hospital. And also you can combine this with, uh, as for example, experts, so remote consultation with experts. And so this gave us some ideas about what could be the, the needs of our, let's say, clinical partners for the future. So some experience about uh, having remote surgery has already been, uh, let's say, uh, came out already in the news. We have this experience, which was made by Sarafele together with the Italian Institute of Technology a couple of years ago, together with Vodafone company. They were able to perform um, prototypical uh, operations on some uh, uh, phantom for uh, um, intervention on the larynx. And these other news came uh, out recently about Huawei and China uh, brand, Unicorn Fujian branch and the Fujian Medical University. They performed remote surgery on an animal, it was a liver transplant. 
So yes, so 5G offered for sure the possibility so to, to transfer, to uh, easily transfer data and might uh, give the possibility of having uh, actually remote surgical interventions. Another concrete example of possible application of, uh, mm, let's say, virtualizing, so mm, remoteizing the operation is this use that recently came out in Italian journal about remote consultation. So they claimed that uh, there was an actual surgical intervention from 1,200 uh, kilometers apart, but actually it was just a, a consultation because only the images were transferred to other experts to have a sort of consultancy during, in real time during the operation. So this is our, is, uh, our setup. We have uh, this uh, Da Vinci Research Kit in a nice historical environment. So it's uh, the, the lab that we just built recently. And as you all, all know, so the Da Vinci system is composed by this uh, uh, huge uh, patient side operator and the surgeon side uh, console, in which that the, the surgeon can use to see through the display and to manipulate the, the, the arms on the other side. So the idea was to try to separate, further separate these two elements uh, using the setup of our lab. So we took into account the surgeon site, so the serial viewer and the two manipulators, and we replaced them using this uh, head-mounted display and the two joysticks. So the system is the, the same that I saw in some previous presentation, the HTC Vive Pro. And uh, so one operator was uh, sitting in what we called the control room, and the other operator was, uh, and the, the system was placed in another room. The communication was done through the uh, network of the university and the two setups were 30 meter, meters apart. So this is uh, the setup that we, that we had. As you can see here, the problems on the um, surgeon side were to control the, uh, either the uh, endoscope through the uh, motion of the head of the operator. Uh, and so we had to, so the, the idea was, so our desire was to have um, um, physiological control so that uh, the uh, endoscope could be easily moved by the operator. And then we also, uh, in, we also do, we also implemented the control on the joystick so that the two joysticks could be able to uh, activate the two, uh, left, the left and the right arm and the button was used to activate the seven degrees of freedom of the instruments. So the technical challenges were mostly related to the control of the endoscope. And what we did is that we made to coincide the focal axis of the endoscope with the line of sight of the HTC device. Uh, there was also a possibility of uh, zooming in and zooming out just with the, the motion of the head. For safety measure, um, let's say for safety issues, we, the motion of the endoscope was restricted. Then we made some tests. We designed this uh, testing setup, which is uh, the standard laparoscopic st skill training and testing platform with uh, this bag and the rings to be in the rings to be inserted in the bags. And uh, we asked uh, 36 users to perform seven repetitions of the, uh, of the task. And uh, the setup that we used were three. So the user had to use the standard uh, DaVinci Research Kit, uh, use the standard, so the DaVinci Research Kit console with the head mounted display, or the uh, head mounted display and the joystick to command the, uh, the uh, slave side of the DaVinci. And that's what we found out. So surprisingly, what we found is that there is no statistical difference in the three uh, ways of uh, uh, using the system. And that there is a, a, an appreciable uh, learning curve in the three, uh, all the three uh, uh, platforms. Uh, it has to be said that the user were not practice to, to use neither the DaVinci Research Kit nor the HTC uh, display. 
but what we demonstrated is that the system can be controlled using this uh, uh, different setup. What's next? So the basic limitation that we had is that the um, full H um, high definition endoscope stereo images are projected to the HMD display, but lower to, so lowering the resolution because we had also the, 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 the problem of transferring the, the images in real time. So the idea for the future is to change the display and to uh, also work uh, to do some research work on fast image um, uh, transfer uh, using some deep learning technique in order to, um, to let's say, have, decrease the resolution of the images to the part of the images which are which needs less attention from the surgeon, and we are using some uh, advanced uh, algorithm to do this process and to guarantee that the surgeon can can see the images in uh, high resolution. So the we are trying to move towards what was asked by our clinical partners so to have. Uh, remote assistance and remote diagnosis because the, one of the possibility of our system is that the expert could be, let's say, in one hospital and the patient to be diagnosed in another hospital. So I try, for example, to transfer the images uh, so that the diag diagnosis can be done. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'm available if you have any question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Elena. Uh, you make a short presentation, so we have plenty of time for, for questions. I hope that uh, everybody can, can jump in, especially on the issues of uh, Hospital of the Future, uh, which is uh, at least was uh, uh, probably in, in every country, but in Italy, it was obvious that uh, the hospital must ex extend from the, the walls of the hospital to or towards a patient's home. And... Uh, and, and, and these are some of the issues that we are struggling with right now. So any questions on, on Elena's talk? Yeah, so in Italy, we had the problem of local doctors and the problem of accessing, let's say, surgical, uh, sorry, uh, healthcare facilities during the, the pandemic. And our local doctors were not even uh, taught about how to treat the, the disease. So, especially in my region, so in Lombardia, because in Italy we have also different situations according to different regions. I know that in Veneto situation was slightly better. But uh, yes, another problem was about uh, what the hospital are asking to, to do next. And uh, of course, telemedicine and uh, remote diagnosis, remote uh, consultation is a must that we should, uh, we should uh, offer some te technological solutions to them. Okay, there is a <coughs> question on, on the chat. Uh, how to cover some issues that the patient uh, do not trust the robot? This is not solved. Is there? So the question is about uh, the trust of the, of the patients towards the robots. And this is, uh, yeah, this is a problem that if it's not solved, the hospital do not want to start using the robot. Um, th this is an important point because we, we I think that this, this fear of the robots has been overcome with respect to robotic surgery and patients themselves want to be uh, treated by the robot, but in other fields, uh, does anybody uh, has, has any, any opinion or any, any feedback on, on the uh, impact of, 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 of uh, automation and robotic automation on uh, healthcare outside the surgery? So in my view, uh, yeah, as you said, when you are selling that the system is making the treatment or the, the possibilities to be safer, you are immediately convincing somebody that the technology is uh, making, uh, let's say, assuring that you, the, what you're doing is safer. So for example, the same thing with cars. If they are telling you that the autonomous, autonomous car is safer, everybody, I think, would... Uh, go for that in that direction. 
For robots in hospital, for example, the ones that are performing automatic tests or robots going around to monitor patient status, uh, let's say, to also during the pandemic, some robots were sent through the hospital uh, in order to check patients and uh, to interact with them. It's the same. So in that case, you are, you're increasing the safety of the operator in that case. So I would say that uh, when the robots uh, increase the safety of either the operation in the operator or of the, the patient, uh, that would be a plus in order to have a push in their insertion, let's say, in their entrance to the hospital. I'd like to, to relate an experience that, that we had. It's, it's not obvious to me that patients will necessarily distrust the robots. I think that becomes, that emerges out of uh, social interactions among the, the patients. An experience we had quite some time ago, admittedly, in, in an installation in a nursing home in Japan was that the therapy robots were installed and they were available for, uh, for um, uh, the patients to use as needed. This was in it. This is in a skilled nursing facility, and oddly enough, the uh, the, um, the patient population would sign up for the robot because they were they perceived it in some way as extra treatment or special or whatever. So it it, it wasn't obvious to me that the uh, patient community distrusted the, the machine. It was more a novelty for them. The novelty factor, the, the, the appeal of a technology can play a game, can play, can have a part in this. And in fact, we have seen how intuitive marketed the robot, the, the, that's the leverage of the patients and, and to, to create the image of high tech in the hospitals and, and that uh, worked out quite well. Uh, so perhaps people are, are uh, willing to try these new new devices and, and uh, not everybody perhaps will do that, but. Uh... I think another aspect is it's, it's a matter of familiarity. I mean, you know, nowadays we drive around in uh, automobiles that can and do kill a lot of us. At one point that was strange, now we're used to it. I think similar things will happen as robots penetrate into unusual environments. Yes, thanks, David. So anyway, thank you very much, Elena. And uh, so we move to the next speaker, who's uh, another good friend. I think he's, uh, he should be, you should, you should just stop sharing the perfect. Yeah. And here is Ferdinando. So Ferdinando, the screen is yours and then go with the presentation. Let me just share my screen. Can you see? Yes, perfect, thank you. Can you see? So of course, uh, over a year of pandemic, it's slowly now green screen, proper lighting, slowly you know, becoming more professional with this sort of virtual delivery. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you all to present some of the work we're doing, or we have been doing over the course of this very strange COVID year. I should start by saying that as an institution, we have done a little bit to try and support the community, both the clinical and the technical community within the context of this absolutely unprecedented pandemic. Uh, first and foremost, through the work we've done as an institution and through the Hamlin Center and UKRAS with this particular competition that we launched last year for the first time in 2020, which is Medical Robotics for Contagious Diseases, which was very much aimed at trying to identify and support early technologies for the purpose of supporting the pandemic in any which way possible. Clearly, the majority of systems that came our way were cleaning robots, but we had some very interesting projects on, for example, supporting patients during recovery using robotics and mechatronics. The, the particular competition, the results of which are on, on the website, have also been launched, uh, have been so successful that we're running it again this year, and we are currently reviewing uh, submission for 2021. We also, as an institution, supported the wider European effort in the IHR, which is a hub, a network, uh, a European network for healthcare robotics, through which we, we, we identified a number of promising technologies, again, in the context of COVID, and 
um, late last year, we supported uh, a number of companies and uh, institutions which you see up on screen through a small seed fund that has basically allowed them to progress with technology that has the potential to support the pandemic in one way or another. Now, within the context of my own research group, I cannot say we have specifically target, targeted COVID simply because, as we all know, research has got a fairly long time span and it's very difficult to react promptly and produce something at a sufficiently high TRL to really impact something as imminent as the pandemic was come March of 2020. But of course, we have continued to, we have continued to push on in um, an area that is very important to me and has always been, which is sort of surgical robotics. So I thought I would use the next 10, 15 minutes to describe some of the very latest work our research group has, has carried out and published in the area of surgical robotics, um, with a view to, to, if nothing else, demonstrate that even though we were all stuck at home, teleworking with very limited access to experiments and simulations, the researchers in the group, as, as well as many researchers across the world, have soldiered on producing some incredibly good and cool technology. Now, the area of robotics that I've always pivoted around is the area of cooperative robotics, right? So the sort of robots that work synergetically with the robot, the sort of robots that work synergetically with the clinician. And in the context of my group, we have three main lines of research that involve smooth interactions, um, visual augmentation, and smart devices. In other words, a range of technologies which together can help not only make technology that is more accurate and more precise, but it also better integrates within the operating theater because of having had the opportunity and privilege to see a system back in the early 2000s go from bench to bedside, I sort of realized that a real stumbling block for this technology to make it into the big leagues has to do with how they integrate with, within the operating theater and especially how, uh, in how less intrusive they have to become for the clinician to use in order for them to be successful. Now, in this context, we've done a, a few things, and one that is very close to my heart has to do with the idea of smart delivery. So the same sort of approach of navigation and robotics, but with a significantly less amount of surgical involvement. And what you see here is a proof of concept where you're using depth cameras instead of the classical IR navigation uh, trackers to basically track the anatomy of the exposed patient. And that is because one of the absolute stumbling blocks, at least in orthopedic uh, robotics, is the fact that in order to track the patient, you tend to put invasive three-dimensional uh, three triplets and you screw them into the bone in order to track the limb, which of course is very bad for the patient because you've got additional incisions, is intrusive, you've got scarring, and you've got certain other risks associated to the addition of these markers. So ideally, if you could have a means to navigate and track these, these limbs without having any surgical involvement and without having any percutaneous fixation, that of course would be, would be great. And what you see in this little video is a very, very low cost 3D scanner that does a number of things. It looks at the anatomy of the patient, which in this case is a plastic femur. It identifies, and I'm gonna run it again as I talk through it. Um, it identifies the anatomy, identifies line of sight with the anatomy, so reorients the camera if the surgeon comes into the way, and also allows the surgeon to push the robot away if the robot comes um, or is, it becomes destructive or distract, distracting or intrusive. Now, you, 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 you'd be right to think that this is a very artificial setup because, of course, every basic imaging technology can identify a plastic bone within a lab setup. Whilst we know that robots work within an operating theater with blood, with soft tissues, with uh, all sorts of other uh, interferences that have to be taken into account. And while I am not in a position where I can show you this, all of these problems can be done, we have begun to look at identifying whether you could actually take one step forward with depth imaging to see whether you can take this unstructured point collection acquired in the operating theater, even though this is still a lab, and find ways to automatically segment that scene so that we can identify what is bone from what is not. So ideally, yeah, the machine would uh, seamlessly look at this scene and identify that that is bone and everything else is not. Now, of course, we don't want to use 
intraoperative labeling, and we don't really want the surgeon to interfere with the process at all. And so what we did is we took a number of cadaveric uh, knee joints in, in, a, in, a, in a wet lab setup, and they basically imaged it in 3D from a number of different orientation, landing condition, and so on and so forth. And then because we were under a very controlled setup, we were able to semi-automatically segment what we knew was bone from what we knew was not bone in all of these images. And we padded these in a number of ways which are slightly beyond the scope of, of this presentation. But to cut a long story short, we were able to then take all of this information, feed it to a suitably trained neural network to see whether as a result of having identified what is bone and what is not in clinically representative setups, we could actually get the machine to figure out what was born and what was not autonomously. And what you see in these slides, on the left, you'll see what the RGB camera sees, and on the right, you see what the, the depth camera sees with the real-time overlay of what is born and what is not. And as you can see, as the video runs, the red shows you bone, and it shows you bone in the absence of any specific training for that particular scene. In other words, we've made the first step in trying to identify robust algorithms that allow you yeah, to identify that this that we're looking at is bone without having to individually register or segment it. And as of just now, thanks to an incredible student that I've got at the moment with whom I'm doing some amazing research with, his name is Shue, we are taking one step forward. And this actually is not even fully published yet. Um, and it demonstrates that not only we can do this robustly, but we can now quite well, we can also um, handle occlusions and we can also abstract the setup so that it is agnostic to the limb that you've trained on and the camera that you've used to train. So basically baby step in the direction, in the direction of a surgical assistant of the future where the type of interaction and assistance that you can provide the clinician is seamless and does not require any additional setup. Now on the same sort of, um, in the same vein, We've also done a, quite a bit of work over the past few years with some very recent work just published with the concept of augmented reality. Because having spent hours and hours in the operating theater, I also know that the way that you transfer information to the clinician is important. And what you don't want to do is either overload the clinician or provide the wrong information or the right information at the wrong time. And of course, augmented reality through something like the HoloLens offers some real promises in terms of simplifying the clinical setup so that it actually becomes more useful to the, to, the, to the clinician. And what you saw running on the video here was our very first attempt of trying to blend augmented reality within a commercial system through our collaboration with Smith & Nephew, who a number of years ago bought the company of a very good friend of mine called Branco Jaramas, uh, which was called um, Bluebelt, and the system called Navio. So what we did in this first setup is to basically take the physical 2D screen of the Navio and transfer it into the augmented reality setup to see whether that simple process of making the screen virtual could improve, um, uh, could improve the setup. Now we, we published a preliminary abstract in Epic Series in Healthcare Sciences in 2020, and we're just about to publish the clinical um, investigation where we see whether the effect of this augmented reality setup is promising, and this is obviously work by, by my finishing PhD student, Isham Iqbal. But we wanted to also take it one step forward because, of course, the real power of augmented reality in the not so distant future is not only to overlay a 2D screen in the virtual scene, but actually to take real, accurate, timely cues which are, guide, are guidance cues and superimpose them accurately onto the patient at the right time. And of course, in order for that to happen properly, we also have to work with the Microsofts of this world to produce technology that is sufficiently accurate, robust, and fast to be able to do this safely in the operating theater. But as a proof of concept, what you see here, I'm gonna run the little video on the right, we have a complete um, segmentation and registration of a plastic femur with an overlay of the guidance, which in this case is the pilot hole in the femoral head, overlaid on the eyes of the clinician. Now, as you see, as the, as the clinician moves the limbs, the, the, the augmented reality cue takes a bit to, to adjust. So obviously we're not there yet, but as a proof of concept, it really does show a little window into what the future holds for this type of tech.
Now, on the context of devices, we've also done quite a bit over the last um, 12 to 14 months, notably with a large multi-scale center that we basically set up with the Chinese University of Hong Kong, thanks to some um, large-scale government funding, together with Hopkins and uh, ETH Zurich, we were really sort of trying to develop an expertise in soft robotics. And specifically, both the manufacturing and the complexities of control applied to soft manipulators like the one you see here. Now, this is a five-year program which only, only just started. But of course, as you can see, we have, we have published through the work of an incredible senior research fellow whose name is Enrico Franco, quite a, um, a, a technology base or a, or a research base in our understanding of how to make the manipulation and the handling and the control of these soft actuators more robust and more inclusive. On the soft robotic side, we've also done a little bit of work on cochlear implantation, because as far as we've progressed on the control and the understanding of how to control these devices, we've also been uh, doing some work on how to make soft devices. And as I became uh, the co-director of the Humming Center, we have some unique technologies to draw, thermally draw, some very, very special miniaturized catheter, as you see here, um, using a number of materials. And so my, my student, Daniel, is using a type of material called a shape memory polymer, which is a little bit like a nitinol, a shape memory alloy. It changes shape according to temperature. And we're using this as a concept to see whether we can create a cochlear, trans, uh, a cochlear um, implant, which as you can see in this video, changes shape um, automatically as a result of the change in temperature from the operating theater space to body temperature. And of course, as you could see in this little video here, we're also trying to understand whether we can simulate how a shape memory polymer works within the context of this procedure which will also include in the future um, sensorization to understand whether we can use impedance measurements to understand where you are in the cochlea. And of course, some sort of robotics and augmented reality to then provide the tools to the clinicians to use it. And some very early work was published recently in TMRB. And finally, yeah, my third child is this needle steering system, which has been with me for longer than I can remember. It's been almost 15 years in the making. And over the past few years, I've been coordinating a large European project called Eden 2020, which together with some partners in Germany, the Netherlands and Italy, and here in the UK, has attempted to create a precision platform for neurosurgery. And I am pleased to say that even though COVID has come in, in, in a bit in the way and have, has stopped us cold in the midst of a preclinical trial on the ovine model, we still have a setup now, which is at a sort of pre-production level. You can see here it's made up of a number of components, which I will not go through into any great detail here, but I bring it up because we only just recently published in 2020, the first overall system um, description in uh, biomimetics in 2020. And there is a TRO paper under review, which describes all of these components in a little bit more detail. Importantly, within the context of Eden 2020, we spent quite a bit of time on the software components that make a steerable catheter for neurosurgery applicable. And this is thanks to a PhD that just graduated, whose name is Marlene Pinzi, who spent a great deal of time figuring out how we could plan and replan uh, procedure optimized trajectories for needle steering in the brain. And I've also worked together with colleagues in uh, uh, UC, um, UMCG, so Sartak and his uh, student uh, Fusia, on FPG based sensing, which we're also doing. Uh, at Imperial, and of course my colleague Daniele, with whom we spent almost a decade looking at ways to model tissues in the brain more accurately. And this is actually quite a landmark paper that we were able to produce in the midst of COVID that finally demonstrated that many of the tissues within the brain are indeed non-isotropic, which basically means they, they, they allow uh, liquids to, to, to flow in certain directions, preferentially to others. Now, obviously, this is a, a big topic which we cannot cover here, but it is important because it breaks from some misconceptions that actually the tissue is, for all intents and purposes, homogeneous and actually tells us that there actually there are preferential pathways in the brain that you could piggyback to optimize, for example, drug delivery. Uh, all of this is obviously coming to fruition in the context, in the context of translation, like many of my colleagues have said earlier today. And for us, it's a company called Neopro Surgical, which we're currently discussing how to spin out with Imperial College, but it will be based on 
the, the imaging planning and navigation modules that we've developed in Eden, this unique needle steering system, which we developed over, over a decade, and an intraoperative guidance setup, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, the idea here is that this is a technology platform that can then be used for a number of neurosurgical procedures ranging from in situ diagnostics to laser ablation and DBS. But there is one in particular that we have set our, our, our minds to, and that is LIT, or laser, laser Interstitial Thermal Therapy, which is basically a form of a therapy in uh, uh, epilepsy, which you can imagine in the commercial sense is the Medtronic Visual Aids. Now, because in the majority of these cases, the target is actually bin shaped, having the possibility of uh, accurately targeting a bin shaped structure through a curvilinear trajectory as opposed to a straight one would offer some very significant advancements uh, to the field. And that is why we're targeting this first as this little video demonstration demonstrates. So the idea of a flexible catheter that traverses uh, along curvilinear trajectories to a deep seated target and then once it gets to the lesion of interest, it uses um, lasers to thermally ablate the lesion. And so with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, for their attention and obviously thank students and funders, which allow me to come here every year and present some very, very good science, because of course, the more senior you get, the more <laughs> you have little time to sit in the lab and actually do this amazing work. So thank you very much. Very happy to take questions as they are right. Thank you. Thank you, Ferdinando. It's great, great talk as usual. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Please. Stand into silence. Okay, everybody is uh, speechless after your talk. I think so four hours yeah it's virtual workshop i think it's it's a it's a tall order yeah but maybe next year we'll be face to face that's all we can hope for and i suppose the science seems to be quietly pointing in the direction of things getting progressively better yeah, we can hope hopefully yes hopefully yes so <clears throat> tell me something about the um, translation of your your uh, uh, research into into a, a product. Is that uh, uh, at what point are you? Is that a difficult uh, difficult task? Is that uh, Paolo? Uh, it's a labor of love. Yeah, I mean you can paint it positive, but you know it's been so translating technologies like medical robots is it's a really tall order. You know, and 15 years ago, I thought it was going to take five years and then 10 years. And with Eden, I thought I was going to be there by the end of it. And now Eden is finished and I see that there is more that has to be done. So in reality, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's like a, a vision, yeah, and, and, and we're not there yet. Importantly, I think the, the big thing is that big companies who support translation into industry, into a, into a product, they prefer to to to... to they stay behind and let you do all the work to first demand, right? And the small companies who would be able to jump in earlier with a bigger risk don't have the capital to really push to this last level because at every, every, every stage of TRL increase, the amount of money you have to spend increases substantially. And, and I think that's where I think my American colleagues are slightly better placed because the appetite for risk in the US. And in fact, in the Far East, so I've spent some time in Taiwan and I've seen the, the, the entrepreneurial setup and the venture capital setup they've got there. I mean, I think it works what we've got in Europe and certainly it works what we've got in the UK. Very challenging. Much yeah. easier to do the proof of concept. That's the fun bit. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, money is always the issue. And money comes with, with the ability to risk and, and propensity to, to, to take challenges and so forth. So let's see, there is a question on the chat, let's see. Uh, do you see any need to change uh, EU legislation to push uh, further the, the, such solutions, I guess, uh, robotic solutions or, or your solutions? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this moment to, to actually put a plug in because 
the community, the, 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 the surgical robotic community in the UK has come together to refresh a white paper on surgical robotics, which hopefully will make their way uh, to the public in the next month or two. So it's, it's been a labor of love from, led by uh, Pietro Valdastri from Leeds, Christos Bergeres from King's, um, Anna, Anna Cruz Ruiz, who's the DH uh, hero manager, and myself. But it obviously encompasses the entire community. And one of the big issues here is regulation, of course, right? Because regulation always lags behind. And the further we progress, the faster technological progress is, a bit like Moore's law. And so, if anything, the gap is extending, and that makes it a lot harder to sort of navigate what is necessary to eventually make these things into products. And that's Brexit aside, which is a whole different ballgame. Yeah. Well, Hello, thank you very much, Fernando. There's a question for Ferdinando on YouTube. So I'm just okay. going to put it into the chat box and ask uh, Ferdinando to make it, take it to the ch uh, chat uh, and yeah. answer it later if possible. But I mean, Paolo, if you want, we can move to the next. Uh, no, well, the, 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 I guess <laughs> I, I don't see the question arriving. So that's why I am. OK, yes. very good. Do you, so, so the question is, do you plan on working with soft robots in the piggybacking scheme you talked about in, in uh, uh, isotropic brain cells? So the question, so in a, in, soft robotics is a broad, a, broad, a broad topic. And I think the catheter that I described is Eden 2020 catheter, which I didn't labor on today. It's a type of soft robot is entirely software compliant. What type of soft robot is more appropriate for a specific task, I think is, is, is an open question, right? So for, for, for neurosurgery, I think either, so I mean, what was the original design was called Sting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's specifically targeted at tissues which is very soft, compliant and delicate. Yeah, for, for the GI tract, for example, then it's more of the work we showed through the MRC where you have much more scope for, for designs which have got a bigger payload capabilities at the end, because of course the, the GI tract is much more resilient than, than brain tissue. So I guess I guess an open question. All right. Thank you, Ferdinando. Let's move to the last presentation of this session. Fortunately, the speaker, uh, Sanya Dagger Matzi, she is not here, but she was able to send us a, a movie and uh, Mari will will uh, put it on the screen if you, if you may. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Mari. Hello, um, my name is Sanya Dugramanzi. Thank you very much for inviting me to present at the workshop today and apologies for not being able to do a live presentation. Um, I'm from the Department of Automatic Control and System Engineering at University of Sheffield. And today I will talk about wearable master and anthropomorphic tools for surgical teleoperation. So my research portfolio uh, broadly covers um, surgical robotics, assisted living and physical HRI and soft robotics. So here are some examples of, of my most recent projects. Um, and today I will focus on smart search project that's been running for the last few years in robot assisted minimally invasive surgery. So here is a screenshot of um, our submission to Hamlin Surgical Robot Challenge and the list of partners involved in the project. So for a smart search project has been set up to explore um, different use cases, um, situational awareness, safety, um, and um, a different uh, concept of uh, teleoperation. So here you can uh, see the uh, comparison with the existing Da Vinci system in terms of uh, smart search approach in visualization uh, using um, uh, using uh, augmented reality and composite views, um, wearable master manipulator and anthropomorphic slave manipulator. Uh, so the three uh, surgical um, the three surgical specialties um, are uh, have been uh, driving the, the project through. So uh, in the summary of requirements, we collected from forty surgeons in three different specialties. Um, and uh, we, um, we wanted to um, have a clinical input to uh, push technology development. 
So there have been um, different aspects from haptics to active constraints, enhanced vision and dexterity. And today I'm going to talk about um, increased instrument dexterity um, in the project. So the full list of uh, requirements have been uh, published a couple of years ago. So today I'm going to talk about wearable behind controller uh, for uh, three finger surgical forceps using, using virtual reality to explore dexterity. Uh, learning um, using then hand tracking to learn the motion and map the motion of, of different surgical tools and also using machine learning uh, for senseless force sensing and uh, palpation haptic feedback. Uh, so the need for hand-like instrument in surgery stemmed from um, uh, from um, inspiration was to retract uh, to create something that can retract or manipulate the delicate tissue. Um, um, as opposed to um, um, a rigid, uh, rigid instruments not being able to distribute forces um, to the tissues sufficiently. Multi-finger surgical tools uh, have been developed in the past for uh, ocular robotic surgery, for precise manipulation, but also different developments uh, have uh, used um, um, a human um, dexterity as inspiration. So Da Vinci, um, tool has uh, two fingers, um, uh, forceps, so our three finger tool uh, was, uh, has a six degrees of freedom um, and um, is driven by a set of maximum motors um, attached to the distal end. Um, so we have uh, uh, developed uh, this geometric uh, parameters based on optimization for grasping and force capability. Um, and uh, this optimization uh, was defined through two different indexes um, and that uh, which uh, optimization actually delivered uh, the length of each uh, finger um, and their uh, ratio as well as parameter of the base of the three finger uh, platform. Uh, so we use Pareto Frontier for the optimization uh, to uh, generate these, these three parameters. So we tested uh, our hand tracking system um, in, um, first of all, in virtual reality in the simulator and then on, um, on the actual physical platform that was designed and built in um, at Bristol Robotics Lab. Um, so wearable device for, for, have been designed um, so this spoke um, and uh, with uh, 13 um, sensors, I'm using sensors on uh, the three digits and the wrist, uh, we tested accuracy of, of the, our system using Polaris tools and evaluated um, um, error through the finger flexion and extension and compared with Polaris. Um, of course, this uh, because IMU suffers from this um, uh, drift, we had to calibrate um, also, this has this depends on the size of, of, of the head of the surgeon, so it requires calibration um, by opening and closing the hand, and the mapping um, to to the surgical tool uh, is then done um, by first of all limiting uh, the range of motion of the tool to re to map and resemble the human uh, range of motion, um, but also in order to, uh, to map the, the, the tool, we used uh, uh, two different methods, joint to joint and the triangle um, and the triangle calibration, uh, the triangle mapping. Uh, so we tested uh, accuracy of motion by um, having the each digit to move in 10% range of motion uh, in opening and closing and recording the actual um, angle of the two, uh, two joints of the thumb. So here are, is that example. <clears throat> we um, we did the test uh, by uh, using uh, the the variable system to drive uh, the Da Vinci um, uh, Da Vinci instrument um, and the wrist uh, and also in opening and closing uh, to uh, a cut. So these are the Da Vinci scissors to uh, cut a sample um, of the material um, just by opening and closing uh, the index and the middle finger. Uh, then we did the trials with the surgeon um, and the haption. So the haption uh, drives um, drives the cooker robot, and we did some 
um, set of trials of the pick and place using the laparoscopic trainer. Uh, we did a similar set of um, uh, trials of, and tests with three finger tool on the same laparoscopic uh, trainer in the lab to evaluate uh, the functionality of the instrument. Uh, then learning hand motion um, is where we use the input hand movements and we map them uh, to, we, we, first of all, we did that for uh, Da Vinci motion and then for Castro Viejo instrument, which is the instrument that is used in open heart surgery. Uh, so to do that, we first of all collected the data. So this was, uh, hand motion was recorded during a mitral uh, valve surgery, which was performed by an experienced surgeon on heart surgeon on uh, the ex vivo um, animal uh, heart. <clears throat> we evaluated the range of motion of each digit uh, in the first set, um, and um, then we um, then we uh, we use the input uh, from uh, finger and thumbs and wrist um, in order to map um, the motion of the of the hand and the wrist with motion of the Castro Viejo instrument. So the Castro Viejo instrument we had uh, we're tracking the general orientation of the tool and opening and closing using um, a set of strain gauges. Uh, so for this um, we collected sample data of the joint and angles and we also uh, run two different networks in order to compare ability to predict um, the, the to pre predict the accuracy of the mapping, uh, which we achieved about 90%. We explored dexterity further on uh, in virtual reality, reality using X and suit and, and minus VR gloves um, and the virtual reality kit. So the surgical uh, environment was developed in Unity and we tested with uh, lay users and clinical users a different dexterity of, uh, of the shaft. So having just wrist and having wrist and elbow and having either Da Vinci uh, end vector or having three finger tool. Uh, so with this, uh, we, we didn't um, find a, a, a very big difference uh, in terms of time of completion. <coughs> Sorry, when we did um, the simple pick and place task, um, we got pretty similar results. However, when we created a, a more complicated surgical environment uh, um, where we recorded the time of completion, but also the collisions, uh, we um, actually uh, found that um, having a, a extending dexterity on the shaft and three finger tool gives less collision and, and a, a faster completion time. <clears throat> We also de develop haptic device uh, for the palpation feedback uh, using variable compliance platform um, and uh, having a, a rack and pinion platform to insert the push the finger into the, uh, the variable compliance platform. And we developed a similar device, uh, you then replacing the variable compliance platform with a set of springs to give more or less the similar effect of varying the hardness of the platform. Uh, with a very simple uh, mechanical device. We also um, explored this, um, the, how, how users perceive the hardness through a number of trials, and comparing the actual uh, pressure sensor force between the finger and the, and, and the platform um, with uh, different softness and actual uh, impression of the users of what is the hard and what is soft. Finally, the sensorless force sensing, uh, we uh, have uh, explored the relationship between motor current and tool tissue interaction force. Um, and we um, grasp force we estimated uh, from driving the motors of the two independent jaws based on motor currents. This neural network maps the ground truth force sensors and the motor current values. So the classifier relies on uh, time series data. So we, we look at we took also as input velocity and position of the grasper, um, as well as um, uh, motor currents. Um, and we had uh, the actual grasping force as the output. So our classifier was found to be about 90% accurate when we compared the measured force and the predicted force for the left and right jaw. So we have uh, furthering studies in uh, smart search uh, to uh, include smart classes, active constraints, and to integrate haptic feedback in the final set of trials. 
and also beyond smart search project looking at integration of partial autonomy with teleoperation implementation of 5g and recovering from a human robotic and environment faults in order to create safe and resilient hri toolbox uh, for surgical robotics thank you very much for your um, for your attention Paulo, you're muted. You're perfectly right, I'm muted. Uh, so we are a few minutes ahead of time. We can collect questions for Sana when she is available again, but uh, uh, we will forward the question to her, but of course it will not be uh, like if she reply on, on, uh, in real time. So I guess we move to the second break at this point. And, uh, I give the, the screen and the floor to Farouk for handling this uh, part of the, of the workshop. Thank you so much. Uh, so it was an amazing series of talk. Thanks uh, to all the speakers and uh, to also everyone who participated in voting for the posters. We have two minutes uh, to close the poster decision. So uh, at this time, I would like to ask uh, everyone who hasn't voted uh, to vote and uh, very soon we are going to uh, finish the uh, the poll uh, so i would like to also uh, uh, thank the sponsor of this uh, uh, of, of this workshop uh, which is journal of advanced intelligence systems uh, by wiley we have uh, actually a uh, uh, a representative of the uh, of the of the journal, which is uh, uh, Dr. Babak Mustaqashi, and uh, he's gonna give us a presentation about uh, their their mission and vision. So, uh, so I'm gonna wait one more minute, and then I'm gonna share my screen, announce the winner, and then I will uh, invite Babak to start his uh, presentation during the break. Okay, so yes. Okay, so I think we are ready to announce the, the winner of the poster competition. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So I would like to thank all the uh, poster presenter and people who contributed to uh, the workshop by sending us the poster, it was amazing set of uh, work and uh, very uh, impactful and uh, in the area of robotics for COVID-19. So uh, in the voting website, we ask the audience to vote based on the intellectual merit and the broader impact. And in the intellectual merit, we ask to consider the innovation and uh, uh, the translational power of the system for uh, the, the clinical practice for broader impact. We also ask them to think about the translational for industrial uh, impact. So uh, with, with that said, I would like to announce the winner now. So the winner of uh, our workshop uh, is, uh, the winners are poster one and poster three. And uh, you see the title of the, posters. Uh, the poster one is telerobotic operation for ICU ventilators, and uh, which is a collaboration between Johns Hopkins University and University of Maryland. And poster three is uh, addressing the COVID-19 healthcare needs by teleoperated robot, robot assisted intervention. And that is from Concordia University in Canada. So uh, thanks to all the uh, 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 poster presenters and congratulations to the uh, first place holder and second place holder. So uh, with that said, I would like to ask uh, our sponsor to uh, share the screen and start uh, 
their presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Uh, thank you very much, Farro. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we do see your screen. It's not in the present. Yeah, it's not full screen. Okay. So oh, I good. guess no, it's full screen. Yeah. Yes, perfectly fine. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present our journals to this community. And uh, first of all, congratulations to the winners of the Poster Prize competition. Well deserved. Uh, first of all, my name is Babak Mustavasi. I'm uh, editor of uh, a number of uh, a number of journals at Wiley, including Advanced Materials and Advanced Intelligence Systems. So uh, you may uh, already then know the uh, John Wiley and Sons. It's one of the biggest scholarly publishers in the world. Uh, we publish almost 1,700 journals. Uh, the company has several offices or along the globe, including uh, the headquarters, uh, which are in Hoboken in the USA. And also, uh, for instance, I'm working in an editorial office in Weinheim, Germany. So the main sponsor of the, this event is Advanced Intelligence Systems. Uh, the journal is part of a bigger family. Uh, it's quite reputed. In, we call it uh, advanced family of journals. The, the journals are quite reputed in material science, chemistry, and physics communities. The top journal is Advanced Materials, and probably you know that it's one of the most prestigious journals in natural uh, sciences fields. But in the last few years, uh, we've expanded the scope of our journals into new fields. Uh, here in this picture, you can see some of our sister journals, and as you can see, there are also some journals whose scope go beyond material science, for instance, advanced science or advanced theory and simulations. So advanced intelligence systems is one of our youngest journals. Its scope covers topics uh, related to intelligence systems, including artificial intelligence and machine learning, robotics, automation and control, quantum computing, neuromorphic engineering, and so on. So the journal uh, enjoys uh, using uh, an in-house editorial system, meaning that all of the editors are employees of uh, Wiley. And in order to be in contact with our global readership or global authorship, we have editors in different countries or different continents. So uh, the journal uh, gets support from a very top uh, international advisory board. And again, uh, although the journal is very young, in fact, we've recently celebrated the second anniversary of the journal, but still, we've planned or published several interesting, invited only special issues on topics like soft robotics, space robotics, uh, haptics, and so on. One interesting feature of the journal is our recent collaboration with Autoria, which uh, enables authors to publish smart and interactive uh, content alongside their papers. And by uh, interactive content, I mean data-driven figures, uh, executable computer codes, Jupyter notebooks, 3D models, and so on. And uh, as a matter of fact, I received this news just a few hours back that the journal is no, uh, the journal got indexed in uh, Clarivate Web of Science database. So the, now we have part of the Clarivate database as well. So the journal is indexed for the time being. We always try to enhance the visibility of the papers published in the journal. So uh, there's an editor's choice uh, virtual issue, uh, which uh, showcase the best papers published in the journal. And of course, the papers uh, that are selected for this virtual issue, they are just getting highlighted also on Wiley's social media channels. And for each issue of the journal, we normally create a video that also includes the best papers published in that issue. As I mentioned earlier, we have also these papers. Uh, with, uh, we have these papers with supporting, uh, with smart supporting information, and uh, they are also getting highlighted both on Wiley Online Library and on a collection on Autorial's website. So this is also uh, two times more uh, visibility for this type of papers. Before concluding my talk, I would like to draw your attention also to another uh, robotics-related journal published by Wiley, that is Journal of Field Robotics. And the journal has been out there for some decades, I guess. So, uh, and it's quite well known for the, in the community. So I, 
uh, I would suggest you, if you are interested, just uh, refer to the journal's homepage. With this, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much again to the organizers and thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please just send me an email or just refer, uh, send me to, uh, a message through our, our Twitter channel. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you all back. And uh, once again, congratulations to the winners of the competition and also thanks our sponsor uh, for supporting the workshop. It's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have you. And uh, so I would like to uh, announce that now we have, uh, I think, uh, 13 minutes. So uh, you, I, I would suggest to have a break now and uh, to have some rest. And we'll, we'll be back sharp at 12.20 uh, uh, p.m. Eastern time. And we start uh, uh, the, the second half of the, uh, of the workshop. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your break. See you soon.
Okay, so hello everyone. We are about to resume our, the second half of our, of our workshop. 
in one minute. Okay, I think we can start now. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you Professor Mahdi Tabakoli uh, from University of Alberta, who's also one of the co-organizers of this workshop. The title of this talk is uh, Distancing Aware Delivery of Healthcare Using Robotics and AI. So um, Dr. Tabakoli, please start the presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Farrokh. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. It's my pleasure. So I'd like to talk to you about um, uh, distancing aware delivery of healthcare using robotics and AI. So I'm going to kind of make a little bit of distinction between what we know as telehealth and this idea that I want to introduce as distancing aware delivery of healthcare and also the idea of hospital at home. So, uh, you know, the reason for, one big reason for uh, doing, um, you know, uh, medical robotics has been just the aging of population. So for instance, as you heard this week, China just changed the policy of, you know, the number of kids that people can have, two, three uh, families can have. And this was after the prediction that by the end of the current century, the number of um, the population of China would drop from 1.4 billion to 730 million uh, at the current rate of birth. So 2020 was the first uh, year in recorded history where the number of people over age 65 uh, became bigger than the number of uh, people under age five. And as you see, this gap will grow. Different countries will have this problem. Uh, it's just the severity and the timing of it is different for different countries. So this was the uh, you know, reason we were working on medical robotics. And then COVID hit. And COVID really uh, put these uh, already overburdened healthcare systems to their limits, took, took them to their limits. So, you know, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we all started thinking about how robotics and wearables could help with alleviating the burden on healthcare systems and healthcare workers. So, you know, some of the uh, ways all of us thought about it was reducing contact times between patients and uh, frontline health workers by using telerobotic systems, for instance, that could uh, enable remote patient evaluation, monitoring, and intervention, uh, or just reducing the uh, risk of cross-infection between uh, frontline health workers by allowing for some sort of physical distancing between them, by reducing the need for PPEs, as for instance, Alex um, talked about, uh, Axel talked about, I'm sorry, and then uh, helping people in isolation using um, social robots. So we published a number of papers uh, related to uh, in, in during the COVID uh, crisis, including this paper that came out very early on. And there we talked about um, the different modality of robotic systems, different modalities of physical human robot interaction, as you see here, and how they can cater to various sections of the spectrum of care as far as primary care, acute and emergency care, long-term care and out outpatient care, and even medical education is concerned. So if you're interested, please read this paper. What I'm going to focus now is two of these, telerobotic systems, which, as you know, mostly cater to telehealth solutions. And I'm going to introduce how co-manipulated or collaborative robots can be useful for what I call distancing aware healthcare and also this idea of hospital at home. So that's going to be the focus of my presentation. These two modalities of physical human robot interaction and how those can help combat COVID. So this is the outline of my, my talk. We can talk about you know, telerobotic systems for either remote materials handling or remote delivery of healthcare services. So basically this is when you have a patient and you have, let's say a clinician and there is a teleoperation system. And as far as the risk of uh, COVID cross infection is concerned, that distance is infinity, even if the distance is between two rooms or two buildings, just the risk of cross infection of COVID goes away because of having a teleoperation system. You can have a system that is distancing aware, meaning the distance between the clinician and the patient can decrease to two meters, but with PPE, that's a safe distance. Uh, and if the distance goes less than two meters, there is the possibility for the clinician to step out and go into the background and take distance. And the third modality that I'd like to talk to you about is hospital at home. Just take the hospital to the home of the patient to make the risk of cross infection zero because the patient will be just alone at home receiving all health healthcare. 
So let me just show you a bunch of movies about this. Of course, I'll, there's no time to go into details. So as far as remote materials handling is concerned, you know, the goal is to protect health, uh, frontline uh, healthcare staff by reducing the need for presence of them in hazardous environments, such as ICUs, as it was discussed earlier today. You could use a fixed space manipulator as shown on the left-hand side, or a wheeled mobile manipulator for pick and place or pick, carry and place uh, tasks. You could use it for remote inf infection by uh, connecting a UV light at the end effector, uh, for remote delivery of healthcare material, and for things like remote swap sampling. When it comes to telehealth and using telerobotic systems for remote delivery of healthcare, I'm going to talk about two uh, kind of uh, case studies uh, that we have done actually before COVID, but they just found use during COVID. Uh, so one is sonography and rehabilitation. I'll repeat these two later. So as far as sonography, you know, um, during COVID, it's very important for people who have these uh, background conditions, such as heart conditions, to be able to continue to receive their health because of the uh, increased uh, risk to still receive healthcare. So how can you perform an ultrasound image on a patient, a heart patient, let's say, who is either COVID suspect or COVID positive when there were not enough you know, test kits, when there was no vaccine and th there was all this stress on medical staff when they needed to be close to a patient for 15 minutes to take a, an echocardiogram? Well, the basic idea is just use a teleoperation system to remotely perform uh, ultrasound scanning. And of course, because of haptic feedback, you can control the amount of pressure the probe applies on the patient's body to get good image quality. So this was the uh, main idea. Now, one issue is that the patient's body moves up and down, for instance, for because of respiration. And how can you then compensate for that? It's very difficult for the user to compensate. Well, you can use uh, these uh, impedance control architectures. And Professor Hogan is here who started this idea. Uh, for instance, uh, if the user interface moves uh, a, a smooth trajectory, it's possible for the remote robot holding the ultrasound probe to follow this trajectory while, while also complying with the organ motion. And this is what you see here. So even though uh, the, this, this simulated patient's body in, is moving back and forth, the hand of the sonographer, simulated sonographer, is steady and just focused on lateral scanning. The normal motion of the probe and controlling that pressure is delegated to the machine, kind of semi-autonomy, and the machine takes care of motion compensation. So that you always have good contact, you always get good images through a distance, and even if there is time delay. Let's look at rehabilitation. So, you know, the goal here is to extend the reach of physiotherapists. Uh, and enable them to physically interact with patients who are possibly located at home or in uh, rural communities or indigenous communities, for instance, in Canada. So as you know, uh, and Professor Hogan mentioned this, post-stroke rehab requires repetitive exercises, and these are actually very tough for physiotherapists to perform uh, just because of the physical demand. And just look at the distance between the physiotherapist and the patient. This could not happen during COVID and was stopped. Robots have been used and they are great. Uh, you know, they, they... I, I apologize, uh, I apologize. Robots were used and they are great. Uh, the only thing is that they may bypass the therapist and there is no way to keep the therapist in, in loop. So what we tried to do was to combine the therapist skill and the capability of robotic systems to provide ter therapies in loop uh, telerobotic rehabilitation, basically give one robot to the patient, one robot to the physiotherapist. These are haptically linked and they can be at any uh, different location. And this is the work that we did with uh, Rajni Patel and Farrokh here. So this is basically these two robotic systems can be uh, at any distance with respect to each other. They are only connected through internet. And then you can have assistive or resistive rehabilitation by having the therapist and the patient engage in this uh, computer game together. So now I'd like to talk about this idea of distancing aware healthcare. So keeping six feet distance. So the goal here is to minimize contact times between patients and frontline health workers with lower complexity systems than teleoperation systems. Can we use one robot instead of, instead of two robots and have a co-manipulated system with lower complexity? Let's just look at the uh, same task of ultrasound scanning. So here what you see is a system where the physiotherapist is allowed to move the probe 
laterally on the patient's body and then leave it. And the robot takes care of holding the probe and controlling the pressure appropriately to get good image quality based on real-time feedback of image assessment that's done by a neuron network. So in, in this case, the physiotherapist is able to kind of position the probe and then a step back into, this, into a safe distance so that images can be collected over, let's say, 10 minutes. Can we go even lower complexity than this? What we have done here, and this was presented this year at ICRA, is a fully manual mechanical, the safe, uh, intrinsically safe, uh, and kind of gravity balanced uh, device with force feedback and an end effector compliance for doing a range of tasks such as ultrasound scanning, or even tasks that are required in ICU, like oxygenation and incubation from a six feet distance. So this is a completely mechanical device and you just allow a little bit of distance between the physiotherapist uh, or the sonographer in this case, and the patient uh, allowing for uh, kind of uh, doing the task um, mechanically under, under uh, human power. So here, you know, the six feet distance is, is still observed. Let me go back to the goal of rehabilitation. So is it possible to use a co-manipulated system and have the therapist approach the patient for a short amount of time and then a step back? So create a temporal uh, gap between when the robot is working and when the therapist is teaching the robot what it needs to do. This is what we have done using machine learning and kind of learning from demonstration to uh, enable semi-autonomous patient-specific robotic intervention so that a physi physiotherapist can, uh, can get close to the patient, teach a robot what action it needs to take for this patient, and then the robot learns that action and repeats it in future iterations of the task so, such that the patient can receive a higher dose of physiotherapy without needing to have the physiotherapist close. So the patient here at the top right is engaging in an activity of daily living exercise, that can't do completely, a physiotherapist approaches for a short amount of time and teaches the robot what the ideal task is. The robot has watched that assistance and then provides it automatically in next iterations of the task so that the patient can continue. Here on the um, bottom right, you have a patient who wants to do third meal uh, uh, you know, walking exercises, uh, but can't do so because of you know, the left toe uh, not getting clear. We have a pulley system attached to a robot. A physiotherapist teaches the robot at what point of the gait cycle the left, hand, uh, left side of the patient's body must be lifted to clear the, the left toe. Uh, without knowing any model for the system, the robotic system kind of learns that behavior and repeats it in future iterations of tasks just based on data. And this is for the same idea of co-manipulated uh, and kind of distancing aware, creating temporal gap between the uh, presence of a helper and the patient. So as you see on the left-hand side, the robot is taught in a hands-on and kinesthetic way what it needs to do for the patient. And then that is uh, repeated in, in the absence of helper in next iterations of the task. Children were significantly affected. Children with disability, especially, they were all sent homes. So children with disability require opportunities for playful activities, and they need to be successful so that they are encouraged to uh, play that game in future you know, and, and, and engage with other children. So how can a child with, let's say, hand tremor engage in this hot wire game and be successful? Well, you can have a helper come and teach a robot how to help this child. Of course, everything is simulated here. So you have a child who can't do this 2D version of the hot wire game because of hand tremors. And then you engage a helper who comes and uh, gets close to this child for a short duration of time, maybe a sibling, maybe a parent, maybe a friend, and shows the robotic system what sort of assistance this person requires. And then in future iterations, the robotic system uh, autonomously provides that assistance. And this is uh, on the right hand side, it's the same. It's a person with disability. And uh, we don't have the image of the game, but if you have looked at her, at her face, she's having much easier time now uh, after assistance is provided because the robot is providing that assistance. You could combine this, this is distancing aware care with telehealth if you're interested, so that uh, you know a, a person, a physiotherapist, for instance, engages telerobotically in the performance of a du uh, dual user task and then uh, steps back 
uh, either pays attention to another patient or steps into the background so that the patient can continue with the same um, task for uh, in future iterations. And so these are kind of uh, several videos of how this is done. So in the interest of time, I'll just skip and go uh, forward. The last idea that I have is this idea of hospital at home. So one uh, way is basically to just harness the power of visual haptic simulators to artificially recreate environments for assessment and rehabilitation while physically distancing. So for instance, you can have a haptic visual simulator for rehabilitation. Left-hand side is a 2D case and right-hand side is a 3D case of projection mapping augmented reality plus haptic feedback so that the patient can engage in fun and uh, useful uh, rehabilitation exercises uh, without the need for any physiotherapist being close by or the physiotherapist can get close, teach the robot something and then leave and the robot learns that assistance as I showed before and reproduces this in the, in the future. You could do the same for people who were injured in the performance of their work. Uh, so basically for functional capacity evaluation and work injury rehabilitation, you have built again a system uh, comprised of a robot, an augmented reality display and a computer game engine to do what a flight simulator does for a pilot, recreate the dynamics of a task haptically and also recreate the visualization of what you see out of the cockpit. So here, if the 3D view is on, this person would see a wall being painted with this roller at the tip of this end effector and also would feel that wall. So you have an environment for physical uh, task or workplace task uh, uh, simulation. And the final thing that you can do for hospitals at home is providing independent living assistance so that, for instance, what happened to seniors in long-term care homes during COVID where they were in Canada, they were some were left home and died out of thirst and, and dehydration. Doesn't happen in the future. So this is a system that we have developed uh, comprised of a robotic arm attached to a wheel mobile manipulator that can help patients with uh, a stand, uh, sit to a stand, walking and not falling, guiding the patient, and also stand to sit in a personalizable way. So again, the ideas of learning from demonstration so that the robot learns the impedance it needs to demonstrate to best assist a patient. So uh, finally, just wanna say that, you know, uh, robotic systems can provide, of course, support for patients, healthcare workers, and the healthcare system. And especially they can use, uh, be used to reduce the risk of infectious disease transmission. And three modalities I can think of, and I introduced was telehealth, telemedicine using a telerobotic enabled system, distancing of their healthcare delivery using a co-manipulated co robot, and also using a co-manipulated robot for home care independent and independently. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you, thank you uh, so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Havakoli, it was a uh, great, great talk. And uh, I should also mention that I have had the great pleasure of working with Dr. Tabako on several projects, this workshop being one of many. So uh, uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. So there's a question in the chat box. Uh, is a task that has been taught to the robot exclusive for each patient or it can learn a general treatment? Yeah, it's, it's specific to one patient. And I think that's the power of it. So every time the patient changes or even the patient improves between sessions, uh, I presume you're talking about rehabilitation. Then the physiotherapist can approach the, pa the patient, teach the robot exactly what this patient requires today. And then the robotic system learns that, recreates that behavior, that therapeutic behavior in the in the rest of that session. So you have a one hour session, the physiotherapist spends five minutes and then walks away. And, and uh, next time you teach the robot again, what another patient or the same patient in the next uh, session requires. Okay, perfect. I think we have time for one more question. Any question from the audience? Okay, I think the, the question is... Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, so uh, my question is related to learning from demonstration approach in rehabilitation. So, for example, you are uh, 
teaching few uh, therapeutic uh, motions to the patient. So can such approaches um, be extended to more specialized movements? Say, for example, can you teach a common person to, uh, to play a football like a more specialized player? Is it, is it possible? Like, Um, I'm just thinking. Um, I think the question is uh, answer in, in in the chat box if that's okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so I think that's the uh, end of this talk. So uh, I think uh, Matthew, you wanna take it from here? For sure. So uh, uh, let me just exit. So um, yes, uh, thank you all. And the next presenter is, uh, so it's a joint presentation by Pietro Valdastri uh, and Dr. Onaise Onaise. And um, the title is how robotics can help flexible endoscopy during the time of COVID-19. Onaise, if you have, uh, if you're here, please. Um, Share your screen and stuff. Hi, everyone. Um, so unfortunately, Pietro couldn't be here today. So he did le leave a little introductory video, which I'll start off with before I really dive into the presentation. Uh, please share the computer sound. We can't hear it. You know, as you play share, there is a little checkbox for computer sound sharing. Sorry, I don't see it. <laughs> So just press share again, it just that share uh, button. And yeah. then you share your screen or a window. I see, okay, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to everyone listening and a warm thank to the organizing committee for the opportunity to speak today. I'm Pietro Valdastri from the University of Leeds and today with my colleague Onaisa Onaisa uh, we will discuss how robotics can help flexible endoscopy at the time of COVID-19. But first uh, let me start with a, a brief overview of our uh, activity at the Storm Lab at the University of Leeds. The goal of our research is to leverage robotics to fight cancer. We are active in robotic endoscopy, trying to enable earlier diagnosis of colorectal cancer with robotic colonoscopy platform based on intelligent magnetic manipulation. We try to widen access to upper gastrointestinal endoscopy by designing ultra low cost and intuitive solutions for the inspection of the stomach. We work uh, to improve the outcomes of surgical robotic treatment of cancer by using AI and advanced endoscopic sensing like micro ultrasound and terrace technologies to better identify tumor margins before excision. And uh, um, we try to reach deeper inside the human body by creating novel robotic architectures based on multi-point magnetic manipulation and advanced personalized manufacturing. If you're interested uh, in uh, these technologies, please, please have a look at our uh, uh, website and get in touch with us. And now let me pass the mic to uh, Onaisa that will uh, get into the core of this presentation. Well, it's great to be here today. Um, as Pietro said, my name is Onaiza. I finished my PhD at the University of Toronto in 2019. And since then, I've been a postdoctoral research fellow in the STORM lab. Um, obviously, this is a very relevant 
topic right now. So by now, we all know the devastating impacts of COVID-19. On March 11th, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus a pandemic. Since then, there have been over 167 million cases reported and over 3 million fatalities worldwide. It has been estimated that the actual deaths due to COVID-19 may be twice as high as the reported count. Of course, one of the impacts of COVID-19 will be far-reaching consequences for years and maybe decades to come. It is estimated that in the UK alone, there will be over 2 million access fatalities as a result of a pause in cancer screening and treatment. The study that I've outlined here shows how just a four week delay in treatment leads to a rise in fatalities of the five most common types of cancer. The one that I wanna draw your attention to, of course, is colon cancer because that is relevant to endoscopy. And then on the right, what I've shown is the reduction in operations related to both colorectal cancer and colon cancer. Well, if I may interrupt you for a second, you are in the presenter mode, not full screen mode, if you wanna change it. Oh, thank you. Sure. From the top, there is those uh, menus. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so as I was saying, on the right, you can see the two graphs for colorectal cancer and colon cancer, and there's been a significant decrease in operations during the pandemic. So to understand the impact of COVID-19 on endoscopy, we must first discuss what endoscopy is. So endoscopy is a procedure where organs and tissues inside the body can be imaged and monitored using an endoscope. An endoscope is a thin tube with a light source and camera, and sometimes often has additional tools such as an ultrasound and biopsy forceps. Endoscopy can be used for both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes, such as removing cancerous tissue or just visualization and sampling. So an endoscope can be either rigid or flexible with flexible endoscopes offering a multitude of advantages for navigation to target sites. Endoscopes can be inserted through natural orifices like the mouth or via incisions made in the body. Flexible, endoscope, flexible endoscopy is often used for multiple malignancy diagnosis. Now, of course, there are many different types of endoscopy from bronchoscopy, which monitors the lungs, to cystoscopy, which monitors the bladder. However, for the purposes of this presentation, I will limit my focus to flexible gastrointestinal or GI endoscopy. Now, GI endoscopy can be broken down into two major categories, upper GI processes and lower GI processes. So upper GI processes consist of um, visualizing from the esophagus to the stomach to the small intestine, where the endoscope is inserted from the mouth. And lower GI processes consist of visualizing the rectum and the large bowel, where the endoscope is inserted from the rectum. And of course, colonoscopy is one of the major processes that you've probably all heard of related to this. Now, what are the risks associated with endoscopy. To understand this, you must understand that human to human transmission of COVID-19, as we all know by now, occurs primarily through droplets. Small droplets are known as aerosols. Now aerosols have the potential to remain suspended in air for long periods of time and travel much larger distances. So some endoscopic procedures are considered aerosol generating procedures. The potential generation of aerosols has been associated with gas encephalation. So positive encephalation is a 
process that they use during endoscopy to help visualize the lumen and to create space to move the endoscope forward. But the evidence of aerosol generation during these endoscopic procedures varies, and there's no homogeneity of evidence. Endoscopic procedures such as bronchoscopy have been shown to be aerosol generating with several other patient care and operating room procedures. However, for GI endoscopic procedures, no current evidence exists of aerosol generation, and all of the advice from respective societies around infection control is based on expert opinion. Therefore, a well-designed study is sorely needed to address this knowledge gap in the field and would allow tailored advice for specific endoscopic procedures. Now, because of the COVID-19 guidance, endoscopic procedures were significantly affected during the pandemic. In fact, they were reduced up to 15% in Europe from February to May 2020 during the peak of the pandemic, while in North America, these levels were at 10%. In the UK, it has been estimated that the procedures decreased from 35,000 per week to about 1,700 per week, or about 5% of pre-pandemic capacity. Now, it, it's also been estimated that because of this, avoidable deaths due to this GI, um, stoppage and endoscopy will lead to access deaths of 6,000 in the UK and about 33,000 in the US. As you can see from the graph on the right, um, the number of colonoscopies performed was significantly lower in 2020 compared to 2019. But of course, all of these challenges lead us to the potential for innovation. And here shown is a figure from our paper that we published in Frontiers in Robotics and AI, where you can see that an ideal RFP setup during the pandemic can be super beneficial compared to the standard colonoscopy procedure. For example, you can already see that we could potentially reduce the number of people in the room, set up barriers by having physical distancing and other such topics. So what does the ideal RFE consist of? So the ideal RFE is a teleoperated platform that allows for this physical distancing that I just mentioned between the patient and the healthcare workers. A simple and easy to use robotic platform that will reduce the number of people in the room, a less painful procedure which does not require sedation would also reduce the number of people in the room by not having anesthesiologists in the room. The more intuitive navigation will reduce the training time for future endoscopists and preferably have higher degrees of freedom than current commercial platforms and of course improved control. One other area that can benefit of course is AI systems can be used for improved navigation and localization of endoscopes. And this would reduce the force and torque on luminal walls and of course uh, reduce the sedation requirements because the process would be less painful, which would lead to lower risk and recovery times. And the last point that we want to bring up is that because we are moving to an environment with single use or disposable endoscopes in order to reduce infection control, we want to also consider the environmental impacts and potentially using recyclable materials for future platforms. So what is the current state of RFB? Well, robotic flexible endoscopy, like other robotic um, surg surgery areas, has mainly focused on precision and dexterity and safety of tools. So it's basically allowed healthcare workers to overcome the current limitations of standard or manual endoscopic devices. Of course, there are still challenges around locomotion of endoscopes and instrument control, as well as their applicabil applicability to a wide variety of clinical applications but there is lots of potential to increase safety. But I do want to bring your attention to this one platform, the Navicam, which is used a lot in China for monitoring the stomach. This is a completely untethered wireless capsule tool that the patient ingests and then is used for visualization purposes. 
And then, of course, the advantages of robotic flexible endoscopy go beyond COVID-19. Uh, they were initially, uh, the, the initial advantages were for lowering discomfort for patients so that it can be used in cases where patients are unable to tolerate conventional endoscopy or in cases where sedation is not allowed because of frailty or comorbidity. And, and this would, of course, be achieved by having precise control over the force and torque be beneficial in cases where patients require repeated and regular procedures. So in cases where there's a history of inflammatory bowel disease or hereditary colorectal cancer, and can also improve detection rates as more control and more comfort often means better visibility. Another gap that robotic flexible endoscopy could fill is in cases where conventional endoscopes are unable to complete an examination. So of course, there's a wide variety of platforms available, um, and I won't be discussing all of them due to time limitations, but there is one being developed in the STORM lab that is um, going through regulatory processes for human trials. And if you're interested, feel free to look up this paper in Nature Machine Intelligence. So challenges for RFE development remain, and one of those main challenges is how to feed and maneuver the flexible endoscope. Challenges related to potential aerosol generation through the working channel, and of course, sensing and control challenges still persist with vision feedback largely employed. But that can also be challenging for lower GI processes where, for example, stool can get in the way of the cameras. Now, as I mentioned, there is currently a lack of evidence around aerosol generation during GI endoscopy processes, but some studies are being done. So this is a study that was done in the UK in Nottingham that is available as a preprint online. And they basically tracked particle counts or particles generated during upper GI and lower GI processes. They went a little bit further as well. And tracked um, for specific events during the uh, endoscopy procedure as well. So for example, during extubation or if the patient is coughing. So finally, RFE procedures have the potential to be completed with increased speed and without sedation, leading to fewer complications, shorter recovery time, and of course, freeing up space in the endoscopy suite at a crucial time where endoscopy capacity has still not recovered to pre-pandemic levels. The ideal RFE during COVID-19 would combine teleoperation, single-use endoscopes, and mechanical barriers or seals that can be implemented due to the physical distancing allowed between patients and healthcare workers due to robotic platforms. A mobile device would be extremely useful at a time when the endoscopy suite capacity is limited to make space for COVID-19 patients. And of course, if we've learned anything from this pandemic, even with the hope of a successful vaccine rollout, we hope that healthcare technologies should be resilient to pandemics in general. And then finally, before I wrap up, I just want to thank our clinical collaborators, Venkat Sabramarian, Alberto Arezzo, Keith Opstein, Connor Winters, David Jane, the whole team here at the STORM lab that is working hard at developing these technologies, all of the funding sources without which this research would not be possible. And of course, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much, Onaisa. It was a great presentation. Um, we have time for one question. Onaisa, I remember the work your group has done on low cost colonoscopes for developing countries where you know, using some syringes, I think you can control things remotely. So, so that's actually one, um, application, but COVID just presented one application for that because you need these single use endoscopes uh, or low cost endoscopes that you can actually use in um, not so rich countries. Um, we have time for one question if anyone. If not, that's all good. Uh, uh, questions can be asked in the chat box still, and then we are, are going to also have the round table. So thank you again, Onaiza. And uh, this is a good time now to move to the next talk, which is going to be given by Jessica Bergner-Kars and Hallie Siegel.
uh, from University of Toronto. And the title of the talk is The Challenge of Bottom-Up versus Top-Down Research in Light of a Global Pandemic. Hallie, please, um, as Paula said, the screen is yours. Great, are you able to hear me and see the slide? Yes, yes. Fantastic. I'm just going to, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna let Jessica start. You will just have to share the computer sound. It's very faint right now. I'm sorry, I'm... So if you, when you share the screen, there's a little box for sharing the computer sound as well. So that... Oh gosh, I'm so sorry, I, I made the same mistake. Yeah, one second, okay, <laughs> one second. a common mistake, isn't it? That's all right. There we go. One second. Presenter view. Slideshow. There we go. Me to this workshop. I'm really excited to be there in a minute. Um, Murphy's Law hit. So as you are seeing this recording, I'm still busy with another workshop. So I did a pre-recording and I'm going to join you in a few minutes, hopefully. When COVID hit uh, last year in Canada, it arrived around March. Um, we were all, I guess, all roboticists worldwide were reminded of Fukushima, of that unprecedented thing happening. And everybody keeps coming to you and looking at you, asking you, well, where are your robots? Why aren't your robots helping with this? At the same time, the headlines seem to be full of these stories very early on in the pandemic about robots helping with fighting it. Not so much in Canada, though. So at this early um, time, we didn't see much happening. When we see this COVID fighting robot going to church in Ontario as an outlier, then us roboticists at the U of T Robotics Institute were pretty much wondering um, about all this and felt that we needed to explain to university stakeholders why academic researchers may actually not be the best recipient for emergency R&D funding if it comes to getting these robots actually helped with the pandemic. We also felt that we needed to help potential end users distinguish between this early stage robotics experiments that they may be seeing in our labs and robots that are actually ready for real world deployment. We were also curious as we wanted to understand how robots get put into service during a pandemic and identify common success factors in COVID related robot deployments. And lastly, we wanted to assess the robotics industry in Canada and worldwide for its capacity to deliver reliable and robust solutions that meet the needs of Canadian institutions during COVID and any other institutions and provide advice to stakeholders on how to better leverage uh, robotics uh, in future crises. And this curiosity and this motivation led us to write a white paper on making sense of the robotized pandemic response. Uh, the white paper got published in September 2020 on archive, uh, free for access uh, to every one of you from our website. It's 114 pages, so I felt today's workshop is the perfect location to um, highlight some of the main findings that we did. And as I can't do it personally yet, um, no one is better suited um, to deliver this main message than our Associate Director of Strategy and Operations, Helly Siegel. She's the corresponding author on this white paper and helped us uh, putting all this together quite a bit. So Helly, take it away. So first of all, thank you so much everyone for the invitation to speak today. Uh, towards our goal of evaluating the robots mentioned in all the headlines that Jessica just showed you, we actually interviewed dozens of potential end users and industry experts and collectively analyzed over 70 robot systems. And we organized these into seven uh, pandemic use case categories. And our aim wasn't really to be exhaustive and include everything, but really to present a range of the types of jobs that robots were doing in each category and organize these by maturity. So since our goal wasn't to document everything and all the ways that robots could help us through a pandemic, but instead to look at what is realistically helpful now, uh, we needed to look beyond just the maturity of the robot and examine things like regulatory compliance and demand and availability. And so uh, our guiding principles in scoping the white paper were, first of all, frontline and essential services applications. Secondly, physically embodied robots, not software robots. 
and three, capacity to scale, which we're going to explore a little more deeply in the presentation. Now, we overlaid this scoping criteria against a feasibility, desirability, viability model, uh, which helped us to identify a series of questions to guide our analysis. For example, uh, from a desirability perspective, what are the pressing unmet needs during a pandemic where robots can be of service? And here we looked at the obvious frontline use cases like disinfection and diagnostics, but also essential services that would be needed to keep the economy going, like delivery and gross food manufacturing. Um, from a viability perspective, we were looking at the capacity of industry to, to deliver robots at scale, for example, supply chains and servicing and regulatory compliance. Um, and considering how tough it was to procure anything at the beginning of the pandemic, you can remember the challenges of ordering PPE and vaccines and even toilet paper at the beginning. Uh, we also asked, is the robot ready, uh, already produced locally? And if not, how easy would it be to procure and service from abroad? Uh, we also asked, do end users have the capacity to absorb the technology? And this was really important because robots were not already in widespread use in hospitals and public settings before the pandemic. And we know from Robin Murphy and her colleagues who study disaster robots that it's really hard for frontline workers to onboard new technology and new workflows in a crisis. Next, we asked, how high is the technology readiness level? Um, and we noticed, for example, that robots were being repurposed and trialed for new tasks that they weren't actually originally designed and tested for. Um, you can recall the image of a spot robot being used to do remote triage outside a hospital, or even the stories of drones being used for PPE compliance and crowd monitoring. And these were being deployed without people really understanding their effectiveness, safety, or even ethical consequences. So we asked ourselves, how ready are these systems given the high stakes of the pandemic? How do we know if they're useful, cost-effective, and safe? And yet, the, given the challenges of procuring and onboarding technology in a hurry, we also had to ask what is feasible now and what could be rapidly repurposed or developed safely. Now, as a starting point for the analysis, we use the standard technology ready, uh, readiness level scale, uh, which you're probably familiar with, and found that a lot of the use cases we were seeing during COVID were in the sort of seven, eight, nine range. And um, obviously, that meant some of them weren't yet proven. And having spoken with a number of industry experts, we also came to the conclusion that the TRL levels really don't consider market factors like customer interest and readiness and supply chains and investment. And so we ultimately concluded that TRL levels alone can't be used to measure whether a robot is ready for widespread adoption during a pandemic. Now, of course, in academia, we mostly focus on developing experimental platforms and demonstrators with mid to long term development horizons. And many of the robots we imagine could be helpful in a health crisis like this multi purpose nursing assistant have been motivated by previous outbreaks like Ebola and are still actually years away. And now sample collection is one use case uh, that seems to be driving the development of some of the newer platforms and robot designs we're seeing now. And this isn't really that surprising since the most widespread pandemic, the Spanish flu occurred in the 1920s before the first robots were invented. Now, in a crisis, emergency and frontline workers really don't care about um, experimental robots. If anything, they're only interested in the systems at the very center of the Venn diagram, uh, the ones that they have the training and capacity to deploy right away. This means we're looking at commercially available, clinically tested robots that were designed for pandemic use cases and on which hospital staff are trained. So an example of that uh, in some cases would be the UV disinfection robot by Blue Ocean that some hospitals were able to take advantage of. Um, but we're really considering whether, when we're considering whether to deploy, we have to remember it's not just the product that has to be ready. The whole hospital system has to be ready too, and that's really not the case everywhere. Uh, McGill University Health Center was the first in Canada to import a disinfection robot. Um, and given the relatively high cost of the robot, McGill is testing its safety and effectiveness against existing disinfection technologies currently used in Canadian hospitals before a decision is going to be made on whether to purchase more. 
Um, another deploying example is from Dr. Ivor Mendez at the University of Saskatchewan, who is using this fleet of commercially available Vita telepresence robots to deliver remote health care in rural communities during COVID. Um, right now, Saskatchewan is actually a COVID hotspot and has the third highest per capita rate of infection here in Canada. Uh, because Dr. Mendez and his team have been trialing their fleet for five years before COVID, they were able to deploy their robots immediately when the pandemic first struck. And he reports now that he's actually served over 1,200 remote patients from 16 communities since the start of the pandemic. Now, since the VITA system works on a monthly service model, the upfront costs are low and it's pretty easy for them to scale their activities. They just added five new robots to their fleet and have ordered six more. Um, they're also building on that success and have deployed a telerobotic ultrasound system to remote indigenous community that ex uh, was experiencing a major outbreak this summer. Um, they, the system has served more than 30 women in need of prenatal ultrasound who could not have traveled the 600 kilometers to uh, an ultrasound clinic during the outbreak. Um, like the fleet of telepresence robots, it had already been tested and trialed in northern communities for three years. So as a result, the healthcare team was already in place. They had prior experience working with community healthcare workers, and this made collaboration and rapid development uh, during the outbreak actually possible. And so Dr. Mendez says these demonstrations really show that uh, this type of um, uh, care is, is, is possible to go mainstream in the near future. Now, if a commercially ready system doesn't exist, or it can't be procured due to cost or lack of availability, how do we get almost ready systems rapidly developed and deployed? Um, if a robot is going to be useful during the crisis, we're talking about months of development, not years. And since robot development can be long and pretty costly, at least compared to software solutions, we also have to consider the potential for post-pandemic demand. Otherwise, the technology that people invest in developing now risks becoming irrelevant after the pandemic. It's for these reasons, it's the overlapping areas down here at the bottom of the Venn diagram, I think that offers some great lessons for us during the pandemic. And here we're going to describe the transfer approach, which takes a commercially ready robot into a new pandemic application and a robotized approach, which augments an existing pandemic solution with proven autonomous capabilities. Now, the most promising and rapidly developed examples of robotize and transfer are, in fact, a partnership between two mature technologies. And a great example of this is the partnership between Auto Motors, which is a division of ClearPath Robotics, and Prescientex, which is an established provider of UV disinfection solutions. Now, before the pandemic, Canada actually had no homegrown disinfection robot, and importing a solution to Canada, as we saw during a pandemic, was looking to be costly and difficult. Uh, so, in response, um, our Canadian government's NGEN Supercluster program launched a $10 million challenge to fund the rapid development of an autonomous disinfection robot, and five projects were awarded in total. Um, the example I'm showing you here is notable for the fact that both companies already had mature products. They also had a pre-existing customer base who were, were familiar with the respective technology and who could potentially serve as lead users during testing. And as a result, the development team was able to deploy a product in just six months, which is pretty amazing. Um, Violet, the finished product, is a fully autonomous mobile robot that can self-charge and navigate close to walls and furniture. And it's smart enough to turn off its UV lights when it approaches humans, which is important for safety. And a really big win for Prescientex is that auto, uh, the auto platform was simple enough and mature enough to use that they didn't actually need to build their own in-house expertise in autonomy. And this made for the much faster development timeline. And of course, a big win for Canada is that we now have our own homegrown autonomous UV disinfection capability, which we didn't have before. But there are challenges to making this a viable product in the long run. First, there's no sales pipeline in place. Um, Auto tells us that uh, they serve the, the logistics and warehouse market, and they're not really known to their clients as a cleaning company. Um, as for Prescientex, their main clients are in healthcare where the demand to operate safely around people who are totally unfamiliar with autonomous technology is greater. So, you know, as the safety of autonomous robots improves, there's probably gonna be more opportunity for uptake in public spacing 
uh, facing spaces, but demand is going to be needed to fuel that R&D investment. And we all know now, despite early interest in UV robots at the start of the pandemic, we, we now know that surface transmission is a lot less important than airborne transmission, and this is making the long-term demand for this product uncertain. Now, having analyzed over 70 robot systems, we wanted to also understand what were the common factors that led to successful deployment in the pandemic. And there are many technological factors that go into a successful robot deployment, as you all know. But two stood out to us as being especially relevant to successful deployment during COVID, um, teleoperation and open APIs. Um, as researchers, you will be familiar with these factors, so I'm not going to spend much time on them here, but suggest that you look at our white paper for some specific examples about how these were put into practice during COVID. Um, instead, I'm going to draw you ten your attention to some of the environmental factors that were most relevant during COVID. The first relates to the physical environment and the creation of robot-friendly features that, uh, that are most helpful to robots, um, especially the ones deployed in the wild. Um, I'm talking about wheelchair-friendly environments with ramps and wider passageways and automatic door sensors. Um, they're conducive to robot mobility and are increasingly required under accessibility laws. Now, beyond the physical uh, environment, uh, the social or cultural environment seems to be just as important for deployment success. Um, our earlier examples showed that in-house expertise and buy-in from leadership played a critical role in robots being successfully deployed during COVID. Finally, we uncovered several uh, systemic factors. And here, uh, I want to point out that robot supply chains really played a critical role. Regions with mature robotics ecosystems that include like developers and component manufacturers and system integrators, they were clearly at an advantage when it came to procuring and adapting robots during COVID, especially at the beginning of the crisis when the global supply chains were interrupted. And underlying the supply chain issue is sustained R&D funding for robotics. Um, we all know here that mature robotic solutions wouldn't exist today if it weren't for investments in early stage research that were made years or even decades ago. Um, sustained robotics R&D funding really does lay the foundation for an industry ecosystem and supply chain that countries can draw on during a crisis. Uh, finally, any rapid or emergency response truly requires multiple stakeholders to coordinate everything from procurement to delivery, regulatory fast tracking, funding, training, all of that. Um, it would seem that the regions with the most ambitious robotics deployments during COVID crisis have robotics industries associations and government programs and um, you know, hospital technology experts that help to pave the way for significant funding and coordination prior to the pandemic. Ultimately, our white paper winds up concluding, although it's not where we started from, that it's this kind of coordination that results in relatively mature robotics ecosystems that are better poised to assist frontline and essential service workers when a pandemic or a crisis strikes. Uh, our analysis covered many examples, both globally and here in Canada, and on reflection, it became quite clear to us that the deployment of robots during COVID is highly dependent on regional conditions. Um, and on that note, Jessica and I would like to end on a couple of questions for you. What was the nature of the COVID-related deployments in your region? And, or to reframe it more in the words of our workshop organizers, what lessons can we learn from the robotized pandemic response as we strategize for future research and ecosystem development? Um, I'd really like to thank all the other speakers who came before, because I think we'll have an interesting discussion a bit later, um, and especially to Maddie, Casper, Farouk, and Paolo for organizing the workshop. Uh, we're really excited for the panel discussion coming up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hadi. Fantastic presentation. Um, um, maybe uh, selfishly, I will ask one question and then we move to the next speaker and leave the rest for the panel discussion. So did you, in your analysis, in your survey, did you notice any disparity between countries in terms of the investment they put into COVID technology, you know, just technology to address yeah. COVID, maybe robotic technology or variables or overall, did you see any, you know, big differences in terms of uh, how they uh, invested in this area? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's tough to answer because, of course, um, 
you'd have to look at every single country out there. But we did uh, notice, um, I, I did do a search to see which countries or regions had programs that seem to be funding emergency robotics related COVID uh, work. And a couple, uh, aside from the program that I uh, mentioned in Canada, uh, also the EU uh, had a COVID uh, robotics program that was launched. I'm sure probably some of the colleagues here are better poised to talk about uh, how that went. Um, and it, I think there were, uh, you know, it's clear that there were programs in other regions as well, but just to reinforce that um, it really seemed to be the regions where there were already um, existing programs. So in Canada, we have our super cluster program for which um, it, robotics isn't necessarily uh, uh, heading in those, but um, it's certainly an important factor in many of our super clusters here and was designed to support that kind of work. EU has EU robotics. Um, and so it seems to be it's where these existing robotics programs were in place that where that emergency funding was um, more easily to to be found. Great, thank you very much. We can continue the discussion in the in the uh, round table. There's also one question for you, but maybe if you could please answer it either in the chat box or keep it for the round table, we could, uh, that would be great. Um, and I'm really impressed that we are keeping so on a schedule. Uh, so the next speaker and the last speaker is Kaspar and the, title of the presentation is Low Cost Soft and Continuum Healthcare Robots During the COVID Pandemic. Kaspar, please take it away. Hi, I hope you can hear me and you can see my screen. It's all good. Uh, we just see you, we don't see your screen. You don't see my screen yet because maybe I have to confirm. Just a sec, yeah, share. Does that help? That's all good. Okay, good, okay. Good, yeah, so thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk um, this um, afternoon, uh, afternoon for me. Um, and um, yeah, great to be here. I think it's a very nice um, workshop. And also, I mean, I've seen many, many different um, presentations, quite a, quite a range of things happening. Um, so yeah, I'm from the Center for Advanced Robotics at Queen Mary and uh, in my presentation, um, which is part of, of our uh, workshop, I want to talk about um, yeah, low cost, soft and continuum healthcare robots during the COVID pandemic. My name is Kaspar Altöper, as you probably already know. And it was uh, actually quite difficult for me to make a decision on what to talk about. And really I wanted to, to, to I mean, find something that, that fits the, you know, title here of, of the, um, the workshop we have. And um, so, yeah, I, I will present on, on a particular topic, but before I go there, I would like to just shortly mention some other activities um, that were happening at Queen Mary University of London or QMUL. So as um, at the, right at the beginning of the, um, of the crisis, so uh, maybe April or so, um, 2020, we were approached by our colleagues from dentistry um, who had to go to the hospital every day, of course, and continue doing um, procedures on patients and um, you know, doing drilling and other things in the mouth and aerosols you know, easily coming out of there and being spread through, through space. And they required something very simple like a, a visor. And um, I don't know, they had 10 visors, you know, I mean, effectively nothing in the hospital. And there was really that need to, to develop that. And they had some specifications. And so we, we made a design for that. And you can see it here, I'm, I'm presenting it there. And um, we were actually able to turn this around also very quickly. So within a few months, um, we had the, um, the certification and also we were producing um, at home ourselves. So these are printed uh, on my 3D printer, which I have at home. And, um, and, and then we also, of course, involved uh, other companies to produce those. But to get it started, you know, that was done through, through actually you know, bringing people together and printing at home. And we got even a, a mention 
in the um, IEEE spectrum. And uh, we have a, another project which um, has started recently where we are looking into um, creating personalized face masks or more, more specifically to try to create adapters that could sit on existing face masks uh, and improve the fit. Now, so the, the face mask material is usually quite good, but there is a, a little gap usually between the face mask and the face. And so to have something that um, has the shape of your face would increase that fit and um, make it really you know, airtight uh, along the edges. So that's something we're working on. But let me come now to, to the, you know, the focus of my uh, presentation today. And um, as I said, I was really thinking about what to focus on. And there, there is one, one particular project actually that we were working on, and it is very much related to um, robotics for, um, yeah, for this particular period. And the focus here is on intubation. So the idea is now to create an intubation system that can be, um, yeah, can be used in a kind of remote fashion to um, support doctors when they have to uh, intubate so that they can keep a distance um, from, the, from the patient. Now, I was, at first I was a bit reluctant to present that. Um, it is a, uh, a master project, actually a group project. So three um, master students working on that project, you know, George, Maroa and Shabini. So what I'm doing here is I'm really presenting their work. So I was a bit, bit reluctant at first, but on the other hand, I think it, um, it was a good exercise. And it also shows um, that, you know, I, th I think we need to, to look at uh, different avenues if we want to create something very quickly and, and, and to respond to a, you know, to a crisis situation. And uh, this particular project is also interesting from another point of view because it is supported by a medical company. So these are Smith Medical. They are actually producing intubation systems and they actually saw the, or have an interest in creating something that could be used in a situation like that and um, you know, create a separation between the patient and the, the clinician. So in this project, the, the student um, explored the idea and uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the target was, the aim was to, to develop something that would actually robotize the, this um, intubation process with the, the main focus really on keeping the distance larger between the patient and the, um, the clinician, as we have seen already in other presentations. So minimize the contact between patient and clinician, uh, but also um, as an extra um, effect or extra outcome to increase the success rate. Uh, so automating certain elements of the procedure to be able to do it more quickly and so to have to be able to process more patients over time. And also very important to reduce the stress and the fear on the clinician and, and other medical staff because that is also uh, an element I think one should keep in mind. So um, the, the students went through, um, through a literature review and looked at different approaches that have been taken. One of them is to use the Da Vinci robot. And um, that was recognized as being a bit of an overkill to use a you know, 1.5 million pound machine to do intubation. It has been tried, I think it works, but uh, even, even with such a system, we don't get you know, a uh, straightforward, easy intubation as a, as a result. And so um, they looked around and found that there are other um, systems being developed. So here's the Kepler intubation system, for example, um, that has been used, that is based on a robotic system, is remote controlled, so there is still the, the human in the loop to guide the um, robotic device using um, you know, vision feedback. Uh, other systems have been developed, 
So this one is a magnetically guided robotic system that is um, more on patient than robotic. Um, what I find interesting here is that this developed through the um, you know, ad hoc or coincidental collaboration between engineers and clinicians. I think also a very important point needs to be maybe further, you know, um, further improved this kind of link between clinicians and, and uh, engineers. Uh, other systems here, for example, InTouch, um, again, a system that um, is automating the process or is helping with the process. So the system has sensors built in and can give feedback to the user to tell them when they're on the right path for the uh, intubation. Uh, disadvantage here is the user, uh, the clinician needs to be very close to the patient still. Uh, another system, this is uh, being developed in Shanghai at the Second Military Medical University. And here again, a kind of a robotic system was um, looked at. And that um, the idea there is also to, to use it possibly in a, in a military context and to be able to help possibly soldiers in the field through a remote link. Interestingly enough, they have developed that system, but have then moved um, forward um, and have uh, come up with a complete or have focused on a completely different approach. So this is an on-patient system, and you can see it here on the right-hand side, how it is uh, pushed into the mouth of the patient. And then there are um, tubes and um, you know, flexible extensions that move forward into the, uh, into the throat of the patient. Um, of course, a number of elements need to be considered in the context. It is not only about you know, moving a, um, yeah, a system into the mouth, it's also the tube that needs to be um, pushed forward. And so um, there are different feeding mechanisms that um, have been looked at uh, and uh, the students found out that a gearing mechanism is actually a most appropriate approach. Here on the right-hand side, we can see that also inspiration was taken from the way filaments are moved forward in a 3D printer using a drive gear. And uh, then the, the, the focus shifted towards uh, continuum robots. And uh, I, I just show here some examples Obviously, there are many, many systems that have been developed. And so that is a system we developed at when I was at King's in previous years. And that is a tendon-based um, continuum robot. And that was considered, but then also um, work by Josie Howard and, um, and, uh, and colleagues um, looking at um, yeah, continuum robots to see whether there is uh, something useful there for the system they were um, trying to construct. And um, we can see here another approach, which I find also very interesting because it is also very, you know, looks like very self-made, not, not very professional, but still it is a, uh, a approach, a, um, a suggestion for an intubation system. And here, again, a, a continuum robot was suggested as the device that should move forward into the throat to um, help guiding the, the, um, yeah, the tube itself. And so, so this, this kind of, these kind of approaches were taken on board. And then the students looked at uh, you know, developing a device and uh, the, the design idea on the at the bottom was very quickly um, you know, pushed aside and the focus was on the um, system we see on the top left. So a snake-like stylet, as they called it, uh, effectively a continuum robot that is tendon steered was then chosen as a, a um, you know, the approach to take. And I give now an overview of, the, um, of what the students have done and um, what I would like to say is, um, despite a very modest budget, the students were able to create um, quite a, 
you know, so, so quite some interesting prototypes with, with potential. So here we can see on the right hand side the feeding mechanism. And then on the top left, we have the snake like stylet. We see the top on the right. On the left, we see the tendons coming out that can be used to move the, you know, the stylet in, in different directions. And the camera is supposed to be um, situated on the right hand side. And when we, when we look at the bottom left, the system assembly, then we can see the tube sits over the, um, the stylet. So the idea is for the stylet to move it first into the mouse, you know, follow the, you know, find the right path, and then for the tube to be mo moved over it uh, into the right position. And uh, so I'll, I'll go through the, the various um, elements now. Um, yeah, so here we can see another view and, um, and we can see here an earlier prototype. So on the left-hand side is the feeding mechanism for the tube, which worked quite well with the tube. On the right-hand side, we can see in white at the very end the camera. And then we can see also the various disks that make up the continuum robot. We can see that also again in the, in the bottom image. Big problem was that the, the camera was too big and the, the cable, the camera cable was also too big and they couldn't move the, um, couldn't move the, you know, the, the camera, they couldn't move the system up and down. The forces were just too, um, too low. So um, they decided then, um, yeah, maybe I come to that in a second. Anyway, here we can see the, um, a, a view on the feeding mechanism. So that was designed and 3D printed. And you can see a tube-like um, you know, stick sitting in the tubing, uh, uh, the feeding mechanism. And here the feeding mechanism is also rotating. Now, yeah, unfortunately, without the, the tube inside, that would have been a better video, I think. Um, and here we can see now the, uh, the mechanism that moves the, uh, the whole system forwards and backwards. And we have, have that here running at different speeds. So that is at, um, at the default speed at high speed, but it can also run at a lower speed. No. No, just to show, show yeah, these developments. But I think more important is now how they put everything together. I should um, highlight that what they were not able to do was to put the tube over it, because in the end they had to change the the disk size. So here you see the the, the disks um, on this um, arm hanging down, the white disks, and they have a diameter of two centimeters, and you know, obviously too too large to go into a human mouth, and also. Um, too large for the tube that was supposed to go over it. So here, here they had to, you know, show the feasibility of the, the overall system and could not show, um, you know, could not develop a prototype that would have the right dimensions. And um, so we can see that here in action. I hope yeah, the video runs now as well. So you can see here now the, um, the advancement um, mechanism. Uh, using the linear stage and the servo motors on top. On these four servo motors on top are there now to move the, um, you know, the uh, stylet uh, into different directions. So they could move up and down, left and right. And so the idea is now for this device to move forward into the uh, open mouth of the patient and then with the um, servo motors that could control the stylet to, to move into the further down into the th throat um, to get into the, um, you know, the airways. And um, here is an, also a view of the experimental study they carried out. Um, they had a, a mannequin there, but because their system was too large, they couldn't use it in that mannequin. So here we have a, um, a different test rig, if you want, a larger, large scale one. And the idea was then to bring the stylet from the outside into the larger opening and then into the smaller opening that you can see in the top right, where it says finish 
And that is the, the target position. And we have a video here as well. So that, it, that is now from the camera at the tip of the, the stylet. The movements are a bit jerky because um, yeah, the controller is, um, you know, needs maybe further development. But as you can see, after a bit of moving around, the system is capable of moving into the, you know, into the final hole as required. Okay, um, so that brings me nearly to the end. But before I conclude, I just wanted to show also this work here by, um, uh, yeah, now the other video doesn't work. Let me see that I can also run the other video. No, it doesn't want to. Okay, now it does. Good. So, eversion robot is the word here. So, a growing robot made of fabric is being used here. And I show on the right hand side um, how that is done, uh, how it you know, works in a schematic. This is not work by us um, at Queen Mary. And this is David Haggerty under the supervision of Elliot Hawks at UCSB in the States. And I think that is also another fantastic way of, of solving that problem, having a soft, uh, growing robot that can be used uh, to intubate a patient. And from what we see here, it is very straightforward. It kind of automatically adapts to the throat and finds its way. Um, and it's very low cost as well. I would like to, to thank my um, funders, uh, in particular Smith Medical, who supported that particular project. The main contributors are shown here again. Obviously, the three students who worked on that project. I don't want to stop my presentation without reminding everyone that ICRA 2023, so in two years' time, will be actually in London. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kaspar. Uh, great presentation. So why don't we merge uh, any question for you into the round table? You know, um, now, um, so, Paolo had to leave for a graduate exam, but I'm hoping that Casper and Farouk can stay on. And then yeah. if possible for speakers um, and also poster authors, whoever is available here, uh, we'll appreciate if you could contribute. If you are available and can turn on your camera, that would be great. But if you can't, that's okay. Um, and what I'm going to do is now- Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Can, can, can you unshare me because I, I have difficulties doing that. If you can't, then I'll have to maybe plug in a mouse. Uh, I can't unshare. Okay, let me, let me try something else, just a sec. Sorry about that. Um, I, yeah, um, now, I, now I should be able to do it. That's, that's good now. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Sorry about that. So um, I think this is a good time to kind of have a discussion and um, we can have questions again in the chat box from the audience. Or if anyone wants, they can all uh, just uh, unmute themselves and ask a question. And again, if speakers, um, uh, good to see you, Jessica. Uh, if a speakers want to uh, also you know, start a discussion, uh, that would be great. I have one big question myself, and that's what's your, your biggest lesson out of all of this, out of um, the pandemic, as far as both research and education in robotics is concerned. So, but that's just my question. Uh, maybe uh, if anyone wants to start discussing anything that you would like to discuss. Yeah, maybe I can bring my, my question. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, it's COVID related, but it's also extending, it's, it's, it's more general maybe even. So what I, um, what I see in particular, I mean, we, we are, most of us are researchers and we are doing our research in our labs. And then once we have done it, we write a paper and move on to the, to the, to the next problem that we would like to solve. And only very few actually um, move also um, into the commercial kind of side of things. And so I have the feeling that a lot of good work is um, being done, um, e even at, at master level, as, as we have seen but is then not taken up or cannot uh, bring, be brought to the next level because it's, I, I, I think, too, too complicated to, to do that kind of step. 
So I'm, I'm, I don't know whether we can answer that question, but I'm wondering whether there is a, an, an opportunity or there's a possibility to, you know, to accelerate this kind of research, accelerate the translation, especially in situations like those. You know, I, I think a good example earlier was, uh, I think that was Axel Krieger talking about the, the, the robot that, that they built to, you know, push on the, the touch screen. But at the end of the day, it was only a, um, how can I say, a, uh, a research project and will not be further pursued. But wouldn't it have been so much more useful to say, okay, yes, now we, we are in a crisis situation. We have to see patients. We need to push this device into the operating theater or into the intensive care unit to help people. But no, it was not possible because there was no certification there for this um, very nice idea. So that's, that's, that is my, my question. And I don't know whether anyone has any thoughts on that. I think this question came up also for Halley. You know, how do you close the gap between having a research prototype that is kind of proof of concept and works uh, in, in a control environment and something that can be taken actually made a product. And I think the biggest question right now is how do you keep the cost low and something that's quickly deployable during a crisis? Uh, what? Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's also a good point on keeping the cost low, that, that, that is on top of it. But even if you, let's say you have all the money in the world, it won't go into, into immediate use. You know, it, it takes years to, to, um, to you know, um, turn a, a research idea, especially if it's a kind of a robotic idea, into a, a medical product. Exactly. And, and I'm interested in the question of costs specifically because, for instance, in India, 1.4 billion people, COVID is you know, uh, just ravaging the population. Can, what can you make that actually on a larger scale could help? You know? so, but these could be uh, dealt with separately. These questions are kind of different. It's an interesting... Yeah, I, sorry, go please, ahead. Please yeah, it, on, go. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think all of these really point to some of what we were feeling when we were working on our white paper. Um, you know, on the one hand, there's uh, money being thrown at a crisis, and yet we know we have to spend it wisely. On the other hand, we know that the development timelines take so long. So, you know, it, there are sort of two sides of the same thing. I, I think what we found was that if you want to do something really quick and inexpensive for a crisis, you, you have to work with mature technologies. You can't really, uh, it has to be off the shelf and easy and everybody has to understand implicitly how to use it. And then on the other hand, if you're backtracking and thinking, how do I prepare for the, for the future so this isn't a problem down the road, um, you know, then we look at investment. And I think the question that was raised in the chat bar, which was, um, what's a good strategy to start closing the gap between um, research prototype and industrial product? This was a really interesting question we were asking when we were doing our interviews um, for the white paper. And when we spoke, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but when we spoke to Canadian startups um, in this space, what was interesting to me was they weren't asking for more grant programs to work with researchers. They were asking, this is really interesting to me, they were asking instead, they said, I would rather see the money go to downstream end users, incentivizing them to update and modernize their equipment. And the reason is because so many of these uh, companies that are doing cutting edge work, they're startups, they're young, and what they need to do is prove that they have a customer base. Without that, they're not going to get the big industry investment that then they can go turn around and put into R&D. And so instead, there are a lot of startups are quite incapable of investing in significant programs with university partners. So I, I found that to be a really interesting thing. It's not where we would naturally think to put the money. It was somewhere else. I don't know if that's the right answer. I don't know what would happen if it did go that way. But that was something that our industry um, partners were, were mentioning. And I, so, I can talk a little bit about the um, robot for uh, the ventilators, uh, kind of the hurdles that we encountered uh, to uh, bring it to clinical use. 
Uh, it was definitely a funding issue for us. <laughs> you know, we applied to NIH for research grants and um, and small business grants, but you know, just the, the cycle by the time you submit it and by the time it was reviewed, COVID wasn't really such a huge focus anymore. It was kind of like outdated. <laughs> just just the timelines of, of these uh, funding cycles were just ho horrific for us in that you know emergency use uh, case, and then the the, the uh, clinical use. Uh, I mean. We engage with the FDA a little bit. Uh, they have this emergency use authorization uh, program. We engage with a different project, um, but honestly, you know, uh, they had so many, you know, I mean, they were uh, engaged with Pfizer and, you know, vaccinations, EUAs, they were, you know, we, we were just at the, at the bottom of the <laughs> priority list. And so it took, it took forever to get any, uh, you know, any traction there. So. You know, um, those those are my my uh, experiences on the project that kind of really held us back. <laughs> so I would like to actually add one note to that, and I, I really like the the comparison that I think uh, Halo did on the on the Fukushima and, and the situation that happened there. So uh, one of the uh, one of the situation is that when the pand pandemic happened, we as, as roboticists, many of us were asked to make robots to, to help the situation. And, and I think I was approached by people who were doing testing and then the testing was a problem. The robot for testing was there, it, but it, there was no need for making a new robot. It was just not enough and it was so expensive and not scalable. So uh, I, I think the, the question I want to ask here is that, and, and perhaps I would like to ask um, at the, the, the speakers who, were uh, involved or involved in, in rehabilitation uh, robotics, okay. uh, Neville sorry. and Marcia. Uh, so, that... Sorry for interrupting. Sorry, I, I saw two hands up. So I, we should first go to the hands. Yeah, actually, Neville. I wanted. Yeah, yeah. So actually, my point is to Neville, and I think Neville has his hand up. So I wanted to uh, finish my question by asking that. Uh, so in rehabilitation robotics, we see that the robots was there, so we don't we didn't need to make new robots. So. But then during the pandemic, there was this concern of like rehabilitation for post-stroke patients. I, I was reading papers saying that rehabilitation cannot stop because people were getting a stroke during the pandemic. So my question is that how the uh, research in robotic rehabilitation has contributed or could contribute it, or how the research in robotic rehabilitation can change in the future to contribute to future pandemics to avoid delay for rehabilitation of post-stroke patients, because we know we now know that early mobility is a is a major deal for ha having rehabilitation. So I would like to ask uh, Neville and Marcia if they can comment on it, and other every, everyone else who has who have been doing research in the area of rehabilitation robotics. So I think that the the, uh, the first observation is that the path from demonstrated effective technology and uh, you know research style clinical studies out to something which is a self-standing, uh, mature, purchasable product, that's a very long and very expensive process. So, you know, I don't know anything. I, I the best I can do is, is uh, you know, point us all to the development of modern mature technologies like aircraft, invented in 1903, 1905, took a long time before they, be, they became even close to commercially viable, and then it took off. So I, I, don't, I don't think that there's any magic bullet here. On, on the optimistic side, what I'm struck by, my impression, is that the pandemic hasn't, it, it hasn't, we haven't seen robots making a huge impact on the, uh, in, in the pand pandemic, but it's really demonstrated the need, and I think it's accelerated the, uh, Likely, I should be careful what I said, but, it, but the likely penetration of robots, I think, is going to go up because of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would agree with Neville's comments. I mean, the not to not to age Neville, but he's been working in the rehab robotics field for a few years, um, and and I think what's important is to know that 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 field has ebbed and flowed itself since its initiation in the early 90s. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's federal investment, sometimes not. We benefited from National Ro Robotics Initiative and uh, increased uh, research support. Um, but in some ways you, you have to sort of, you need to be consistent in sort of 
continuing to push the research forward, but you also need to be a little bit agile to know how to adapt your, I, I mean, we all need funding to support our research. You have to adapt your pitch to um, a, a little bit to the winds of, of what is, you know, the initiative at the time. And so can, can you find a way to say, okay, whether it's cyber physical systems or human centered computing or robotics, how do you bring resources to your longer term vision of robotics for healthcare deployment? Um, I would also agree with Neville's comment about how um, the pandemic has really made us very aware of the potential for robotics. And I think we're gonna see this uh, in healthcare and beyond. Um, I've uh, been on some meetings with um, ASME uh, and public policy, and we've been talking about just the publicity of even like restaurants who've gone to curbside and burger lockers and automation to deliver food, um, how we don't expect that to go away. Everybody loves the convenience of just being able to drive up and grab what they want and go or to have groceries delivered to their door. Um, so I think this really gives us an opportunity and we need to keep the momentum going to uh, continue to push for opportunities for robotics to, to help us through the next pandemic, which hopefully is a long way down the road. So another comment I'd like to make is a major barrier to, to, to many of these uh, developments is regulatory. So, I, I mean, for, for example, as far as, I, as far as I know, I was just looking into this recently, to have a robot in, in the same space as a human, the EU uh, requirements are outrageously strict. You basically couldn't do the robotic therapy to have you done. So is there something that can be done to take advantage of the pandemic and the greater visibility of robots to take these arcane draconian regulations and turn them into something more realistic. I mean that's probably that's probably an idealist an idealist academic speaking, but it's got to be a way to address the, the regular regulatory concern. And maybe highly you could comment on that. You seem to have some knowledge. Well I think the regulatory question is our questions are interesting. There seems to be quite different points of view on this too. There's the, um, we don't need to change <laughs> regulation because it's already working perspective. And, um, but clearly there are activities that are being done to sort of modernize and update and deal with a lot of the changes that are coming down the pipeline from the introduction of digital technologies. Um, I'm not an expert in regulation, <laughs> so uh, I do know uh, some of what's been happening here in Canada. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, the regulations are there to uh, they're they're there to protect people. So the extent to which we should be changing those, I'm not sure. I think really. Um, I guess the challenge really is around the testing. Like it, it's the regulation around getting the, um, the, the these devices up and, and tested because without testing, we can't really prove any efficacy. And I think that's another, uh, but that's a whole other question. I'm happy if someone else has more insight than I do. So I think just, part of the concern is that at least what I know about the Europe, the, the CE uh, constraints, is that they're based on the wrong technology. They're based on technology from about 10 to 15 years ago. And the technology is changing rapidly. If I recall correctly, uh, if you have a, a robot moving in the same space as a human, you have to guarantee that there will be no force or, uh, or, or pressure distribution sufficient to injure, injure a human, no matter what. And that's based on, on and, and, the, and the default safety maneuver is stop everything. That's actually a terrible, terrible way to develop safety. And, and it's based on it's based on technology from 15, 10, 15 years ago, if not longer. So how do we get the regulatory agencies to keep up with the rapid developments in, in the technology? Well, if I can just finish really briefly on that, because the other thing that was raised uh, during our interviews for the white paper was the need for harmonizing um, regulation standards. So that's especially important in Canada too, because we have a pretty small market. And so um, it's really quite impossible for companies that are producing here um, to, if, 
yeah. like we have to design our standards for global markets, but it's also helpful if our standards are aligned with global markets because it makes it easier to procure technology from somewhere else and have it um, be approved. And so I think that's an interesting area, um, especially for technologies like this one where it's, um, you know, uh, the expertise is clearly a global, this is a global talent pool that we're working with um, and it's at such early stages. Uh, Jessica's hand has been up for a while. Can I ask Jessica, please, uh, if you want to continue? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, apologies that I couldn't be here earlier. I was following the workshop on a second device, so sneakily uh, uh, listening to both workshops I've been involved with. Uh, so I heard a couple of the talks. Congratulations to the organizers. It's really, really wonderful. I like this retrospective um, um, idea about this workshop, uh, thinking about what the pandemic did. I had several comments, so I couldn't agree more to what Neville and, and Marcy were saying about that this really gives an uptake to robotics research, and we, we will probably benefit from that in the coming years. But I also understand Casper's perspective, because I share that I shared the frustration initially when the pandemic hit, that as a researcher, I was just questioning myself, is my research really worth anything if during such a crisis I can just not help? All I can do is sit at home, uh, deliver my lectures online, and hopefully uh, continue with our research to some extent. Mm. But I, I think we should all remind ourselves what our what our like mission as an academic is, right? As academic researchers, I, I don't think it's on us to bring these products to market. We do exploratory work, right? And like to some extent, we also have to rely on that industry will eventually pick things up when they are mature enough and when there is a clear need a need in the market so that's that's one thing and i think we should also remind ourselves what our actual like tasks are is that exploratory work and like teaching the next generation of researchers and their curiosity and then i figured like well my time is probably well spent if i focus on deliver online lectures in robotics as good as i can because that's something i can do and that's how i can contribute uh, during that that pandemic even though i may not be able to solve all the um, like immediate uh, problems in icus and that helped me personally to navigate some of these um frustrations that I believe every one of us was was feeling when we couldn't really do something. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Uh, Kaspar, please go ahead. Yeah, I know Jessica. Yeah, very good. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't see myself as a blue sky researcher. I see myself also as an engineer. So there is something in me that at the end of the day wants to not only you know create crazy ideas, but also you know develop systems or at least be involved in the development. Um, and that that is in particular the case when when, when you use in, in when you work in medical robotics. When at the end of the day, that's what you want to do. You want to create something that can be actually used on a person. Otherwise, it's a it's a philosophical kind of thing that you're working on. That, that's the way I see it. Well, I take your point. We can. I, I also hope that some of the ideas that I developed, created, that they maybe picked up one day, and that would that would be okay. You know, I don't need to to earn the money. But that's um, probably what it is, right? I mean, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Like, I'm I'm also an engineer. I want to see my 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 robots at a patient. Maybe it's not during my generation. Maybe it's the next generation that is going to see that, and that's fine. Like, I think it's maybe it's a little bit naive, and it's the 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 blue sky academic idea, but. I'm very confident that a lot of the things we've seen, and Neville, you got brought this great example with like airplanes, cars, th those things need time. And yeah. you just gotta yeah. probably have the confidence in, in, in those things ending up somewhere. Yeah, maybe that's the way to see it, you know, just to relax and sit back. And, and even if it doesn't happen during my lifetime, one day it will, it will happen, yeah. Yeah, Kaspar, if I can continue that point, actually I agree in that, you know, what is going to contain this pandemic, what has contained it or is going to bring it to an end are PPE, government restrictions, travel restrictions, you know, lockdowns, physical distancing and vaccine. Really what we, despite all our love for robotics and all the time we spend really in this pandemic, it didn't play a major role, but it may play hopefully a major role next time uh, if we can continue and push uh, there is one question in the chat box, and I saw Rui Lee uh, raise his hand. But let me first ask the question in chat box. In your opinion, should we somehow change the interpretation of the human in the loop principle in the healthcare robotics field? Uh, and 
for, uh, I don't know if this question goes back to safety and regulatory requirements, or is it about you know more kind of pure question, pure research question? So, um, Caitlin, if you want to follow up and clarify your question, that would be great. If anyone has any. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. It was a, just a general question because, as uh, it was pointed out, sorry, uh, uh, by somebody, it's that indeed uh, due to the COVID pandemic, what we have learned is that we have to have a separate spaces for the patients and uh, and um, physicians and so on and so forth. So we always need to have. So far, uh, we have this human in loop principle, but uh, in the case of certain uh, situation, maybe we should. Uh, see it or, or see it in the narrow way or how, how you as a people from the field, how you see uh, this principle. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to talk about it? I think one of, if I, if I can just start, one of the ways we have always kept human in the loop is to ensure that robots are not viewed as job killers. Um, you know, automation is not in, in the uh, area of um, healthcare. We always say, you know, surgeon in the loop, therapist in the loop, because we want to make sure that the wrong message doesn't get out that we are out to kill jobs. But I think this pandemic at least showed that robots are not job killers. They can be lifesavers. Uh, and so, um, you know, where there was automation, like Amazon, for instance, the supply chains still to some extent kept going because of the uh, automation. Where there was low level of automation, then things got disrupted. And, uh, you know, I don't know about the US, but like in Calgary, there was this meat processing facility that got shut down a few times because of the outbreak of pandemic. And people were so close to each other, you know, processing meat. So where you don't have automation, that's all the problem. But I'll let others to, uh, you know, jump in and comment. I think from an endoscopy perspective, at least, um, automation is, is still tricky because people are very interested in safety um, of the robots and keeping the endoscopist involved is obviously very important in terms of keeping the safety option. And that's the biggest reason where human in principle is going to be there for a while. Obviously, capsule robotics is one of the areas where you can eliminate the human part of the equation, but it is tricky because it works quite well for um, visualization purposes, but you can't really use it for something like biopsy sampling. Thank you. Uh, if I can ask, uh, Marcy, I have a question for you. So you did a great job keeping your lab open during the pandemic. You know, you did your best and that was excellent. My question is, if you had infinite funding, if you had infinite interest from the clinical sector to absorb and you know, take your technology that could have been, for instance, developed particularly to solve the COVID related problem to the clinic, if all of those were in place, do you think right in the middle of the pandemic, we have the time to develop a solution that is going to, like in the middle of the crisis, can you develop something for the crisis? Because as like for, for us, for instance, all these ethics uh, protocols were suspended for the duration of the pandemic, you know, and still I think they're all mostly suspended. We can't do anything other than absolutely COVID related or things such that such as animal, uh, trials where they have to continue for some time. We can't bring in human subjects to human participants to test an exoskeleton, let's say. So do you think we can do that in the middle of the pandemic or we have to have done this way beforehand? I think this is a, a great question. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that we were restricted um, in studies we were running at RICE to only have RICE participants which um, pretty much you know, means we're doing only you know, able-bodied subject work and studies. We have collaborations ongoing with um, clinical hospitals in the Texas Medical Center. So Tier Memorial Herman has a version of our exoskeleton. And while they were allowed to continue their studies of testing uh, upper limb rehabilitation, 
they actually found a different limiting factor. And that was the willingness of participants to come and, and engage in a study, right? So um, uh, there was great reluctance of people to be, because, you know, I don't know if that's because we're in a significantly ginormous medical center and the concerns of risk of coming into a medical center where there would be a high percentage of um, patients with COVID. The, the rehab hospital that I work with converted uh, rooms to, you know, converted floors to be COVID wards to handle increased um, patient population. So I, I don't think it was a money issue or even a um, regulation issue that kept us from doing more rehab robotics research. It was really um, the challenges of, of recruiting participants. And you know, the, I also think on the flip side, our ability to run studies with RICE participants was because, you know, if you think back to fall 2020, almost all of our courses were fully online, yet we had students living on campus and in the Houston area who were desperate for human contact. And so, you know, to be able to offer Amazon gift cards to come and come to a lab to see other humans and, uh, and participate in an experiment um, and know that we could do it in a way that was, was safe because our undergraduate students were being tested weekly um, and our you know, graduate student researchers were being tested weekly, um, gave us maybe more access to participants than we would have in a, in a normal situation. So just, yeah, different perspectives. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think Kaspar's hand is up. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to come back, um, I mean, to another part of your question, I think whether we can do something in a, in, in a crisis, develop something, create something and, and, and to, to solve problems in the crisis. So from, from my own experience, yes, it is possible, but I have to say it was on a very small level. So we created those visors, which were really needed. And so the, you know, the colleagues from dentistry at Queen Mary contacted us, they, they had a, a real problem. And so we, we helped them to develop that system, designed it, and then we were also able to, to fabricate those. So at that level, I mean, obviously if we talk about robotic systems or something that goes into the operating theater, it's uh, yeah, a diff different question uh, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Like crises are always uh, these uh, motivators for like wars, for instance, are, are the biggest engine for innovation. You know, just just because of the need for uh, for new devices or equipment. Um, so I want I would like to actually uh, have a quick follow up on that comment. I think uh, I think it's important for uh, I, I, at least for myself to think about uh, which modality of help we want to provide. Are we thinking about the primary problem? caused by COVID or secondary problem, right? So primary problem is to make something to stop the spread of virus right now. And secondary problem would be, uh, okay, COVID is interrupting that modality of care, like rehabilitation, right? So how we can use the technology that we have right now to enhance that modality of care to go back to at least something near to what it was before. So you, in that way, we are also contributing to the, to the fight against COVID uh, maybe not perfectly directly, but still as a uh, to, to as a cure for the secondary problem. So I I'm I'm very interested to hear uh, anybody's opinion here about that differences and which one you think we should prioritize when a pandemic happens. I think that's such a critical point that you made, and because it has to again do with long term investment. And as you were talking, it was reminding me of this example of the prenatal ultrasound that they've developed for remote care. And that I, I look at that and I think, you know, remote communities um, are going to need help no matter what. Like, if we could develop systems that work during a crisis, that's great, but actually we could really be helping people not have to travel, <laughs> not just to self-isolate. Um, and, and so can we, you know, I, I just find this, this is a, a highly relevant question. I'm, I'm so glad that you raised it, Farouk.
So, yeah, thank you so much. Any other thought? I think, Matthew, you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, the, the, the way we can think about it is whether either you develop a technology that's uh, directly related for COVID um, and useful for COVID, like, like what Axel uh, talked about, for something for ICU, for instance, for patients, or what Caspar talked about, others, you know, uh, something in ICU for COVID patients, or you develop technologies that support the healthcare system for non-COVID patients non-COVID patients regardless. Caspar, uh, he's talking, but I can't hear it. So just wanted to say, you know, that there are two ways. I would think about uh, technologies for supporting healthcare system in general and general patients or technologies for uh, specifically COVID patients. Okay, we can we can change the topic perhaps and ask a different question. We have some time left. Uh, so I'm thinking to uh, to to talk about the top the topic of autonomy. We briefly mentioned that uh, and how autonomy can help to uh, uh, accelerate the uh, the management of such such a thing like COVID. I know autonomy in surgery and autonomy in rehabilitation. They're in two different stages. Um, in rehabilitation robotic system, we have been doing autonomy for many years and in surgical, it's a, uh, it's a new field. And when I say we, I mean the society. Uh, so if, the, if there is any comment from the speakers, the panelists and audience uh, to comment on that. So how you think autonomy can help us to have robots which are more compatible with a, with a situation like COVID or post COVID? Farrokh, if I can start the discussion, I, I like semi-autonomy so that you have, you don't completely replace the human. You have some level of uh, semi-autonomy where there is a role for the human to do and there is a role for the machine to do. Uh, so um, that way you make sure that you keep the clinicians involved. And that's kind of, I think, important for ac acceptability of and clinical uptake of whatever we do. But then can you delegate aspects uh, to the machine, uh, that would be, uh, for instance, helpful in the context of COVID. So do the hazardous part of the uh, job uh, autonomously and do the other aspects uh, uh, with human involvement, either human planning or human in, uh, in continuous involvement. So, so that's what I am thinking, not, not, not going to full autonomy, kind of going this ladder or this staircase of autonomy slowly to bring the society along. Otherwise, if we just go all the way to full autonomy, uh, we are going to get pushed back. That's just my, my, my take. Um, maybe I can add a little bit. I, I think we should adjust um, kind of the level of autonomy also to the risk of the procedure and the difficulty. Of course, uh, if you, uh, uh, Paolo showed a, a nice 2017 science robotics paper with the degrees of autonomy in surgery. I think we are right now still in level two or so, maybe, uh, you know, getting to level three eventually, but still a, 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 a white way. You're, you're not even in level one yet, sorry. <laughs> Um, right. Um, but I think for, for, for um, you know, non-significant risk application like ultrasound or so, I think they're getting to full autonomy. Um, I, I would feel we are, we are close and I think it's also ethical to do that and, and <laughs> you know, really good combination of, of uh, risk benefits, you know, where you limit the force interactions with the patient, uh, limit potential uh, damage. And then I, I feel, uh, you know, we are really close to, to doing that. I, I completely agree. I mean, I, I, I think we should strive for autonomy, um, but I, th I think in many cases we are not quite there yet. Uh, I mean, self-drive cars, I take as an example, I think we're not, I mean, we are there maybe in certain cities, certain areas, but it's, I think it's not it's still something missing to, to get to the next level. And I cannot imagine a a minimally invasive procedure, colorectal procedure, let's say, to be carried out yet in an autonomous kind of way by a robotic device. 
Um, I, I think, I mean, even if assume the, the dexterity is there, let's say that Da Vinci can do the job, the, the understanding is not there. The, the system cannot understand what it's supposed to do. I, mean, I, I have observed some, uh, some operations and I didn't understand anything, but the, the surgeon, the human surgeon had the, the understanding of the, the situation and knew where to cut and, and where not to cut. So that, that, that level, I think we haven't reached yet. So I, I agree with you if, if in, in certain situations like ultrasound scanning, that, that might be already there or we are close. No. I think surgery, it, I don't think yet. I think an important question to ask is, how do you manage, uh, how do you manage the autonomy? So it's, it's very attractive to think of a supervisory control architecture where the clinical expert decides what should be done and the machine takes care of either all or some of the detail. But the question is what happens when the machine decides things have gone wrong and then it throws control back to the uh, human supervisor. Again, to, to, to borrow aircraft technology, you remember Air France or whatever? About a decade ago, there was a, there was a, a, a fatal accident with an aircraft, an Air France aircraft where the machine was high enough that the, it lost two of its, its autopilot in, instruments, started into, into a 35,000 foot dive and wound, into, wound up uh, crashing in, in, into the ocean. That's because the, the automatic uh, control system basically threw its hand up and, sent it and threw the control back to the pilots who didn't know what was going on. So how do we manage, if we, if we either go to full autonomy, then, it's, then it becomes a matter for the lawyers, who's, who's gonna be liable? On the other hand, if you go to partial autonomy, how do you manage the handoff? That's, I, I, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's a, a, a non-trivial question. Uh um, so yeah, so, so yeah I, I think you're making good points there. I, I have the feeling it, it is, is impossible to do. I mean, I, either you have a system that is clever enough to do it, that, but then it should be also able to do it all, or we have a system that is not quite up there, then it cannot make a decision like that, cannot understand when is something is going wrong to hand it back to the human operator. And I, I think that's the same with self-drive cars. Um, I have forgotten the term they have used, but they want to have this hybrid system where, you know, you, you can close your eyes occasionally, but you have to keep your hands on the wheel. I mean, that's, this, this doesn't make sense to me. You know, either it can do it or the, the user has to have full control. That's, that's, that's my feeling. The, the in-between thing will not work. But, but Casper, that's exactly what happened with Boeing 737 MAX, you know? So it was... It was supposed to hand off control to the human, but it didn't. Actually, it's the opposite of the situation that we mentioned, you know. And it took control and thought the human was the human pilot was doing the wrong thing and was trying to level it off, but actually it was dying uh, because of the faulty sensor. So it just handing off control between an autonomous system and a human is a very tricky issue. And that's managing this shared autonomy, you know. But 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 you, how, but, you, but, you, but how how can you make this decision? It's impossible because the human could be wrong. Yeah? I mean, there, there could be a surgeon who has no clue or mm -hmm. whatever, has a bad day and is about to cut an artery. And then if the system tells the surgeon in this situation, don't do it, that would be fantastic. But I think we are not there yet. And so it, it, it can go either way, you know? And if, if, you, if you now, I go back to the self-drive car, if, if you give me a Tesla, and, and either you tell me, yes, you can relax and you don't need, to, don't need to do anything anymore, or you tell me, yep, that is a normal car, it supports you a bit, but you can never let go. You cannot trust it. I, I, think, I, think, I think it's imp, 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 impossible to, to find a good solution for this, this middle, middle way approach. I, I, that's, that's my feeling. And I, I, I think, I mean, because we are, because I, I feel AI, machine intelligence is not quite there yet, there should be always the, 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 the button there where the human can say no. Yeah, the human should, should, should overrule it. Yeah. And then we have to rely on the, on, the, on the performance of the intelligence of that particular human who's doing that job at that very moment.
Um, is there any other point you want to res we talked about, you know, 2.20 p.m. being the end of the workshop. I don't want to keep people too long. They may have other commitments. Uh, if there is anything, if any final thoughts. Maybe, maybe just one, one comment in response to what Neville said earlier, um, speaking about the, a robot in an operating room and what, what kind of rules you have to um, obey. Um, I was under the impression things are relaxing a bit, especially when I look at the manufacturing environment. So there are new, um, new norms that allow um, for certain types of robots that satisfy certain you know, aspects to be uh, close to humans and collaborate with humans. Is, is that not happening in the operating theater yet? I don't know if, if, if you have a thought on that, I don't know. Kaspar, is your question for Naveen? Uh, it's to everyone, but uh, because ne Neville mentioned that earlier, I thought I, you know, directed particularly at him, yes. So I, I don't claim to be an expert on, uh, on the uh, regulations that apply to robots. I just had a recent experience in which uh, we basically, in order to satisfy, I forget the number of the regulations, it was a CE regulation, and this is working with the colleague at uh, Kuka in, in housework. Mm -hmm. And essentially, the requirements were such that we basically, <laughs> the, the things that we are successfully doing with robots interacting with humans for therapy, you couldn't, uh, you, you couldn't fit those into the regulations, essentially. Because okay. they, those, I, I, I can't, I can't comment on uh, the current state of, of regulation. It's just not my area of expertise. But the basic problem was that the regulate the regulation was written as though the, the technology was at a particular time. Basically, high precision, high high high, high force uh, motion control. But that's not what we do. So I think that the, it, 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 I think that. I, I have no desire to become part of the committee to rewrite regulations. That seems like, that, that seems like that but, but at the same time, I think one of the things that we might be able to do to capitalize on the pandemic, and I know that's a terrible thing to say, but can we capitalize on the growing interest to be able to say, oh, here's the sort of thing we wish we could have been able to do if the technology had been mature. I think that was a great point that Haley made is. In, a, in, a, in the pandemic, it's got to be mature. It's got to be off the shelf. How do we get stuff to become off the shelf? And I think there might be a way to prompt the relaxation of regulations. And maybe that's already happening. I understand. Yeah, and, and maybe there's hope because in the manufacturing uh, world, it is slowly happening. So maybe in the medical clinical world, it just needs a bit longer. Yeah, but I, I would say do keep in mind though, if nobody makes a buck, nothing happens. You got to, you, these companies have to be able to make a profit. And it's perfectly reasonable. And so that's the hard part. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Um, it, it only shows that I'm not a very commercial person, but yeah, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, maybe it's a good time to close. I, I, I personally enjoyed it very much. Just uh, want to thank everyone so much for it's, it's very difficult to be on Zoom for five hours. <laughs> you may still have to go to other workshops and do more there. So just want to thank you so much. I uh, really hope to see everyone soon in person in the post COVID world. And uh, it was really educational. Uh, there were so many diverse uh, perspectives that were uh, discussed here. So I personally just wanna thank everyone uh, for uh, what you did today. And um, thank you, uh, hope to see you uh, soon uh, in a conference, in the next conference that we can be in person. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I can only echo that, and also thanks to Farouk, yeah, Madi and Farouk, who made, you did, who really did the hard work behind the scenes. Thank you. And also thanks, well, thanks of course, to the participants for you know the fantastic and the speakers for providing these fantastic talks.
I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank Same you. here. It was a great workshop. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, and hopefully we we'll see you soon. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.